All right, so in this stream, we're going to go through and just kind of do some random cleanup things. Uh, we're going to um, we're going to improve our free virtual memory performance. So previously, we were uh, every single time we'd want to free a page, we would actually check to see if there are any more uses in that page table entry, and that means that our uh, free performance was uh, in my benchmarks here. It was 3,500 cycles to alloc and free 16 gigs, uh, 460 cycles to just allocate it. So it means that 3,000 of the 3,500 cycles were the free side of things. So our free performance is really bad. So we're uh, working on that. Um, we're going to implement soft reboots, which will allow us to reboot the kernel, download it, and replace the kernel uh, dynamically on real hardware so we can skip the BIOS uh, post times. And then we're going to work on a E1000 uh, network driver, a UDP stack, an ARP stack, a DTP client, and we might get to adding X2 APIC and ACPI enumeration so we can write a NUMA aware memory allocator. So that's what's currently scheduled, uh, but we'll see if this, uh, we'll see if we get there. So we have kind of everything torn apart right now. Um, and right now what I'm doing is I'm switching from the previous implementation of page tables, which would go through and uh, check all of the 512 entries to see if they're all unmapped. And if they are, then we can free the page table itself. Uh, what we're doing is we're actually adding uh, reference counts in the reserved or the ignored bits of the page table entries, 52 to 62. So we need nine bits to tell us uh, how many entries, zero to 511 inclusive how many entries are mapped by that entry or how many tables are in use or pages are in use at that level of the table. So we're plumbing through some ref counting stuff right now such that we can actually just increment and decrement that count and then free the table entries. Um, we can just directly free the table entries uh, when that ref count goes to zero. What distro and window manager? Yep, Debian DWM. Two months. Thank you for the sub subnet. Two months for my favorite rush show. Hell yeah. Okay, so uh, where we're at right now is we are going through all of these entries in reverse order. So we're starting at the PTE level and going up and we're freeing the tables until we find the first table that has uh, reference uh, references. In this case, we're going to um, we're going to translate the entry. We're going to write at our entry location. So our position in the page table or whatever, depending on the page size. So we're going to write that it's no longer used because in this section of code, if uh, at this section of code, we know that we're freeing memory. So we're about to free an entry. And what we're doing here is here we're unmapping it. We're marking this as no longer present, no longer used in the table. And then next, we're going to determine if this table after writing the zero to it is now empty. So we go to the table entries above. So in this case, it would be uh, we go to the level above us, which maps our entire table. And that, uh, we're going to translate that. We're going to read the entry there. We're going to get the number of in-use pages at that level or tables at that level. And then this will tell us a number 0 to 511 of how many entries are used at that level. And we're going to decrement that value. We haven't done that yet. We're going to decrement that value, store it back. If the value that we decremented to, or if we decremented to zero, we can actually free the table itself. Um, and I think, oh yeah, I need to actually put a break here temporarily. So we're going to need to change the allocation side of things uh, to also populate these entries. Because currently the allocation side of things doesn't update this. So this is saying it's 2,000 cycles, which is actually kind of a glimpse of the performance that we're going to have. Um, so that's saving us 1,500 cycles there. So that's uh, about a 2x speed up. But it's not done. <laughs> it's not working yet. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to say if in use is equal to 1, um, we're about to decrement this to 0. Thus, and this should eventually panic as we use up enough physical memory. Um, actually, I should have like a counter of how much physical memory is available or something. 
But right now we're leaking the tables. We're creating these entries and then we're leaking the tables. Um, I don't think we're leaking too fast, so I'm actually going to turn this off. I'm going to clip us down to very little memory. So we're going to go to, we're just going to have a gig. Um, and that's going to make us a little bit more constrained. And with this new constraint, perfect, fail to allocate. Um, do this. And then here, uh, we'll change this to 900 megs, which we should have uh, free. And then what's going on here? Um, yep. So right now, we're not freeing the page table. Uh, we're, we're freeing the pages, but we're not freeing the page tables. So this should eventually run out of RAM. And it looks like it did, which is good. Oh, but that's telling me it never succeeded. I'm really surprised I don't have... That's saying I have 100 megs of overhead in my kernel? So this should eventually... Yep, there we go. So it is working. It's able to allocate that, and then eventually we run out of memory. Uh, there. Yep. Perfect. So, and the reason that is happening is we're not freeing the tables, which is great. This is a great example of the allocation was succeeding, and eventually the metadata of the page tables themselves uh, is getting leaked. So we should be able to run forever in that uh, mode. So that will be a way to test that we're actually freeing everything that we're using. So here, if in use is zero, we're about to decrement this to zero, thus um, free the table itself and go to the next level else um, we're going to core pointer right and we're going to want to and this is where we're going to free it uh, if in use is one then we're going to we're about to decrement this to zero and free the table itself uh, and go to the next level um, as we might want to free the table that contains this table. Okay. So we will update it with a... Yeah, we'll update the next entry. Um, oh, if it's one, then we're doing a core pointer right at nvad as mute u64 is zero. And this is a zero out the uh, next level table as we're about to free this table. So we're going to zero that out. And then uh, that's it. So in use goes away. We don't have to update in use in this case because we're going to write over the next level uh, page table entry with a zero as this table no longer exists. And then we just have to free that, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so here we're going to do uh, free the table which holds this value, uh, free the uh, the current page table. So we unlinked it, and then here we're going to free it. Uh, oops, this is a fizz adder. So we have a physical address, and then here we just have to compute the address of the table, and that's going to be from uh, entry dot zero at um, and. Oh, not OXFFF. So that's going to compute the address. And we don't quite fit in one line. We'll go with this format, though. OK. So free the current page table. We're going to align it down to the nearest 4K boundary to get the address of the page table itself and not OXFFF. That will 4K align down the entry that we're about to free. And then here, we're going to say, hey, this is available for use again. Uh, and that should work. So this is still not correct, because this doesn't decrement the ref count. But we should, this shouldn't crash or behave in an unexpected way. And it does. Uh, 258. Oh, yeah, and this needs to break. Um, and this is uh, continue. Uh, this will be uh, continue on freeing tables as we just uh, 
as we just freed one, which which may have made the level above us contain no more active tables. Okay, so here we'll say continue. And then in this case, we're going to break. And I'm actually going to say um, next level, because this is some next level code. Uh, and we're just going to loop label this just for uh, clarity. Even though the continue and break uh, would be identical, I do like using loop labels sometimes just for clarity. And that's exactly what we're doing in this case. So we're saying continue to the next level, in this case, break. So if the ref count is non uh, greater than one, we didn't free the table. And thus, we want to stop. Because when we go up to the next level, we will end up zeroing out the entry here. Uh, here? Wait, where's my unconditional zeroing? Um, I think I deleted some code on accident. Uh, translate. Read the next entry. Uh, oh, this is going to be... Um, Oh, yeah. Mark that it's no longer used. We do have that. So the first thing we do is we translate, and then we write that that entry is no longer used. Cool. So when we come through, uh, in fact, we won't need this then. Because we'll come through here. We'll then zero out the entry. If there's a level above us, then we're going to uh, read the metadata from that level to tell us how many things are in use. If there's only one entry in use, then we're going to free this entire table because we would decrement this ref count to one. We'll continue to the next level, which will cause us to come through and zero out that entry in that next level, the one that we just freed. Otherwise, we're going to break because we cannot go to the next level. Um, and then here, we're going to break. That'll cause us to free the actual page, and then we'll invil pig. Now, we're losing a lot of our performance on invil pig, so we're going to try and reduce the amount of that. Um, I miss what you changed there to make it succeed. When I say succeed, sometimes I'm talking about like a train of thought in my head. I'm sorry about that. Uh, where it will, it, it will still fail, but it won't crash in a new way, if that makes sense. Uh, meaning we're at parity with what it was before. And the reason this doesn't work, this code should be complete now. Uh, actually, we don't do this. We have to update this. One second. So we, here we have to update number of uh, entries below, uh, number of entries this table references. So we know that it's in use is up here. So what I think we want to do is we want to get that and mask for the 1FF. And we'll just or it in there, I think. I think that's going to be the fastest way for us to do that. Um, oops. Uh, and I'm going to switch. I don't know. This is going to drive me nuts. Um, OK. Uh, there we go. So we have the build environment here. And then here we just have some Python. So I can do this. OX 1FF shift by 52. And this gives us the mask into there. So here what we can do is we can say um, uh, we have nent, the next entry. And we'll do uh, update the number of entries this table references. We'll do nent and not this. Um, and that will zero out that ref count. And then or. Uh, in use minus one, and in this case we'll say if yeah if in use is one, and then in this case in use minus one. Uh, and if in use is zero, I think we want to. 
I think we'll assert in use is greater than zero. Uh, whoa, ref counts broken on page table. This will never happen, but we'll assert it. And then here we can do minus one shift by 52. Okay, then is equal to this, and this will be update the reference count. So we'll take, we'll mask off those bits, and then we'll or in, in use, uh, and then here we can say, and in use is less than uh, 512. So assert it's greater than zero, and it's less than 512. That's just some sanity checks, and then here we'll mask that off, and then we'll or it with the decremented ref count, and then we'll shift that into the position, or it in there. Um, and I'm going to, I wanna stylize this a little bit better. Okay, nice. And then here we're, uh, we'll, um, right in the new entry, and this will be at nvad as mute u64 n and and we can actually reduce these. That needs to be mute, that one's mute, mute, const, mute, okay. We had some of those pointers a little bit unnecessary this reference count subject, uh, basically what we're doing is we're tracking how many entries are used at each level of the page table. Uh, perfect, ref count's broken. It's exactly what we wanted. So basically, uh, we're gonna gimp it out here. So we have a page table here, which is a four level page table. And what we have is uh, on x86, the CR3, oh my God. 32. Uh, we have the CR3, and this points to the page table and the root level of the page table. And in this case, we have, um, here we have, oh my god, this. We have like all these entries, dot, 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 to here, and this is, this is zero. And this is uh, 500, the 511th index, or the 512th entry. So CR3 points to a table like this. And then under this, this points to another table, which is the same thing. And it goes like this pretty much forever. Um, and what we're doing is at each level, we're adding a ref count that says how many entries are in use at each level. So the CR3 will point to this. And let's say, um, let's say that this points to a valid mapping and this points to a valid mapping. We'll just do this. And that means that of these 511 and the, all of the rest of them are going to be zero. So they're not present mappings. So what we're gonna do is in this location, in this spot, we're gonna store in some metadata on that entry. We're gonna store, uh, currently there are two entries in use uh, below us, right? And that's effectively what the code we're adding is doing. So this entry points to a table where there are two entries in use. And what we're going to do, it, we store it in a metadata in some bits that are unused, but um, anyways, with these two entries in use, what we're going to do is if we get to a point where it's requested that we free this one, this entry is going to get freed, and this is all recursive logic. So we're going to say this entry gets freed, in which case we want to change this number above us and change this to there's one entry. And then if this one gets freed, we want to change this from a one to a zero. And that's the equals to one, because if we decrement that, from a one, which is um, uh, which is this case, if in use is one, that means we're about to decrement it to zero, in which case 
That's telling us that there are no more any mappings being used in this entire table, thus this table is dead. We'll then fill this in with a big fat zero, and then we'll free the memory that was used. <laughs> we'll free the memory that was used uh, for this table, and thus putting this table metadata back up for use by the allocator. Um, and that's effectively what we're doing. Does that make sense? <laughs> It's just a standard reference count, but we're storing it in band so we don't have another data structure where we're tracking this metadata out of band. So we're not allocating anything extra. We're not creating new vectors or tables. It's actually built into the page tables themselves. So we're actually using the bits there that are already free for use. <laughs> Thanks. Hell yeah. Understand it better now. Still have to go read about it. Yeah. So reference counting is a, a common thing that's used in uh, software engineering. So you will be able to find materials on that. Here we uh, change the entry. Now this is panicking, right? This should be panicking. It looks like it is. Let's just make sure we didn't break anything. I don't think we have. Beautiful. And that's panicking because we don't update the, we update the ref counts downwards. We basically decrement them, but we don't actually uh, fill them in. So what we want to do here is when we get to mapping tables, what we want to do is allocate a new table. If we allocate a new table, we know, we know for a fact that it's going to be one. Um, so we'll do let ref count is equal to 152. And this is, um, there will be one page in use at this level as we created a new table. OK, and then this we can say ref count. That just puts us over. So we'll do ref count or the table. Uh, we created a new table, and we know that there's going to be one thing referenced because we wouldn't be creating these tables unless we were creating something below it. So when we create new tables, we will actually write in with the ref count one because it's just fixed. We know it's going to be one. Um, And that'll go through all of the depth. So at the top level, this would create an entry. You know what? We want to actually update the ref counts above us. Yeah, we'll say uh, I, I in this case actually cannot be zero. Um, that allows me to do let entries I, I minus one. And this will be um, above table is equal to this. Get the uh, physical address of the entry above us uh, so that we can update the ref counts. And this will go to the final level where I'll actually write in an entry and then we'll write in above. And I think uh, we just need to increment this because we create a zeroed entry, a zeroed table. The one above us, it will be zero. The PML4E will be zeroed by default. Then we'll go in, and then here we just have to update it. So it's the same logic that we implemented here, except with a plus instead. Hehe. <laughs> wee wee. Dot dot. Whoop. Um, above table. And then we'll do let nvad is equal to fizzmem dot translate above table uh, core mem side oh it's already the case so we got to read it um Wait a minute. Oh, if the entries is none, then it's not mapped. And then in all cases, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, guys, we're fucking this up. We're fixing it now. This is uh, in all cases whether the table exists or we just created it. 
uh, update the ref count. Yeah, the length is self-imposed. Yep, it's just an 80 column formatter. Um... Wait. Uh, I do this way. We're going to update the reference count in two spots. So we're going to get uh, let in use is equal to uh, let nent is equal to core pointer read as const u64 so we read the old entry we then get the in use which is from nent shift 52 and ox 1ff then we're going to mask off those bits we're going to then or it with the in use plus one and we'll write in the new entry And we'll do this in a scoped thing here, just because we can. Um, so, oh, in this case, wait, it will always be one. Nope, nope, not necessarily. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why do people still impose the limit? It, yeah, it makes code more readable. It makes code significantly more readable. It also makes it easier to view in many different environments. <laughs> it does not. Do you want me to prove you wrong? <laughs> uh, cargo. Actually, rust up. Source. Uh, rust up. Tool chains. Nightly lib. Rust lib source rust source lib standard collections here. Oh wow, that's really nice and readable that table there. But this was a this was a bad example because this file is actually pretty small. Uh, lib standard. Hash map. So the Rust code is like generally formatted kind of, I think they use a hundred line formats, don't they? I think they do. Do to do, do. Um, okay, well, let's find a project that doesn't adhere to that. Let's find some random crate, because, uh, right, crates.io. Some lines long longer than 80 lines of code. Actually, I think the best way to do this is look at Java, um, Java code. So that's a g great place to start. Um, Android GitHub, uh, example app. Here we go. Here we go. I'm just assuming that since it's Java, the code's going to have atrocious lines. Oh, my God. Look at this. This person formats their stuff to a tight line, too. Oh, my God. I can't find shitty code. I can't find any shitty code. Nevertheless, code is unreasonable if it goes over 80... 80 lines in my or 80 columns in my opinion
Our bad code might help. And Windows code often does that, which is pretty annoying. Open up C++ boost. Oh yeah, that would be a good one. I just think it's rude to not format code to 80 columns. I think it's just rude. If you don't, if you don't uh, format your code to 80 columns, you're basically saying, fuck you, I expect you to be using a full screen text editor for this code to be even remotely readable. I just think that's rude. I just think that's rude, man. Um, Nint. I swore I read it. Oh, I just had it in my clipboard, didn't I? Uh, read the next entry. And in this case, we actually want to go to the table above our table. <laughs> 80 columns works for splitting horizontally, absolutely, and that's all I ever do. I typically will have six window, uh, six by two will be my editing environment. I think 100 or 120 is good for modern, not if you split windows. Once again, I think if you format your stuff to anything other than 80 columns, you're basically saying, I expect you to only ever view one file at a time on your screen. Full screen, I expect you to edit my code. And I, I just think that's wrong. I really do. So, like, when I'm typically writing code, um, I'll be using this. And I would have stuff like uh, kernel source main VSP uh, kernel source uh, mm VSP kernel source um, print. And there we go. Look at that. I can comfortably have three things. And then I can vertically, uh, I can split these ones. Um, kernel source. Uh, we'll go to shared lock cell. Right, this is very typically what my monitor will look like when I'm writing code. Um, if you don't format to 80 columns, you can't do this. And yeah, when I'm writing, uh, I can actually, since I use 80 columns, I can do this. Uh, I think it's just barely. Yeah, on this screen, I can't quite do it. But on a, um, yeah, I guess you're kind of fucked on this screen. I know on my other screens I can do this. I forget what resolution they are. Or maybe it's just a slightly different font choice that I use. <clears throat> but yeah, I don't know. This is why I format to 80 columns, because this is how I edit code. I think if you don't format to 80 columns, you're basically saying, fuck you if you ever use a normal size terminal. Fuck you if you're ever d editing in an actual on an actual terminal, which can happen mainly for like display related code. Maybe like your X window manager makes more sense for that, where you're maybe editing that outside of the manager. Um, and if you're using a large font, it basically is like, fuck you, only have one file open at a time. And I, I think that's just rude. This is just 1080p right here. But I don't know. That's why I format to 80 columns. It's so if you're reading in an editor where you don't split windows, it looks fine. But if you do split windows, then it looks good. That font size looks small. It's just like the default X term font size. Okay, so oh, we got to translate that. Yeah, so I have to, I still have to go to the entry above this. Uh, if ii is greater than or equal to two, uh, update the reference count. And in this case, update the reference count. Yeah, I think we have to go to the table above us. Because they're writing in a new entry at the 
we're writing in an entry at entries minus one. So we have to go to entries minus two. Yep, that's what we gotta do here. Um get access to the table we're in uh get access into the entry with the reference count of the table we're updating. In this case, we're gonna translate entries minus two. Then we're going to read that entry. Um, read the entry. Update the reference count by taking nent, uh, shift 52 and one FF to get in use. Then we're going to mask that off and we're going to update it plus one. And then we'll write that back out to pointer. And let's see. This will um, this will go through each of the levels. So at this top level, what's gonna happen? Um, we'll start the iterator here. We'll update an entry in the PML4E, but we won't update the CR2 or CR3, which makes sense because we don't have that metadata. If we're here, we're going to be inserting an entry into this table. Uh, yeah, if this table is not present, then we're going to insert a new entry at this level of the table, and then we're going to upgrade, update the ref count of this entry to say that we changed the number of entries in the level below it. And then when we get to here, we're updating the PDPE. And then at the very end, we need to unconditionally do it for everything to update the map. Uh, okay, so we have to put one more ref count update. So this is going to still not work. Uh, in this case, we don't have the ref count anymore here. Okay, so it will start off as zero, which is good. This is still gonna panic. Yep. And we just have to now, so that's updating the table level ones, and then here uh, we have to update at depth minus two. Um, get access to the entry ref count of the table we're updating with the new page. So we'll go to entries, depth minus two. Depth will be two, zero, and that makes sense. And then here we're always gonna update the ref count for these. I think, I think this is, this might work now. Fuck. <laughs> you guys see CV 2020, uh, 938, and 1020 uh, being exploited in the wild? I uh, feel like we should have found that as fuzzing fans. Maddie Stone posted about it. Um, I mean, you can't... We can't reliably find all the bugs. It, it's just never going to happen. Those bugs would be trivial to find with a fuzzer, but um, there's just not enough time or people in the world to fuzz all of the code. It's just uh, it's just a really hard problem. If we want to stop making security bugs, we have to stop writing C and C++ in unsafe languages at the end of the day. Sorry. We'll never be able to find bugs as fast as we uh, write it. Let's say, let's say there are like, what? Probably 10 million, 20 million people employed as software developers in the world. And there may be 2,000 people employed in the world who are auditing the code and looking for security bugs. So yeah, it turns out, um, turns out everything's just really fucked. <laughs> That's like just kind of how it is. We write so much. We, we write so much shitty code. Uh, we write shitty code much faster than we audit it, and that's how it will always be because no one cares about security. It's just not important to anyone. No one cares. Um, entries depth minus two. Okay. Let me update depth minus one.
depth minus one, depth minus two, to update the ref count. How do I have a ref count? So at this stage, oh, I don't have print here, but I'm just gonna, hmm. No fixes, only features. Yeah, that's pretty pretty accurate. <laughs> I tuned in for a stream uh, where you started a bootloader and you removed core and I missed a few streams and I have no idea what's going on. Uh, yeah, so I upload all of the VODs to my YouTube, um, but we're actually, we're like 30 hours further into development than the bootloader. We basically wrote a kernel. Uh, we had the bootloader boot into the kernel using a PE loader in there, and then that is pulled in lib alloc. And then right now we're working on an optimization to the page tables. So two days ago we implemented a virtual memory manager and a physical memory manager that allows us to arbitrarily allocate whatever size that we have available in physical memory. We can create these mappings and arbitrarily allocate and free things. Um, and we have no leaks in there. And right now we're working on a performance improvement because our allocation time is 450 cycles and our free time is uh, 3000 cycles. So what we're trying to do is get the free more at parity with the allocation speed, uh, which will hopefully give us like a two to three X speed up overall on our actual virtual memory allocation and free. Assybood, thank you for the sub. I've seen you around so many times. Actually, I love, I love the fact that I do recognize names and I do see people numerous times and it's so cool to see that so cool man thank you for that sub still not liking 80 columns at the end of the day it really just comes down to what environment you edit in and my code is for myself it's not for other people so i format it and edit it for myself i also think 80 columns is actually a really good way to enforce uh some code quality things because if you end up writing Java, right, it's very common that you do this. And it's pretty common in Rust too, but you end up in, in scopes where you're like here, right? And it, having 80 column formatting is a really good reminder of maybe it's time to make a function. <laughs> maybe it's time to make a function and maybe have this call this function or, or make a couple functions. But it's a good reminder of, hey, Maybe you're a little bit scoped in, uh, <laughs> and it makes no sense what you're doing. Sophisticated Gaming, thank you for the sub. Hell yeah. We're like, we're really close to partner. I think next stream is we'll be able to do uh, partner. Half your line being indentation builds character. That nesting def is a couple functions. Yeah. A lot of my Haskell functions are over a uh, characters because they're long compositions of functions. Yeah. It's just I sometimes do not wrap at 80 for three characters. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know what? Like, that's relatively fair. Um, I do like the ability because my other monitor, I can, I think, on my other monitor, I can fit, um, I can fit exactly four. It's just probably a slightly different font that I'm using. And it's to the character I can fit four. So if I go over by either two or three characters, I know that on my other monitor, it'll actually start looking like shit. So that's why I follow it to a T. Um, at this point, it's just habit, to be honest. Okay. So what is this doing? This is failing on that assertion. We're gonna update at this level. If we have two level, then we'll go one, two. We won't have two entries up, so we won't update anything, but on the final mapping, we will update. This is at depth minus one, and this is depth minus two. We'll update the ref counts for that. We'll read the previous. We will add one to the in use, shift it in place, and then write it back out. Huh. Huh. 
I like to be pretty verbose with variable names and function names, so using 80 characters would make that impossible. Yeah, that's pretty fair. Um, and I think I can do this. It's going to be zero. I'm pretty sure this is going to be a zero issue. No, the bootloader's too large. I think it is time to disable uh, the panic prints. Uh, we'll do serial um, crate boot args. Uh, and we'll do if true. Uh, create boot args write uh, panic uh, in bootloader. Else this um, bootloader source. What? Boot args. Oh, that's, uh, since it's panic handler. What? 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 Oh, dot right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm stupid. Crate boot args dot serial dot lock dot right panic in bootloader. So that will be, the writes will be relatively cheap to do. Oop, crate. Um, and is there a no format in Rust? No format. No, I don't think there's a way. Uh, lock asref unwrap. Oh, as mute. And that takes bytes. Okay. Bootloader size is 69. Let's go to uh, bootloader source print. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I think we're going to get rid of the print macro in the bootloader. Yeah, I think we're going to get rid of print. RM bootloader source print. Yeah, we're just going to remove that ability. The bootloader will be able to write strings by writing constants to the uh, serial port. But this will uh, restrict that no one has access to anything format. Um, print. Created maps. Entry point is this. This is all in Pixie now. Oop, print. Ah, yeah, we can do this. Oh, clear the screen. Yeah, so here we can do, we have the serial. Um, oh, let serial is equal to unsafe serial port new. Uh, create a new serial driver, mute. Mute, sum, serial. Here we can do uh, serial.write b, chocolate milk bootloader starting. And then we'll clear the screen as well. Uh, serial.write byte b, new line. For this in 0, 100. Uh, Clear the screen, and then this is uh, print the bootloader banner, and then bootloader source pixie uh, print. Okay, so we should 
Uh, right fight. Oh, I think we just want to do right in this case. We'll just do this. SP bootloader, uh, shared, serial, source, lib, write. Yeah, write byte takes a port. We'll get rid of that being pub. Okay. Cargo run clean. Cargo run. No, cannot be dereferenced. Uh, yeah, um... Driver, we'll say driver. Driver. Print the banner. This will take a driver. Uh, and this is going to be um, store the driver in the uh, boot args. Okay, then panic in bootloader. No longer uses info. Oh, you know what? I can do this. Um, let serial is equal to create boot args dot serial dot lock. Uh, let serial, and this needs to be mute, equals serial dot as mute unwrap. Uh, and then in this case, we'll do if let sum serial is equal to this. That way, we don't infinitely panic in a loop. Um, and then here we'll write the, um, let's see, get access to the serial port, and this is, uh, write out the panic message if there is an active serial driver, and then we'll just write panic in bootloader. Okay, bootloader size 56% now instead of 105%. Um, okay, so chocolate milk bootloader starting. And then we can add more prints like this because these prints don't use the format stuff, so we can't do format strings. Uh, otherwise, we're going to just run into that format string code in Rust is really, um, really large in terms of code size. So this has forced us to use only strings. Uh, and I should be able to actually do, um, for this old stuff. Um, I can grab this. And here I can do a serial.write message. So if we have a message, we can write that out. And then in this case, message, expected slice u8, found arguments. Ah, uh, yes, for this. Well, get rid of this. Okay, info, info that message. Oh, message is the one that does format arguments. So that's the one we can't do. But we should be able to do location. We can at least do file. File should just be bytes. And then line and column are actually integers. So we can't print those. So at least give us something. Serial.write, uh, byte new line. So I could make a, I could make my, oh, whoa. Wow. Apparently using that is like massively increased our size. So I think we'll just do panic and bootloader. It's all we're gonna have. I guess you can't use anti-codes here. We can use anti-codes. Not in all environments, but uh, in a decent amount of environments, yeah. I don't know if this one supports it. It kind of depend. It that depends on whatever your serial uh, serial viewer is. So 
depending on if you're on Windows or Linux, or if you're using Screen, or if you're using this built-in one in Vert Manager, or you're using a Java-based serial over LAN implementation for your IPMI. So I'm just gonna trust that it might be fucked, so I don't wanna use an anti-clear code here. Um. Ref count's broken on page table, zero. Okay, so that means somewhere we don't create a ref count or we're incorrectly decrementing one down to zero, but I don't think that's the case. So here we're gonna go through depth, one to depth on these. So one to depth will be one to two, this or these three. If this table does not exist, then if there's no table we want, then we'll go up to the next level. If ii is greater than or equal to two, so this would be two, we're gonna subtract two, one, two, We'll update this because we're adding an entry here. Read the old one. Update the reference count. And use plus one. Shift to the left by 52. Or it into nent. Write it in. And we're going to do, this is pointer. This is the... Here we read it. I feel like that should be correct. Um, then here, get depth minus two. Read the entry, update it. and plus one, write in the new entry. I feel like this is correct. Clearly it's not. Um, I'm going to print the depth here. Uh, in this case, II. So let me see where we're having an issue. And if we're having on three, that's the least likely to have it in my opinion. So we're at this level. Um, I'm going to print the raw contents. Print the raw contents of the next entry. Line 342. Page file in use check. Let's assume or look for one. I mean, maybe it's possible that I have zero. No, it's not possible I have zero. This is a non-executable mapping. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, that doesn't have NX set. That's 512. Oh, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. Okay, um. 
Zero will mean one in this case because they only have nine bit. We can't store 512. So once we fill up a table, it'll go to 512. Well, I could borrow. I could use another bit. Um, we do have room to do this. We have room. So that means all of these can use 3FF. And now we use 10 bits. We could technically fit this in 9 bits if we add 0 mean 1. Um, oh. Really? Oh, yeah, uh, 511. Assert it's greater than zero, and it's less than an e less than or equal to five twelve. Now we're good. Okay, and yeah, it looks like we're freeing everything. So if we weren't freeing any of the pages, we would oom very hard here. So I'm pretty sure this works now. Uh, go through here. If i is greater than zero, then we can go to the level above. We can translate it. We can read the entry. If in use is one, then we're about to decrement it to zero, in which case free this table, go to the next level, cause it to get written with a zero. In this case, check that it's sane. Um, to be honest, we can do that here. Well, we can do it here because this is only going to be valid on one. Then we decrement the ref count and write in the new entry. Go to the next level. Okay. So I don't think we really have a need for all of those bit size. Fine, just using another bit there. It, we, but we could make it where 0 means 1 and 511 means 512. Uh, we totally could do that, but it would kind of complicate and confuse some of the logic that I don't think it's worth it, especially if we don't need that bit. Uh, so now what we can do is we can turn that off. We can put this up to 20 megs again. We'll get this booting. And let's reboot this. This will not work because there won't be enough RAM. Oh, uh, yeah, we haven't updated this. So in here, update that this to 16 gigs again. And this is what we were benchmarking before. It needs to be fast. Okay, yeah, so previously this was 3,500 million cycles, and now it is 2.2 uh, million cycles. So, it's pretty good. Uh, 3,500, what's the speed up on that? Oops, I should go uh, 3,500 divided by 2,200. So about a 60% speed up. That's pretty good. That's pretty damn good, to be honest. Um, but it's not done yet. Uh, we're going to look at Invalpig XED6. And what we're going to do is we're going to figure out if we can... Isn't that 30%? Uh, 30% off, 60 per, uh, yeah, I guess it is a 30% speed up in this case. Um, yeah, it's 60% from the 2000, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so what we want to do is invilpig determines that that contains and flushes all TLB entries for that page. If the paging structures map the linear address larger than that, and there are multiple TLB entries for that page, uh, invalidates all of them. If the paging structures map the linear address using a page larger than 4K and there are multiple TLB entries, okay. It may flush more entries, even the entire TLB. Also invalidates any global ones regardless of PCID.
Um, so we're losing a decent amount of perf due to validate. I'm going to say validate false uh, temporarily. I'm going to see how much that speeds us up. Honestly, not too much. A non-zero amount, though. Uh, I, I might make free panic. I might make it so if you try and free something that's not mapped, it panics. And then that way we don't have to deal with uh, validating everything first. Because um, then we'll just panic if we fail to translate, uh, if we fail to free. Uh, and we can cut down on that. Because we never, there's never really a situation where we're going to attempt to free something that's not mapped. In fact, I think by default I should have it panic. And if I do want a failable free, then I should have a way to check that and like either have a different implementation or have a like validate region and then it would validate it and then you could free it. Um, so what I would like to do is um, Let's see here. If we have up to the number of entries. The question is, the question is, if I free a table, can I invil pig for that whole table? Or do I need, so all of our perf loss right now is an invil pig. I can guarantee that, right? So if I get rid of invil pig, our perf is gonna go through the roof. Yeah, it basically uh, doubles the performance, right? And if I get rid of validate now as well, if I'm only doing this, right? Yeah, they're at a thousand cycles. So we're losing all of our perf on Invil Pig. And here's the thing that I'm wondering. Do I have to invoke invil pig for every page? If I end up freeing all pages that a table maps, can I invil pig for any page inside of there? And that will safely invil pig all of the pages. And I don't know if that's the case. I do think I, I'm forced to invil pig all of those entries. Which sucks. Really does. Um, yep, 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 yep. I could maybe, I, I mean, I hate that, but I'm pretty sure I have to do it on every single one. If the paging structures map the linear address using a page larger than 4K, and there are multiple TLB entries for that page. My interpretation of this is I might be able to do it at an arbitrary level. Let's see what we can do here. Um, we really care about... That's... We want to look at section... 41023. Okay. There can, uh, because the TLB cache entries only for linear edges, there can be a TLB entry for a page. Only if the P, uh, P flag is one and the reserved bits are zero. Yep, if it's a valid mapping. In addition, it does not cache a translation for a page number unless the access flag is one in each of the page structures used during translation. Before caching, before caching a translation, the process sets it. That is not already one. Okay, that makes sense. Um.
may cache translations required for prefetches and accesses that are a result of speculative execution that would never actually occur in the executed code path. That's actually really interesting. Uh, you can use the TLB entries to determine what was accessed during speculation. If the page number of uh, that is with the current PCI ID, then the processor may use that to determine the page frame access rights and other attributes. Okay. If the paging structures specify a translation using a page larger than 4K, some processors may cache multiple smaller page TLB entries for that translation. Each such TLB entry would be associated with a page number corresponding to the smaller page size, even though the part of the page number is blah, blah, blah. The upper bits of the physical address are derived from that. It's no, there's no way for software to be aware of that, of course. Thus, an invul pig will invalidate all the small ones. If software modifies the paging structures so that the page size used for a 4K range of linear addresses changes um if software modifies the paging structures so that the page size used for 4k changes um Which translation is used? Hmm. PML4 cache. Okay. caches that information instead of the PML 4 e from entry. It's not create this unless the P flag is set. Um, Make sure you have multiple entries, blah, blah, blah. Shouldn't rely on the presence or absence, okay. Invalidation of TLBs. Okay. Um, as noted in this, Do, do, do. Which is a linear address. The, the TLB doesn't shift anything, jump out. Um, instruction, invil pig. The instruction invalidates any TLB entries that are for a page number corresponding to the linear address and that are associated with the current PCID. It also invalidates any global TLB entries with that page number regardless of PCID. Invalpig also invalidates all entries in the page paging structure caches associated with the current PCID regardless of that. So, okay. Um, free to invalidate them. Yep. Uh, modifies a paging structure that maps a page 
to execute an invil pig uh, for any linear address. with a page number whose translation uses that. So if you modify a paging structure, so like a uh, in, intra page table, it modifies it such that it references a different one. With each of the page, uh, whoa. Modifies a paging entry such that it references another paging structure, it may use one of the following approaches depending on these. We can either Execute invilpig for each linear address with each of the page numbers uh, with translations that would use the entry. Because um, the p flag is zero, it remains necessary to execute that at least once. Oh, execute a move to CR3 if it doesn't have any global pages. And it won't. We don't use global pages. If PCIDE, we're not we're not using PCIDE at all in this case. It's like that's a completely separate feature of the processor. That's for uh, tagging TLB entries with the uh, with the specific table that's being used. So it allows you to like basically allows you to retain TLB entries while switching between different contexts uh, rather than invalidating all of the entries. So what we want to do is, I think we want to determine and in uh, move to CR3 if PCIDE invalidates all associated with that except for global pages. A move to CR0 invalidates everything and all entries and all paging structure caches for all PCIDs. If PG is uh, set from one to zero, if it changes, we cannot do that. So move to CR3 will invalidate all non-global pages. If we're not using any global pages and we're not using PCID, that means we will invalidate, we'll invalidate literally, yeah, I'm pretty sure this will cause us to invalidate every single uh, entry. So what I wanna do here, uh, always free to, may invalidate global, yep. If that may do that. So at a bare minimum, a move to CR3. So we need to figure out how fast a move to CR3 is. And it will be relatively expensive. But we need to figure out the cost of an invil pig. And then we need to figure out the cost of a move CR3. And if a move CR if if we know that the invil pig cost of invalidating each of the pages will be more expensive than that of doing a move CR3, then we should do one move CR3 if that makes sense. So that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna do a, a loop, um, CPU invil pig, uh, let me val is equal to five, doesn't matter what the type is. And then here we'll do an invil pig on val. And that, I do have that marked on safe. Uh, core pointer writes volatile to mute val and we'll write a five. That'll force the write to occur. Uh, technically we can just do a read volatile from that. Um, so this will tell me the cost of an invil pig and reloading it, which is, I guess not fair. Yeah, we'll go uh, for this in zero dot dot one million. So we're gonna figure out the cost of invil pigging for a million entries. Uh, let it is our uh, CPU RDTSC. Let elapse is equal to CPU RDTSC minus it. So we're gonna determine the approximate cost of an invil pig. 
And we'll say that this is elapsed as F64 divided by 1 million. And this will give us the number of cycles per invil pig. Uh, 150. I don't think that's entirely fair. Let's see what happens if we're not actually... If we don't actually have anything to invalidate. Wow. So it is, it is literally like 160. Yeah, so Invil Pig itself is about 160 cycles. Um, actually, mute Val. What does it take? It's supposed to take a U size as uh, mute U32 as U size. I was not giving it the right pointer. Um, it doesn't really matter, but uh, this is now something on the stack. Yeah, 150 cycles. So we're going to say that this is, we'll say invil pig is 150 cycles. And then a write to CR3 is probably going to be like 400 or something. So as long as we're unmapping more than whatever that is, like 10 pages, we should use an invil pig. So we'll do this. Uh, or we should use a write CR3. So let me shared CPU source. I don't think I have a CR3 in here yet. Yep. So we're going to do um, read to CR3, pub fn. This is going to be inline. And this is going to be a read CR3. It's going to return a U64. And we'll do a unsafe asm move into a register from CR3, where that register is an output register into a value, uh, let val u64 val, okay, no inputs, we're going to say that this clobbers memory, and we're going to say it's a volatile and intel syntax instruction, okay, um, oh, and that's a colon, and so we'll do this, this, this will return val, uh, read, uh, CR3, and then this will be write to CR3, and this will be pub on safe fn, uh, write to CR3 with a value, which will be a U64. In this case, it'll be an input. And we'll move from that register into that location. And we don't quite fit on one line, but so this is write CR3. Uh, we're going to take a value, and then we're going to write to that control register. Um, oh, and that doesn't return a value. Okay. Nice. So now what I can do is I can determine the cost of a... Uh, so this is a invil pig cost. And then this will be a uh, read write CR3. So CPU write CR3, CPU read CR3. And they're all volatile. So, and this will be a write CR3 cost. A million might actually be expensive here. Wow. Wow. No way is that only 200 cycles. What? That is absurd. I'm going to do just a read CR3. Okay, I was expecting it to be like thousands of cycles. Well, in this case, we can just probably write CR3 every time then. That's, that's insane. I was not expecting that. Okay, so reading CR3 is basically free. Writing to CR3. Um, yeah, 
So this means technically if I'm only doing one page, I should do an invil pick. Okay. Nice. Nice. So we're gonna say... Now this is a relatively modern microarchitecture, so it's hard to say if it would have these costs on a different system, but we're gonna say invil pig. At the very end, we'll perform the uh, invalidation. Oh, and in this case, we're gonna get rid of this whole validate concept completely. Translate the initial page, unwrap, determine the end. So this can fail, we're just gonna make this never fail. Um, expect uh, free of zero bytes. Okay, so we're gonna be like, what are you doing? And then here we'll do a expect uh, integer overflow on virtual free range. And we'll say virtual free. So size checks up that, checked at that, okay. Perfect. And then this whole thing. Okay. Then, uh, if we're going to free more virtual memory space than the user requested. Oh, I can't have that check anymore, sadly. So I will need to check. Yeah, I think here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, two, three, plus equals this. Assert size is less than or equal to, or assert that two, three is less than or equal to size. Um, Oh, and we'll do this. Can get rid of that. Okay. Free the page. And this is going to be, uh, and this will accumulate the number of bytes that have been freed. And in this case, yeah, we'll determine the number of bytes that have been freed. Uh, and we'll say freed is equal to this. And then this will be unwrap. Uh, we have that page size, page virtual address. Um, get the virtual address and size of this page that we that we're freeing, in this case, free plus equals size of unwrap. Okay, assert that the to free is less than or equal to that, and this will be um, attempted to free memory, which was not um, virtual free size was smaller than the page size of the requested free region. Okay, so now we'll panic in this case. Virtual free size was smaller than the page size of the requested free region. So we'll accumulate the, the amount that we're freeing and then we'll panic if we don't free exactly what the user requested. Um, I could just do that after the fact. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, next page, free the page. Amount of virtual memory we're freeing. And then here at the very end, and we're off on some uh, parentheses, or curly braces in this case. Why? Go through each level. 
loop. That makes sense. This should be the terminator for the loop. Um, what? Whoa. Wait a minute. Shouldn't this be for the loop? Oh, it's that. It's entirely that. I saw it. Okay. Um, nice. All right. Translate. We're going to get the table entries. We're going to go through all these levels. We're going to uh, go, go up the page table listing. We're going to convert that if it's no longer used. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, next page is equal to, I think we call it just vert adder, page vatter, and page size. Yeah. Uh, page adder, page size. Oops. Dot checked add page size. And this is going to be expect failed to translate a uh, virtual address during free 347 page virtual address dot zero to 12 expect yep we're just gonna free it 346. Uh, as U64. Okay, unnecessary unsafe block. Oh, that's on this. Okay, freed uh, 234. And then at the end, we're going to assert freed is equal to size. Uh, virtual free request. Uh, freed more bytes than requested. And this will be uh, make sure the caller understood exactly how much uh, virtual memory would be freed by this request. This effectively enforces the um, this effectively enforces the alignment and page size awareness such that if a user requests to free one byte but it's a four kilobyte page that this will panic because we freed more than the user expected okay uh 267 that's in main oh that's in uh kernel source mm 267. We'll just clean this up and then we're almost done with this code. Free the memory. Okay. Yeah, a thousand cycles, but we're not invilpigging at all. Yeah, there's no uh there's no invilpig. That's a problem. At the end, here we'll do um this will be invalidate the page tables. Um, invalidate the uh, non-global TLB entries. Uh, we don't use global pages at all, thus we can safely um, do a non-global invalidation. On our coffee lake, oops, Coffee Lake Machine and a write to CR3 costs about uh, 
200 cycles, where an invul pig costs uh, 150 cycles. Though the full TLB invalidation will have a runtime performance hit due to uh, TLBs needing to be need and to be repopulated for all for all page table entries. Uh, it seems this will be much faster uh, overall than validating every single page that we freed. Uh, in theory, for up to let's say like ten uh, page. In theory, for up to about 10 page uh, freeze, it's probably faster to invil pig uh, each individual page, but this margin margin is so small that we just always um, just always issue a write to CR3 instead. Okay. Uh, CPU write CR3 of a CPU read CR3. That'll invalidate the page tables. Unnecessary, unsafe, yep. Okay. Computer phobic, how are you doing, man? How's everyone doing, actually? It's a little bit quiet in here today. I guess I'm streaming at a weird time right now. I think it'll kind of pick up a little bit. Okay, we're gonna write CR3 here. Great. So now this will correctly invalidate everything and this will just add kind of that fixed cost. And yeah, there we go. So this is a complete free implementation. We have no way of returning out of the function early. And since we have no way to return out early, we have to go through here. We'll read CR3, write CR3, that'll invalidate all TLB entries um, and then here we assert that free is equal to size, and we'll actually put this at the very end. Validate the non-global TLB entries. We don't use global pages, and thus we can safely do a non-global invalidation. On our Coffee Lake machine, our write to CR3 costs about 200 cycles, where an invul, where an invul pig costs 150 cycles. Uh, It'll have a runtime performance hit due to TLB needed to be repopulated for all page table entries. Uh, it seems this will be much faster overall than invalidating every single page that we freed. In theory, for up to about 10 pages, uh, 10 page freeze is probably faster to invalid peg each individual page, but this margin is so small that we always issue a write to CR3 instead. This dramatically reduces the uh, cost of invalidating um, many pages, for example, uh, unmapping a one megabyte allocation. Okay. Almost 6 a.m. going to bed now. Yeah, get some good sleep. Is this stuff your full-time work? Uh, kind of. I mean, my full-time work is whatever I think is important. Uh, so in this case, yes, it is. Okay. So we're at a thousand M psych now. So there we go. We that took a little bit longer than I expected, but that's fine. We have plenty of time. Uh, so that took. We went from thirty five hundred cycles to a thousand cycles, which is pretty awesome. Uh, thirty five hundred divided one minus that. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty dramatic speed up. So it's pretty nuts. So now we can we can allocate, commit, and free sixteen gigs in about a mil uh, in a in a thousand million cycles. So in about a billion cycles. So let's say a billion cycles. I'm gonna turn on some lights and uh, refill my water. I'll be right back.
Holy shit, computer phobic tier 3 sub. Holy shit, man. Thank you so much. Hell yeah. Got my wine refilled. New bottle of wine today. Oh, this smells so good. Love the stream. Glad you're enjoying it. So we're at, uh, this is about a billion cycles. This is a, I think a 3.2 gigahertz processor. Uh, right? 3.2, yeah. So this is saying, two, three, four, five, six, divided by, uh, well, at 3,200 divided by whatever this number is. I'm going to actually say 950. So we can do about 3.3 16 gig alloc freeze in a loop. Uh, so yeah, 3.3 per second, which is, I think, pretty good. Um, oh, and I'm going to add one more, uh, one more thing here. I'm going to say, if uh, let's cur CR3 is equal to CPU read CR3. If cur CR3 and not OXFFF, uh, mask off the VPID bits. If the current CR3 and not FFF is equal to uh, self.table. Then we invalidate. Um, set text width uh, 79, and then we'll just reformat these. Okay. So, uh, check to see if we're modifying the active page table. If we are, we have to invalidate uh, mappings. So basically, if the current CR3 is what we're modifying, and I think that is a fizz adder, yep. So if the current CR3 is what's being uh, modified, then we have to invalidate the entries. If it's not, if we're modifying some other CR3, then we don't actually have to invalidate the TLBs, in which case we can skip the uh, TLB invalidation code. And that read CR3 is relatively cheap. We saw it was like eight cycles. So that'll cost us about eight cycles to see if we're on that page table. This doesn't affect us because we are modifying our current page table. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to write a benchmark on Linux. Uh, and I want to see how fast Linux, Linux can map. Now, uh, we're going to do um, cargo new uh, bin Linux bench. Uh, Linux benchmark. Oops. Vim source this. Uh, FN RDTSC, this is equal to U64, which is from unsafe uh, standard arc x 64 RDTSC. So we have that. Let IT is RDTSC. And then we'll do an M map. And this is an M map and an M unmap because we are we're creating it and destroying it in the benchmark. Oops. Uh do do do. Okay. Uh, RDTSC, and then here we'll do an M map, uh, VSP. Um, uh, oops, stream term, man M map, and then in this case we'll get rid of this, such that we can go to a normal split size. Okay. So we'll do an M map, and in this case, an M map will be an extern uh, C, which will be uh, M map. It'll take an address. It'll take a uh, length. Uh, it'll take a protection, which is an I32 flag, I32, an FD, which is an I32, and an offset, which is an I64. Uh, we'll have an M on map, which will take an address, which is a U size, and this will return. Uh, u size and then we have address and then a length which is a u size um actually i can use uh libc here can i uh extern create libc 
Since this is a benchmark, I don't care about dependencies. Uh, Extra create libc. This is in Linux. Cargo run. Uh, rusty private. Yeah, and here we'll just say libc is equal to. I don't. I don't really give a shit. Give me the latest version. Okay. So this will give us libc, and I should be able to do a libc mmap, man mmap. Here we'll do an address, which will be zero, a length, which is 16 gigabitos. Um, and then the protections, prot read or prot write. Uh, here we'll do use libc star. This will be unsafe. Prot read or write flags. Um, map anonymous, map private. So we have a private mapping, it's anonymous. And then we have an FD and an offset, assert uh, map is equal to this. Assert map is not equal to map failed, I think is what it returns. Pretty sure. Let's take a look. Yep, it returns map failed, which is a negative one. Cargo run. Okay. Um, uh, standard pointer null mute. So we'll map 16 gigabitos as RW, as anonymous and private. And we assert that it did not fail. And then we'll do, uh, and if we do this in a loop, right? And this is not going to be fair yet, and I'll, 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 I'll show you why in a second. But uh, Linux is not actually going to perform this mapping. Okay, perfect. So that eventually fails because we're looping, of course. So um, mun map. So we'll want to mun map, map, and then 16 gigs. And then we'll assert that this is equal to zero, which I think is the success case. Munmap, uh, on success it returns zero. Okay. All right, and then cargo run release. Okay, so that's doing the benchmark. And then let's elapsed is equal to rdtsc minus it print took this m cycles 12.4, same thing as we did before. Here we'll do, um, Lapse as F64 divided by 1 million. Okay. Wow. How is how is Linux allocating so much faster than we can allocate? Well, that's that means that our stuff is a million times slower than Linux is. Uh-oh. But that's not actually the case. And that's because Linux is not actually mapping this memory. Um, it's just saying that this is mapped, and it will fault it in lazily. Um, it'll fault it in lazily uh, when needed. So, what we need to do is we need to do an mlock all, which I think will guarantee that the allocations will... Um... Ooh, actually, I think I can just do locked on that specific one, locked. Mark the map region to be locked in the same way as mlock. This implementate will try to populate, pre-fault, the whole range, but the mmap call doesn't fail with enomem if this fails. So we're gonna say, we want to map locked. And this basically says, I want to actually make sure all of that gets allocated, and then here we're gonna need to run this as root, because mlock requires root on Linux. Um, uh, sudo target release uh, Linux bench. Okay, there we go. So, this is now causing all of that memory to get realized in physical memory. Uh, and this is the real benchmark. This is a one-to-one -one comparison between what we're doing in our operating system, where we are mapping memory, we're not initializing it, we're mapping memory, we're making sure that it's physically commit in, we're not faulting it in lazily, it, like we actually 
allocate a physical page and place it in there. And yep, we're about four times faster than Linux. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? We're actually about four and a half times faster than Linux. Can you explain how? Well, Linux is just going to have, well, quite frankly, they just probably don't have it as optimized as we have it. They have it more generic to their, um, they have it more generic to more architectures. They'll use different tables for storing the information. And pretty much every single operating system is, are incredibly unoptimized when it comes to allocating virtual memory. It's just, unfortunately, kind of how it is. Um, a lot of operating systems don't optimize this path too much because this is the uncommon path. What they optimize is you map something, you don't lock it in, you lazily fault in the pages. In which case, let's, uh, let's try this. Um, let mem is equal to a vec... Uh, mem is equal to... Uh, standard slice from parts uh, from raw parts mute and here we'll say map as mute u128 uh, we'll say mute u64 ah uh, we'll do mute u8 and then this will be 16 gig so make a we'll make a slice and then we'll do 4 ii in 0 mem len step by 4096. So we're just going to write to every single page uh, and we'll get rid of this locked. And we'll just do it like a normal allocation. And here we're going to do a mem ii and we'll do a, a, a core pointer write volatile to mem offset ii as i size. And we'll do the same thing on our end, uh, cargo build release. And keep in mind, we're also running in a VM on ours, so we might theoretically get slightly hurt. Oh, we're going to write a zero. So we're going to write a zero to every page, causing those to get faulted in uh, as mute pointer. OK, built release. Here we go. And there we go, yeah, uh, about 4.5 million cycles to do this. Um, and if we didn't have this right volatile, if we got rid of this, oops, we'll just put this on a one-liner. If we got rid of this, it should be really fast again, right? Super, super, super fast. So this is allocating and causing those to get faulted in. And I suspect that Linux is actually probably zeroing out those whole pages. Um, we're not actually zeroing out the pages, so we could compare that. Now, since we're in Rust, we don't need to zero out the pages. We don't need to initialize the pages. Um, in fact, uh, man and map. Let's see. There is a. I think there is an uninit. Um, I think there's an uninit. Oh, populate. Um, map no reserve, not not that one. Fix no replace. Maybe they deprecated it. Oh, map uninitialized, right there. Uh, do not clear anonymous pages. It's intended to improve performance on embedded devices. <laughs> it's only honored if the kernel was configured with this because of the security implications. Ah, so this might not work then. Oh, it doesn't even have that in the lib. Yeah, yeah, all right. So this is writing Writing a zero to all the pages. Linux is going to fault in the pages. Uh, actually, we can we don't need sudo anymore for this because we're writing to them. Uh, so this is going to fault in the pages 
and it's going to fault them in as zeros. So this isn't necessarily identical to what we're doing because we're calling alloc fizz um, and we're uninitializing it. So we'll do alloc fizz zeroed. And what's alloc fizz do? Okay, so this is a little bit more comparable because this will write in zeros. Let's see what we get here. This might actually be kind of at parity, to be honest. This might actually be really close. Or or slower? Wow, it's slower. Uh-oh. 7.8. Is my is my zeroing thing not getting optimized by the compiler? And we're using a slow zeroing mechanism. Or is Linux, does Linux have a free pool of already zeroed pages? Because if it does, then, yeah, if Linux can allocate zeroed pages, then it might be recording the cost somewhere else. I don't think that's the case. It's probably zeroing it out. I think our mem set's just really slow. Isn't initializing it necessary because of memory leak? No, not in this case. Uh, allocating the, initializing to zero is just not valid. Um, so there's no reason that we'll do it, so we won't in our kernel. But let's take a look here at um, obj dump d build uh, kernel x this release kernel.exe m intel vim dash. And this is a uh, map and knit. Um, really? We got map. Oh, we're not calling map and knit. So map is going to um, it's probably gonna call memset. There's the mem set. Is this in that function now? No. Oh, that's alloc fizz zeroed. So alloc fizz zeroed will literally call mem set on that. And let's take a look at our mem set then. Yeah, our mem set should be optimized. Our mem set absolutely should be optimized. Huh. So I'll get splatted out and it will do the bulk writes. Interesting. Alec fizz zeroed. Alec fizz. Why is our zeroing so much slower? I'm actually really surprised by that. Now we are in a VM, so maybe it's not fair to do these comparisons. So let's bring this up on a non VM, on, a, on actual hardware. Wait, it jumps up when we're running the VM? Oh yeah, they're linked. Wow, they're sharing resources. Okay, I bet it's the VM. I bet it's the VM that's hurting us here. Which makes no sense really because it should It doesn't really matter because we're not going to return to initialize, but I am curious here. Uh, I'm going to bring up my server quick. 
such that we can run this on native hardware. Uh, here we go. And we'll reboot this and we'll see what we get. Um, this is the same microarchitecture on this machine. If my IPMI lets me connect in. I'm trying to reboot it on another screen here. Remote control, power control, reset server. Okay. So that's going to get rebooted, and that will boot into this kernel. But I I'm guessing we're just losing our performance due to having that VM... Because check this out. If we run this now, while that VM's running, <laughs> it's pretty comparable. So let's take a let's take a look here. Obviously, this one gets hurt while it's running, but we'll get this up and running on hardware. And let me see what this hardware is. This is a. This hardware's at 3.7 gigahertz, but the, the clocks will be the same. Since we're doing everything in cycles, uh, it's the same microarchitecture. So it'll be an apples to apples comparison for the microarchitecture. So let's see what we get here. I'm expecting that, that memory, the memory access times are just worse than that VM, to be honest, through that nested paging. Oh, fuck. Uh, this machine does not have. This machine only has 8 gigs of RAM? Jesus. Okay, uh, we'll switch our test to 4 gig then. And that should work. We'll have new numbers now. Okay, force off. And then we'll reboot this other machine. I switched it to 4 gigs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is a super low RAM server, I guess. Uh, and then we'll change this benchmark to 4, so we have this 4-gig uh, base benchmark as well. <laughs> what is this, a computer for ants? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a, a rough one. Okay. That actually kind of lines up, doesn't it? That lines up pretty close. What's this getting here? Okay. Saying this is saying we're twice, twice as slow. I'm gonna press X to add out. Oh, this wine is good. It needs to air a little bit more though. It needs a little bit more bite. Okay, here we go. Wow. How is Linux outperforming us? Well now, well now I feel very inadequate. Are our allocations much slower? No. Um. You know what? Linux is reusing that virtual address, isn't it? Is that why? I'm gonna get rid of my invil pig uh, thing as well, the right CR3 stuff. I'm gonna get rid of this just to make sure that's not part of the equation. I don't think it is. And we should be able to run this in the VM because it does look like they are basically comparable, which makes sense. Uh, re reset. Okay. Nope, that didn't change perf. Good. Okay. So. Yeah, it shouldn't matter if we're creating new virtual addresses. Because I don't think Linux caches that information at all. Translate write bytes. Zero for size. Huh. Huh.
maybe our pa page allocator is underperforming Linux. That shouldn't be the case, but maybe it is. We only have one. We only have one core, I think. So I'm gonna do. Um, yeah, I think we turned off all but one core. Yeah, that's single core right now. So what this means is I can actually do this. Um, shared lock cell source. And we can disable the locks globally, and we can see if we have if it's lock contention issues. Don't do that, by the way. Oops. And we're going to see. Here we go. Okay, that didn't help us. I wonder if it I wonder if it's our mem set. I mean, it has to be mem set. It ha it has to be our mem set. It has to be our mem set. Um, get diff, get status. Um, because if we do alloc page, alloc page, oops, uh, fizz zeroed. Because if we change this to alloc fizz, we slaughter it. We slaughtered the performance of Linux. Yeah. Oh, we currently have this running, don't we? Oh, that's on the that's on hardware. This should not be running. It isn't. So And then we can pause that and then here so we beat it by about 4x. And then we're slower by 2x, which means that we're 1,000 cycles slower. So we, we add 1750 cycles to our cost by zeroing. And Linux shows that we can zero it in under that, which means that the zeroing, worst case scenario, we should end up adding 1,200 cycles. Because Linux shows that it can zero this memory at that speed. So what that means is that um, we're not able to zero the memory fast enough, I guess. Um, I know why. We're not getting any prefetcher. We're not getting any prefetcher going on. We should allocate everything and then at the end, zero the whole thing out. That's what we're going to do. Is at the very end of this function where we're about to return out on uh Yeah, the problem is if we do alloc if, if we do the zeroing there on the page level allocations, we don't get any prefetching. It's totally what it is. Holy shit. It was so so obvious. Um we're going to have map and it uh, map will zero it out. Whenever we call map, we're going to zero it out. Uh, let ret uh, is equal to this. Ret if let sum ret is equal to ret. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We're not using this. So we're going to say if it succeeded in performing the mapping, then... And what is it? Map panics in all all cases, doesn't it? Oh, it undoes if it fails. Okay. I might just have that one panic as well. But the undo shouldn't matter because we don't have to pay that cost unless we hit it. And that's why we designed it that way. Okay, so now we just have to zero all of this out. So we have a new virtual mapping for size bytes. So uh, let mute map is equal to unsafe uh slice oh here we can just do this 
uh, core pointer write bytes virtual address as mute u8 initialized to zero for size bytes. So this will zero it out. It'll allocate it as uninitialized and then it'll zero it out. And that's probably what Linux is doing. Let's make sure this benchmark's not running. It's not. And then uh, we'll just shut this server down. Okay, and we'll exit that. So this is our Linux benchmark stuff. And then here. All right. What are your thoughts? Is this gonna is this gonna outperform Linux's 1200? Um, map. What? Oh, uh, that's failing because this is going to initialize it. Okay, we're just gonna do this. That's gonna initialize memory that's not valid in 32-bit uh, space because we use map in our um, we use map to perform allocations in our bootloader, and so we'll go back to this, boop, and then we'll just zero it out on the. Uh, so this this is uninit. This is full uninit, and then we're going to zero it out on our side. So here we have a pointer. We'll set this as mutable, so it's uninitialized. We're gonna get the mutable pointer, and we'll do a, a core mem write uh, write bytes elk zero elk dot capacity. So we'll zero out the whole thing here. A core pointer write bytes. Woof. Uh, 58, uh, oh yeah, 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 this is pointer. And we'll see, that might get optimized out. I think that's getting optimized out. <sighs> Damn it, Rust. It's either getting optimized out or it's that fast. Um, let's see, right bytes. I don't think there's a right bytes volatile. <sighs> yeah, there's right volatile. We'll do that for ii in zero dot dot elk dot capacity. This should get optimized by Rust. We'll do um, core pointer write volatile to pointer dot offset ii as i size and we'll write a zero. So this will definitely cause Rust to generate the writes. Oh, it's <sighs> so in that case, it has to write them one byte at a time. Um, so we'll do th we'll do this. God damn it! Just let me win. Five hundred twelve for you. One twenty eight. There we go. So this will be able to write them as uh, SSE. Unless it can't. Fuck it, fuck it. We'll call memset ourselves. And it shouldn't be able to optimize out that call to memset, I don't think. Uh, pointer zero. Elk dot uh, capacity uh, core. I hope it can't optimize that. I don't think it can because that's an extern CFN. <coughs> I'm actually afraid that's not being initialized. 
So this will disassemble the kernel. Um, entry. Memset. This is inside of Alec Fizz. I think it is optimizing that out. Son of a bitch. Um, I do think the write of 128 should work. With capacity, corex mem set. Isn't there like a volatile pointer or something in Rust? Ooh, volatile set memory. Oh, it's mem set. It'll not be optimized out unless size is equal to zero. Okay, okay. Uh, volatile set memory, pointer zero elk dot capacity. Uh, core intrinsics. Feature core intrin. I have to do it up here. Core intrinsics. Okay, well that shouldn't get optimized out now. Still slower. Why? Is my mem set that slow? The only thing that would make sense is my mem set is slow. But it shouldn't really be. Um, yeah, this should be a relatively fast mem set. What the fuck? Or Linux is not doing something. We're going to do that. We're going to benchmark the time it takes to write the memory. Yeah, it's 20, 2200 cycles to mem set it. Okay, so we can take this same code. We'll put it here. Uh, we'll put unsafe on the outside. Okay, and that took that many cycles. Uh, in this case, we'll have it's the four gigabytes. It's possible my mem set's slow, but I don't think it'll be that bad. RDTSC minus this, so we're going to initialize it. Here we're going to say map fixed, or not map fixed, uh, map locked. So we'll guarantee that it's locked. Let pointer is equal to mem as mute u8. Oh, mem as mute pointer. Okay. Feature core intrinsics. And we just got to put another curly. No unsafe needed here. So we're going to volatile set memory that. And then we have to run it as root. Okay. That means the mem set is fundamentally faster.
what is it possibly doing that's faster? Or we're we getting scheduled out on the... But yeah, this is saying that the mem set here is 1400 cycles. Let's do this, just because we can. 1300 cycles. So it takes 1300 cycles to mem set. And how fast was Linux doing the whole shebang? Um, 1,600. So if we take 1,600 minus 1,300, yeah, I guess we have about the same mapping times as Linux when it comes to uninit, but our mem set is slower. Why is our mem set slower? Oops. Let's take a look. Is that going to get... Uh, RDTSC. M map. So that calls libc M map. Mun map. Oh, we're not doing it right now. Okay. So it does look like we should be roughly the same performance as Linux. Might be a, 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 a smidge faster. And then we'll see if we scale better than Linux, because I bet we do. Okay. Um, yeah, this is kind of a good example of how I do a lot of benchmarking work as well. So this is benchmarking just that mem set, and now we can see RDTSC, and yep, it calls mem set in glibc. So we can see how glibc implements their mem set, and maybe we're just significantly slower somehow. But I'm going to press X to doubt. I guess they could be using AVX 256. Um, I thought they don't use AVX in the kernel. Maybe they will for memset. So let's take a look at... I guess we need to know what the memset implementation is. Um, can I do a static binary in Rust? Yeah, I know it's in userland, but I mean for when they zero it in the kernel, they also have a comparable performance. I think you have to do a uh, musil binary. So what we're going to do is that's going to call that mem set. Uh, shared core requirements source mem set. Let's see if we can do this. Probably going to have a link failure here. I'm guessing this will fail the link. It did not fail the link. Hey! It So it definitely is our mem set. Um, yeah. It, it's clearly our mem set because natively we're having the same issue. Okay. Now, is that just because the mem set is going to... Um, work for a specific CPU set. Um, Rust CPU feature. I forget how they do this. Uh, Rust config CPU feature. There's a way to do this. There's a way on a specific function. Yeah, target feature AVX2. Okay. 
So here's what I can do is for this function, and this will allow the optimizer to optimize it for a specific uh, architecture. Check this shit out. We're going to say, assume that AVX2 is present, which it is. Um, still slow. Check if you turn enable. I don't have AVX512. If I did AVX512F, this should now crash. Um, and we'll just do this. But this should allow it to optimize for that specific architecture. Okay, it's not doing that. What? I thought when you do this, it'll optimize for that specific one, but maybe not. Inline cannot be used. Yep. Compilation of code based on compile time settings. Um. Maybe I should have fast moves on this architecture. So let me try this. Unsafe asm. And this will be uh, target feature uh, assembly. Try running more than a U8 at a time. It is doing that. Internally, that's what it's doing. So here, I can. So if I do uh, rust flags uh, C target CPU is equal to native, this is going to build it uh, from the native system. And this should use AVX2 uh, for this. But I guess maybe the AVX2 is actually bad perf. Uh, mem set. Here's our memset implementation. Here it's using YMEMS, right? It's using uh, 16 bytes at a time. And... Dude, I'm actually really surprised that that performance is so hurt. Does does glibc simply use a rep mo uh, rep sto rep store? Um, rep stos b. In this case, we will have a an input in. Uh, RDI, specifically RDI, is going to be S. We have an input in RCX, which is going to be N. And we have an input in um, AL, which is the character. And we'll just say EAX is the character. There's a memory clobber, and it's a uh, volatile and intel so we'll see this is just going to do a repstos b and this there it is wow wow so the fast uh the rep Stosby is so much faster than, I mean, that makes, it makes sense because uh, Intel added uh, uh, fast, uh, fast string uh, Intel. Um, and it's a, it's a flag that basically, it means that like the rep prefix is, uh, like super super fast now. Do st string ver uh, 
See if Agner Fogg talks about it at all. I don't know if he does. But basically, there is a flag, I think, in CPU ID that tells you if it's a, if the like rep string functions are fast, because uh, they can go out of order. And maybe they don't have it. Um, but basically, doing a, doing a mem set via a rep stows B is, uh, is like much faster because the processor is like aware of what's going on and can pull in pages and prefetch things in a much better way because it's a very very strong hint to the uh, it's a very strong hint to the uh, CPU that what you're trying to do is I want to write the byte present in AL to all of memory at RCX RD, you know at RDI for RCX bytes right so. Um, yeah. Okay. So I guess that's what we want to use for our memset implementation. So, and we'll want our mem copies and stuff to do the same thing. Now, this should fail to build because our bootloader won't have that. Oh, and also we need to return. Um, Memset returns a pointer to S. Okay, perfect. So now we're compliant with memset. Repstos B, RDI, RCX, EAX for the character. And this we just need feature asm. Okay, and couldn't allocate that. So this is going to be for a 32-bit. Uh, so config target arc is equal to i586. Is it this? Nope. Uh, oh, it's just x86 in Rust, I think. The target architecture is x86. Then do this. Otherwise, if the target architecture is x86-64, and in this case, it'll be EDI, ECX, and EAX, and in this case, it'll be RDI, RCX, uh, and then EAX, because it's still a 32-bit. Uh, so this should now build for both, and let's see what we get. There we go. All right, and then uh, we'll get rid of this shit. And I do think writing it a page at a time will be fine now. Uh, alloc fizz in page table. And here we can say alloc fizz zeroed. This will allow reuse of some of the TLB entries for some of these fields. Elapsed. Oh. Paste, paste. Delete this. Okay. So this will be Alex zeroed now. Oh, 1200. Fuck yeah. Are we invil pigging right now? Uh, right, CR3. Oh, let's make sure that's in there. Oops, uh, page table. Yeah, we're still writing CR3. Fuck yeah! Fuck yeah! 1200 cycles! Or, er, er, oh, not 1200. 1200 million cycles. 1.2 billion cycles. And this is for a. And what was Linux? So we're gonna pause this. And Linux is. We're gonna not do locked. We're going to say, actually, we will do locked. We'll say, hey, I want the kernel to give me allocations. I'm going to start a timer. I'm going to alloc 4 gigs. I'm going to lock it so it will get all zero initialized. And then I'll unmap it. And since that's, a syscall, since that's a syscall, it won't get optimized across that boundary. And then we're going to build this. Uh, we'll get rid of this mem set, which is our mem set. Bye bye. 
and we'll build it, release build, and then we'll run it. Okay, so yeah, we're about the same as Linux, which uh, I think makes sense in this case. Uh, let's go to 16 gigs. So, and here's why. The, the cost of allocating on, the cost of making the pages is, is so dwarfed by the cost of the actual zeroing of the memory itself that the, um, that it really is not, it really has nothing to do with the speed of your virtual memory allocator. We're really comparing our memset implementations, right? That, that's all we're really doing right now is we're comparing memset against memset because the cost this 4,000 cycles, like a couple hundred of it, is the cost of actually making the allocations, or maybe a thousand of it. The rest is all zeroing the memory, which is the expensive part. So this is 4,400. That's for 16 gigs. And let's go here, and we'll change this to 16 gigabitos. And here we go. Uh, we have it paused. There we go. The first one will be slow, and then the subsequent ones will be faster. Um, and that's just the VM giving us stuff. So we're still a, a, a smidge a smidge slower. I'm, I'm kind of surprised by that. Huh. Huh. That's why you want to skip zeroing if possible. Now, in our kernel, it is possible. So our actual performance of... Mems uh, of this exact same code, which is identical to the Linux side, but without the zeroing, because we can return without zeroing, um, we can simply change where we allocate the page and and honestly, this might be due to our translate stuff. Let's go into shared uh, page table. Uh, oops. Let's go into our, the translate routine here. And what we're gonna do is, first of all, we're gonna mark this inline. I think traits can automatically get inlined. Let me actually check that. I'm gonna see if that's getting inlined. Because if traits can't get inlined, then I'll want to um, make sure that's inlined. Uh, alloc fizz zeroed. This is going to, um, oh, that's calling it. Here's our implementation. Uh, that inline that. So I'm guessing translate will get inlined as well. I think traits can be inlined. That calls memset at the end. Um, is there a call to translate here? There's a call to panic. Yeah, that's gonna call memset. Where does it get the arg to memset from? Uh, panic bounds check. Where the fuck was it? There's the memset. So that's coming from R15. I can just search for translate. And what function are we in? We are in alloc fizz zeroed. Wow, that's calling translate. I think we have to mark that inline. And let's do this. And let's see if that changes the code generation a little bit. The Linux kernel isn't gonna bounce check its physical memory accesses. So we're like, we're not really comparing apples to apples because we're stricter than Linux. Uh, FFF Cafe, that's the, um, 
That's no longer calling translate, is it? Page table translate. Can you not inline on a trait? Is this intended to be running on computers with multiple users? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay, well, let's see what this does for perf. Um, oh, it's paused. Yeah, okay, that didn't really have an effect. That is great. That's what I wanted. Uh, actually, here we can do inline always. But I don't think inlining works on a... Yeah, inlining doesn't work on a trait. Uh, Rust trait inline... Um, trait. There's no body. Yep, that makes sense. Require inline always, yeah. Um, but it doesn't look like that inline is actually happening uh, across that boundary. Uh, we can LTO it. If we LTO it, probably can. Let's take a look. Um, kernel cargo toml. Uh, LTO is fat. Cargo run clean. Cargo run. Now it should be able to inline that. We have translate here. That's on the page table. And yep, that's gone. It's now been inlined. Um, okay. Forty eight hundred. Yeah, it just it just didn't matter. It just really doesn't. Um get rid of this. See what happens. Seventy four, forty eight. And what's the number to beat? Uh, the number to beat is 4,400. Yeah, we're... Okay, and now we'll try it on hardware. Uh, oops. Term. Uh, CPU LAN soul. And we'll try it on real hardware. And we'll see if we're... If this is just a slight loss. Uh, kernel cargo toml. If it's a slight loss due to, um... Just due to being in a VM. And we'll see. We'll see what we get here. There's a chance that Linux has some benefit because uh, when it's... Um, yeah, when it's allocating those... Huh. We're invalidating the TLBs pretty aggressively, which maybe is hurting us. Probably not. Our TLB invalidation shouldn't be hurting us that much. It should be pretty much below the noise floor. Oh, and we need to change this to 4 gigs before we boot, and hopefully we beat it. And I think we did. Just barely. So now we're doing 4 gigs. We'll change this benchmark to do 4 gigs as well, such that it's apples to apples. Okay. So this is for 4 gigs on Linux. Oh yeah, it's basically the fucking same. It, yeah, it's basically the fucking same. Uh, and let's see in the VM context. Now I can show you where our implementation is better in a second. 
yeah, it's just a little bit slower in the VM. Now, it's obviously much more consistent here, right? Of course, ours is going to be more consistent because it's running bare metal on real hardware, right? It's, it's not fluctuating more than, like, 10, <laughs> uh, 10 cycles, whereas this is all over the fucking place, right? Um, by an order of, like, hundreds of cycles. But that's because we're on native hardware. That's not fair. And then in the VM, it's even worse. Um, but here's where I can show you that ours is uh, better. We're going to run that there. We're going to create a whole new process. Um, Linux bench. Uh, cargo run release. Oops. Uh, whatever this command is. Sudo to run it. So we're going to run it here, 4 gigs. Oh, wow. The Linux kernel virtual memory allocator doesn't scale. Two separate process spaces. And there the performance goes in the shitter. Because <laughs> the Linux memory allocator does not scale with cores at all, because there's a giant lock on all of it. So if you have two cores doing virtual allocations, this is what happens. <laughs> this has nothing to do with the fact that they're in the same process, because remember, these are two separate processes. It's their own CR3s. It's their own complete address spaces. And then it goes back to normal. So what we can do is we can say uh, for in zero dot dot four number of threads uh, core um, or standard thread spawn, and we'll create a thread that'll do this, and we'll create four threads that do this. Uh, Okay, and then here we'll just do a uh, uh, standard thread sleep ms big number. Uh, that's because I'm too lazy to actually like wait to join the threads. Okay, so here we go. Here's with all the threads running. Mmm, mmm, nice, <laughs> nice, very good. Exactly what I want. Four threads. Okay, so in ours, let's simulate four different processes. Uh, let me, uh, here we'll do core. We don't care about the core ID in this case. Here we're gonna uh, let me page table because processes or VMs or whatever have se separate uh, page tables. So here's what we can do. We can do uh, pay, uh, page table, page table new create a new page table then we're going to uh allocate out of that so we're gonna um map so we'll do page table dot map uh we got to give it a fizzmem let fizzmem is equal to uh we'll say pmem is equal to mm physical memory we'll give it access to physical memory we're gonna map using mute pmem Vert adder, uh, and we're gonna map. I guess it doesn't really matter where we put it, so we'll just put it at boob, because chat always seems to be wanting to load at adder's boob. Um, page table, page type, page 4K. Size is 4 gigs. Uh, it's readable, writable, and it's not executable. So this is much more similar to what we're actually doing in Linux. Uh, page table dot free mute pmem vert adder. This is the virtual address, and then I think we just give it a size. Uh, oh, this takes a pmem. Fifty-eight takes seven args, but eight were supplied. Oh, size. 
Okay, and then pointer in this case uh, doesn't matter anymore. Russ can't optimize those things out. And then here we'll use use page table uh, vert adder. Uh, and then this stuff is uh, unsafe. Just this one is unsafe. Okay, so we'll do this. Uh, this will just be one core right now. Okay, and let's bring up more cores. So on the Linux side of things, we know that uh, if you have four cores, you get one quarter of the performance, or it gets 4x slower. Actually, that's 4x slower for all of them. <laughs> Beautiful, love it. Okay, uh, and in this case, we'll go to four cores, same machine, in a VM. And let's see what we get. Uh, text console, here we go, four cores. <clears throat> First one's slow. Ah, oh, fuck. Never mind. It doesn't scale. I lied. Sorry. Never mind. I thought it was going to be faster. It's not. Why is that the case? Why is that the case? Actually, because it shouldn't be. Or is that scaling... That was anticlimactic. Yes, it was. Fuck. Why doesn't that scale? Why doesn't that scale? It should scale linearly. Um... Oh, it's not scaling because it's bottlenecking on the uh, memory bandwidth. That's what it is. It's bottlenecking on that. Well, luckily, in our version, we don't have to do zero, so we can do this. And here we go. <laughs> it's just bottlenecking on. It's literally bottlenecking on on memory bandwidth. It's entirely what it is. Woo. Okay, so Artemix, Rob, rain with a party 86, hell yeah, thanks Rob, hope your stream was fantastic, how was your stream, what, what were you up to today? Roost, Rob, raid, what OS are you using, I'm using uh, Debian here, hi, what's up, what's up, butt stunts? <laughs> We're using Debian here. Hell yeah. Thank you so much for that raid. Fuck yeah. <laughs> what are we looking at? We are working on a, a kernel and bootloader and hypervisor, all written in Rust that runs on bare metal. So we, this, uh, this is, uh, we call this Chocolate Milk, which is the name of this uh, project. You can get the source here. It's all open source on GitHub. But effectively, uh, what we're doing here is we have a, we wrote a bootloader like four days ago, and we wrote a pixie loader like three days ago, and then two days ago we wrote a kernel with a virtual and physical memory allocator. Um, and right now we're just toying around with some of the performance. So this is our, basically, we have uh, four cores in this VM right now. So we added four cores to this VM. We boot our operating system. It spins up all four cores. And then it performs uh, four gig uh, allocations and freeze in a loop. And it's showing me the uh, millions of cycles to perform those allocs and freeze. And then we're using this to do the same thing on the Linux side of things to see the performance that Linux gets um, with four, uh, four threads. And we see that we're getting, we're getting about 500 to 1,000. So we're about... Uh, Compared to Linux, in this case, user land Linux, it's not fair because we're we're only kernel land. We're about, I don't know, between four to eight times faster, which uh, makes sense. Anyways, so we write this kernel, and we write a lot of kernels here on this stream. So to us, uh, kernels are disposable. Uh, we write kernels whenever we need something to get raw uh, 
control of physical hardware. So <laughs> we wrote a um, we wrote this kernel, and this is intentionally made for fuzzing. So effectively, what we're going to be able to do here is we're going to be able to make a hypervisor, a very thin hypervisor, where we can write uh, we can run Linux or Windows or whatever, and we can fuzz a target with linear scaling and much better performance of existing virtual uh, virtual machines to fuzz. And I've been doing this. Uh, I've been writing high performance fuzzers using virtual machines for about six years now. So th <laughs> I've been. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, and thanks for all of the follows. I love seeing the follows. We're actually, uh, we're about one stream away from hitting partner on Twitch, which will be really fun. Do you have any good resources to look at? Uh, for this right now, it's mainly just the previous VODs, which are up on, on YouTube. I upload all the VODs there. Wait, oh, I thought that was just YouTube link. It is my user. Okay. Um, but yeah. So effectively, what we're doing is we're writing high-performance fuzzers using virtual machines. And to do this, we're writing a kernel and an operating system, or we're writing a kernel and uh, a bootloader. So the bootloader we wrote in Rust, and that's what we compile, and it's uh, 18 kilobytes of code. And the bootloader is responsible, and we can look at that just uh, at a high level. So what the bootloader does is, this is the entry point. Uh, it initializes the serial port because we don't actually print to the screen. Uh, we only print to serial. And the reason we use serial is that you can copy you can copy pasta over the serial port, but you can't do that from the screen. So we initialize the serial driver. We initialize the MMU, which gives us access to physical memory. That's going to ask the BIOS uh, what physical memory is available for use, and we'll make a list, and that's our free memory. And then at this point, we're gonna use uh, we're gonna download over Pixie. So this is going to do a remote TFTP download of this file. In which case, this is literally the file that is present in this Pixie folder, which is built. So this is literally requesting to download this file from a Pixie server on the network. And then we parse that PE file. Uh, we create. Um, this is a little bit complex, so we won't go into it. Uh, but we do go into that because all of this code has been written on stream. We create a page table. We add uh, map in physical memory to that page table. We then load the PE sections at the addresses that they were requested, and we copy in the bytes from the PE to initialize it. Um, then we allocate a stack and put a stack in there, and then we jump into the kernel. And that's going to transition us into the kernel side of things, where right now we're just playing around uh, with some benchmarking stuff. But currently, this is multi-core. Uh, whatever, whatever, it runs on real hardware. So in this case, if we do this reset, this will boot, bring up all four cores and start executing. Now it looks like that boot time is really slow, but it's actually not. The reason it looks slow is because we're doing this benchmark or we're doing these allocations. But if we just do this, build the kernel, and restart it, this is our boot time. Actually, why is that slow? Oh, because we're... Um, uh, that is slow because we're mapping uh, 64 gigs of physical memory. And what I want to do is, actually, in the bootloader, what we can do is uh, page 4K. What we can actually do is we can, instead of using 4K pages, now we have to do this conditionally, so we're doing this wrong temporarily. But the memory map, the trampoline map, uh, that to bootloader and create those mappings. This memory map here, we can actually use uh, one gig large pages here. If we do one gig, this will dramatically reduce our boot time. And here we go. Oh, panic and bootloader. Oh, uh oh. Um, that's not happy. Why? Oh, because we need to say that these are large pages. So we'll do this. But technically, large pages aren't actually present on all systems. So we will have to make this conditional. I've wanted to do this anyways. Because we're uh, 64 gigs of a memory map is actually way too small. Because I've got some machines here with uh, 500 gigs of RAM. So yeah, there the boot time is instant now. Boop. It just 
it just instantly fucking boots. Like, you, ca you can't even see... Uh, oops, I hit power off on accident. You can't even see the, uh, the boot process here, which is great. That's what I like to see. It's just, just instant. You can't even tell. <laughs> what is a fuzzer? Sorry for a simple question. So a fuzzer is a, a program or tool or whatever that is used to uh, randomly mutate, generate, corrupt, and modify inputs to applications, whether that's a packet, whether that's a file, whether that's a whole network conversation, uh, with, the attempt, with the attempt of causing that application to crash. Uh, so you can effectively think of it as a way of trying to find bugs uh, in applications. More specifically, we're, we use it to find security bugs. So we use this to find ODAs. These are the things that, you know, people talk about, oh, if you, uh, if you find an iOS bug, you can make $2 million by selling that iOS bug, right? That's what we do here. We find security bugs to find bugs that allow us to find exploitable bugs that give us full control of machines or computers or phones or whatever the fuck we're interested in hacking, right? This is, this is hacking stuff, uh, effectively here. Um, so I write a lot of tools to do this. I've been doing this for shit. I've been doing this professionally for, I don't know, like seven years. I've been specialized in like high performance fuzzing for basically that time. Uh, and I would say, I mean, I, it's hard to be humble here, but I would say uh, I'm recognized in the industry as being like a top researcher for fuzzing. Um, I've won a Pony Award. Uh, Pony Award is from the uh, Black Hat Conference, which is, it goes along with DEF CON. It's a really big uh, security conference, and I won a Pony Award last year for most innovative research, uh, which is really cool. And that was for one of the fuzzers that I wrote uh, and I've been working on for a while. So, um, and that is uh, for vectorized emulation, which I don't have a quick link to, but um, uh, vectorized emulation is, uh, I do a couple streams where I actually use this. We wrote a 6502 and risk v emulator uh, using vectorized emulation, but effectively it's a super fast way of running an emulator. So in this case, we generate AVX512 instructions uh, for a Xeon Phi, which is a specialized processor. Um, and it generates these, and it runs 16 VMs in parallel in this old version. The new one runs eight VMs in parallel on each core. So I have a 256 uh, thread uh, Xeon Phi, and I'm running eight VMs uh, per core. So I'm running 2,000 VMs in parallel, and I use that for fuzzing. And I have a bunch of other features. I have a byte level MMU, so that if you go one byte out of bounds or you access uninitialized memory, you'll get a crash. If you go one byte out of bounds, you'll get a crash. Um, so a bunch of cool things in there, and I, I can't remember what kind of performance we were getting for this, to be honest. Um, uh, so the 6502 emulator, I have like a meme video where I kind of talk about it as a joke. Uh, but what was the actual perf? Because I do mention the perf in here. Fuck. Whatever it was, it, it's like it's like terahertz of emulation performance. <laughs> so I use that for uh, fuzzing really, really hard targets uh, and find all, in, all of these nutty bugs. So you're trying to hack a system and you make money when you find a breach. Uh, effectively, that's kind of the standard of pen testing. So let's see, for risk five, do I ever really talk about that? I probably do on my YouTube in a description. I actually, I really need to write a blog about that where I talk about, um, that's uh, analog, this is benchmarking the risk five IL. This will probably show me what I can get here. Uh, let's see. I don't remember if I do optimizations on this at all. You can you can tell I always kind of code in the same way every stream. I think just this early, this start part is actually good enough. So this is the RISC-V emulator. Uh, this is doing 45 billion RISC-V instructions per second. Uh, most of that is bottlenecking on, um, 
most of that's bottlenecking on uh, uh, reads and writes to memory. So in my specific case, uh, this uh, this when you're not doing memory accesses, uh, this emulator is capable of doing uh, two trillion risk five instructions per second. Um, and that translates to, in this case, uh, 6.5 million fuzz cases per second. This is on uh, C tags, which is a common uh, common program used to parse C files to uh, help enlighten Vim and other things for tab completion and uh, like traversal of applications. So it's a relatively small like C parser that we use to fuzz. And we're able to launch, inject an input, run the program, and wait for it to crash or for it to exit or time out uh, 6.5 million times per second. Um, and this is like not even the smallest target. And we're able to gather, co gather coverage and do all these things. Nevertheless, I don't really plan to release vectorized emulation. It's very, very complex. Uh, it requires specialized hardware to run on, and I put a lot of effort into it, so I'm not really open to open sourcing it yet. But I've been writing other tools for a long time. In fact, I think going back to like some of my first videos, uh, which is before I even did streaming or really had a public uh, persona, um, yeah, here five years ago, I kind of talked about a hypervisor that I wrote that allowed me to fuzz... Um, fuzz VMs. In this case, I use it to fuzz some Windows application, whatever, this is printing some like stats or some shit. Um, obviously, I've gotten a little bit better uh, at this over the years. So we've, uh, what I'm doing is I'm writing a whole new Rust kernel from scratch. I have an old Rust kernel that I use for CPU research to find CPU bugs. So if you've heard of uh, Spectre and Meltdown, those big CPU bugs that affected Intel, uh, I'm also a researcher that I spend a lot of time working on those. So I have found uh, multiple CPU bugs. Um, I work a lot with some of the researchers that worked on Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, and I've written proof of concepts for pretty much every single CPU bug that has come out. And I'm kind of the go-to person at Microsoft, where I work, uh, to handle those. So whenever uh, someone reports a bug to Intel, Intel then reports that bug to us so we can write patches. And then I have to write pox for the CPU bugs to then determine the signal, the noise, the impact, all these things. And then we write patches and we try to mitigate these issues. Um, so I have a kernel that uh, I call Sushi Roll, uh, which is all in Rust. It's, uh, I think I have like three or four Rust kernels and it's one of my first Rust kernels. And it's used for super low, low noise introspection into the processor. Um, and that kernel, I actually wrote a blog on that, that actually made it onto like Hackaday or something, or pff, roll, uh, kernel. So I wrote a blog about this and it effectively allows me to plot microarchitecture activity on a cycle by cycle basis. So I can see every single cycle, which is basically the, the smallest amount of time. Remember your, your clock rate and your processor is like you know, three to four gigahertz. So this time scale right here, this is uh, four, uh, 400 cycles is uh, like 400 trillions, of, uh, 400 billionths of a second, right? And I'm able to see every single cycle what happens on the processor. And I think I go into this a little bit more. Yeah, I use this to also uh, use something. I'm kind of talking about the old stuff, but this allows me to... Um, I'm able to plot all memory accesses, so I can use a CPU bug that I found uh, called MLPDS, which I called banana split internally, and I can use this CPU bug to observe every single load that happens on the system and then bin it into time window, so I can see every single access that occurs. So in this diagram, I'm actually showing a page table walk on the physical processor, that you don't write. I didn't write the code to access this memory. This is what the processor is doing internally to do that uh, page walk. So yeah, we do a lot of fun stuff here. <laughs> we do a lot of fun stuff here. So everything we do here is, is incredibly low level. Um, I don't write any JavaScript. I don't make any UIs. Pretty much everything I ever do uh, outputs to a serial or a console and it prints statistics and then maybe it will dump to a file over the network the raw contents of some 
databases that I'll then graph with GNU plot to make these graphs and stuff. Uh, but I typically don't write any interactive software here. I can't even tell you the last time I wrote something that took in keyboard input or mouse input. <laughs> so, uh, what's the role call at Microsoft? I'm technically a security engineer. Um, but my role is kind of abused to do many different things. So I would say that I'm more known as a person than my title. <laughs> there, aren't, there aren't many analogs doing what I'm doing right now. So no bubble cert tutorials here. <laughs> I mean, we can, uh, we can figure that out. We, we could implement bubble sort. <laughs> do you work on Microsoft? Yes, I do. I do bogo bogo sort. <laughs> hey, Meta Construct, good to see you. I'm guessing you're just waking up. Uh, okay. Anyways, so what we were doing is we were just benchmarking our physical memory manager. We made some performance improvements to it. And we found out that our physical memory manager is indeed super fast and super awesome. So, really no surprise there. Uh, so in this case, we're able to we're able to make a four we're able to allocate and free a four gig allocation approximately six times a second, which doesn't sound that fast. But four gigs of memory is a relatively large amount to allocate and free. So, and it should scale, of course. So I think that is done. So we're actually about to commit this up. Um, cargo run. That was just benchmark code, so we can delete it all. Uh, git diff. And here's where I want to go through and make sure I didn't change anything too dramatic. In fact, I am going to undo... You know, we're going to do this change correctly in a second. Uh, we changed those panic handlers. We removed those prints. Uh, as I'm intrinsics in main, we're not actually using core intrinsics on kernel, so we can remove that. Just reduce that down. We do use assembly. Um, assembly, we move that there. We implemented read and writing of CR3s. This is the translation stuff. Oh, I hit I hit end on accident. Okay. Uh, free. That now panics on failure. I'm just checking to make sure I didn't leave any debugging code or testing code in here making sure everything matches what it should. In this case, that looks great. Freeing memory. We do have the writing of CR3 to invalidate page tables, which is good. We relax that restriction. That's the update of the ref counts. Right byte, we made non-pub. Okay. So this should build. Great. Uh, why they need to allocate and uh, free memory rapidly? Um, mainly at this point, uh, the biggest thing is that we are going to be able to, we're going to be creating virtual machines. So we're going to be, uh, running virtual machines that will be potentially doing tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of fuzz cases a second. So the ability to, um, free things, the ability to allocate things very quickly such that we can create, allocate new space in VMs, so on and so forth, uh, we can do very quickly. Um, the performance does not matter that much of this specific code, to be honest, but I do love optimization. Optimization is something that I specialize in, uh, and thus I really do enjoy the allocation, uh, the optimization side of things. So we're going to do a couple things. We're going to pull in the code that identifies CPU features from, uh, uh, Orange Slice, which is another kernel that I have open source. Um, and I'm going to grab the code out of shared CPU, and this will identify CPU features that are present on the current processor. Uh, okay. So this stream is kind of just getting started, so we're going to, uh, we're going to do quite a few things here. Um, mainly we're just doing some polishing up right now. 
And the next feature that we're going to implement is a uh, soft reboot, which will allow us to reboot the kernel and replace it in place without having to reboot the system. Uh, and that'll allow us to run this on bare metal hardware. And we'll move all of our testing from VMs to bare metal hardware at that point. Uh, the machines, the servers that I test this on, uh, take about uh, 30 seconds to post. And I would say it's unacceptable to take 30 seconds to see if something you changed works or not. So we're going to try and get the boot times down to about 20 milliseconds. So at this phase of the stream, that's where we're transitioning into. This is going to be the um, this is going to be the start of soft reboot, and part of that is getting our boot times as fast as humanly possible. Uh, so one of the parts of our boot time that was slow is making that uh, physical memory map. So what we're going to do is we're going to have this use large pages for the physical memory map if large pages are supported. So we're going to go into the uh, CPU library here. This CPU library is shared between the kernel and the bootloader, and this is just used to get different features and access mainly small little assembly snippets. So uh, I'm pulling in the CPU feature structure, a structure uh, representing uh, representing the various uh, CPU features which are supported on this system. These can be detected with the uh, get CPU features uh, function, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So we're going to uh, check that this code is good and make sure that this doesn't do anything incorrect. So this will call CPU ID, which we don't have implemented. Uh, so we're going to grab CPU ID as well. Uh, we'll go up. Here we go. Here's CPU ID. But yeah, that's where we're at right now. 20 millisecond boot time. Yeah, uh, 20 millisecond boot time is what I consider, like, basically, I consider 20 milliseconds to be, like, human noticeable. And thus, I don't want anything to be human noticeable. I want it to appear to a human as instant. Uh, it's really important to me. So here we have CPID, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, returns a tuple of those. Looks great. And we're also going to want to implement fast mem copy. So I'll make a note of that. Fast mem copy. OK. Uh, using rep. So I've got a notebook here where I kind of keep track of uh, what I do and don't want to do. All right. I <laughs> trust in your abilities. Yeah, we'll see. We should be able to do it. Um, what do you eat? Uh, today I ate uh, Indian food. I actually, I didn't have power yesterday, so I lost power. Uh, and I didn't have my generator up and running at the start, so I actually ordered food. So I have some Indian food leftovers. Um, editor, I do have a VimRC macro. It is just the basic. What editor? It is just Vim. Yep. Um, why do you learn Rust? Well, Rust, to me is really the only language right now that should be used for new systems code that's being produced. That that does not require uh, like legacy support, right? A, a legacy environment. Um, I don't think that we as humans should be writing in C and C++. I think we've proven that we cannot do that. Uh, and thus, I don't think we should. So I use Rust myself. First of all, because it's an incredible language, it's much better than C and C++ in terms of speed of development, and in terms of performance, it's identical. So I would rather use a language that's higher level and doesn't have race conditions and has no memory corruption and can never crash uh, or can never um, cause a fault that causes an actual crash. Uh, I'd rather use a language like that. Uh, than a language like C and C++ that allow you to shoot yourself in the foot um, constantly. Uh, I like the syntax. It's understandable. The performance is identical to C and C++. Uh, so to me, putting all of those components together, I would say for my systems level work that I do, uh, it's just exclusively better in effectively every single way compared to C and C++. So that's my view. 
Okay, so here we're gonna get the maximum CPID uh, leaf and the maximum extended CPID leaf. Here we're gonna say if the max CPID is greater than or equal to one, then we will get this uh, CPID one and we'll extract a bunch of different features from it. These are just different flags that are fixed by the processor that tell us uh, if the floating point unit is supported or if uh, page size is uh, enabled or if there's an APIC or if there's SSE or SSE2 support, SSE VMX extensions, AVX, all of this shit, right? Um, this will tell me if there's AVX 512 support. So we'll say uh, detect AVX 512 support. And we're not parsing every bit out of all these fields. And then this is checking for gigabyte pages. Uh, and I think PSE, is PSE the large pages? So gig pages, so we want to map in all of physical memory using gig pages or large pages. So we need to figure out how we identify large pages. Um, and the Wikipedia has actually a pretty good CPID thing. So we'll say PSE, page size extension. And this allows larger than 4K. And in this case, it allows one meg. And I think in 64-bit land, uh, yep, it's two meg. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to run this feature set, uh, get CPU features, to get the, CPUs, uh, the features that are supported by this processor in the bootloader. So we're going to do here, uh, right before we create this linear map of physical memory, let features is equal to this out of CPU. So this is um, get the supported CPU features. And then here we're going to have if features dot, I think I said gbyte pages. Um, if we have gigabyte pages, and this is create the linear linear map of physical memory using the largest page size available on this processor. Okay. And then here we're going to, going to assert that the physical window size, and then here we'll have a const page size is equal to uh, u size. Oh, we can do this. Let page size, eh, we can't really do that. Page size will be a gig here. Assert that the uh, physical window size divided, or mod the page size is equal to zero. Um, kernel fizz window size. Um, kernel fizz window size, uh, not mod page size. Okay. I think that's pretty good. And then here we can step by page size, go through each of the pages, take the physical window base, make a one gig page mapping for that. Else if features.pse, then we're gonna do four uh, or two meg pages. Uh, and we'll say two meg pages. Otherwise, if none of those are supported, uh, so this will be uh, use use one gigabyte pages if supported. Oops, supported. Whoops, and we got an O out there. Oh, we're struggling now. Okay. Use one gig pages. This will be use two megabyte pages if supported. Two meg with the page size bit set, and then this is the final. We'll do the same thing, page size, 4K, and then fall back to good, good old uh, four kilobyte pages. This one, these will be 4K pages, and we won't want to have the page size bit set. Done. So now, this is going to map in, uh-oh. Oh, fuck. Um, we'll say um, max page size. Page size. Yeah, because page size is already a thing. Unfortunately, we're going to just overflow 80 columns here, but that's fine. Um, and I can't really find and replace here because we have a conflict on the naming here. Max page size. Max page size. 
Good thing we had that strongly typed. Otherwise, that would have actually failed in a really interesting manner. Um, and I think in this case, we'll do a U64 and then a, as a U size here. Uh, as you size. This will be a U64. This is the bootloaders doing this. Um, and those step by should be fine. Okay, and we got some issues here. Step by this. Physical address in zero to physical window size. What's going on here? 169, found a U size. Oh, I think that's the only one we didn't update. Okay, apparently not. 174. Uh, physical address. Okay, 172. What's going on here? Oh, I put it on the wrong one. Aha! Wee oui, wee! Oui. Okay, so that's done. So this is now going to map using the largest page size that's available on the system, which will dramatically cut down on the boot times. Um... In fact, are you guys curious at what our boot times are currently? To do that, uh, yeah, we're gonna add a time calibration thing in a second, and we'll 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 go through this as well. Rust doesn't have race conditions, correct? Rust does not have any race conditions. So um, basically, Rust doesn't allow multiple mutable references to the same data at the same time, and thus it's impossible to share things to things, share thing ah. Uh, Share a thing mutably to two different threads or cores or processes, whatever you want to call it. Um, thus, it's impossible to have two things access something at the same time. Now, to be able to share a structure, you share it immutably, but then that immutable structure uh, implements a lock. So in our case, we actually implement a um, we implement something called lock cell, which is a spin lock. So the lock cell contains a type. It holds a type T. Rust is templating. So it holds a type T, and then we allow you to lock this structure and get mutable access to it, mutable access to this structure, but we prevent you from having multiple accesses at runtime based on a runtime lock. In this case, we use a ticket lock, a standard uh, spin lock. What's really cool about lo Rust is that we um, when we lock that structure, we give this lock cell guard, which is kind of a, a holding structure. If you own a lock cell guard, then we can say you can mutably get access to it. So you can mutably get access to the contents. But we don't actually have a way for you to unlock that lock. Uh, there's no dot unlock. There's no explicit unlock. The unlocking of that memory is actually implied by when this lock cell guard goes out of scope. So when it goes out of scope or you, or you have it in a structure and that structure goes out of scope... Whatever it is, when it is no longer possible to access this value, we can now release the lock, and that means we don't have to call acquire spin lock and release spin lock. We can just acquire spin locks wherever the fuck we want, and then it'll provably not release the lock until we have no possible way to ever access that data again. It's really cool. <clears throat> it's really cool. So that's one of the reasons I like Rust is I don't have to free memory ever. I don't have to free memory. I don't have to release locks. I just allocate and do whatever the fuck I want. And Rust will free memory and drop locks uh, when the memory no longer can be accessed again, in which case it is actually free. And that means that it's impossible to have double freeze, use after freeze, freeing in the wrong uh, like lifetimes or scopes or whatever because it's impossible. It's not expressible in the language. It's really nice, man. And since there's no garbage collector or anything like that, it's still intuitive. It's still obvious what is happening and when locks get freed and when locks get created. Um, so to me, as a C developer, as a low-level developer, I feel very comfortable in Rust because I, I understand the ramifications of almost everything that it's doing. So, but yeah. Anyways, that's where we are now. So, uh, okay, that's now going to create 
large pages for the physical memory map, which is great if large pages are supported. It'll use 4K pages if nothing's supported, 1 gig pages if 1 gig is supported, 2 meg if 2 meg is supported, and that will allow the least amount of metadata to be used to create that physical memory map. Awesome. Have a good night. Yeah, see you around, JK. Yeah, I think right now it's kind of the quietest time to be streaming. Um, yeah, because right now is kind of the, the point where... Um, yeah, it's uh, 11 p.m. on West Coast. So some people in the West Coast, some Aussie people, some people who are up really early uh, or really late depending on where they live, but in like three hours, uh, Europe will start waking up and we'll start seeing, uh, we'll start seeing Europe here. Somehow I'm up at 8 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Not gonna lie, it's 6.30 a.m. where I am. Wisco here, hell yeah. I'm from Wisconsin, actually. Hi from Europe, good to see you. So 6.30 a.m., that's gonna be the, I think 6.30 a.m. is the absolute furthest you can possibly be in Europe, so that would put you in the UK or France, I think, right? Minnesota here, man, why, why, why does everyone in the Midwest become a developer? Is it because there's nothing but cornfields and soybeans? Is that why? I turned my mic down just a smidge because I think I was peeking a little bit. Um, my open ear headphones are currently broken. The the cable is like a little bit finicky. So I got to order a new cable for that. And when I have my closed ears on, I actually talk really loud. So I should order, a, I need to order a new cable for those or honestly a whole new pair. Um, I might get a lighter pair. I might get, uh, what do I currently have? Yeah, I currently have the DT770s, which I really like from Bear Dynamics. So yeah. I don't know, having closed ears on kind of fucks it up. And I don't have feedback from my, um, I can't hear my own voice in my headphones, so I just talk really fucking loud. <laughs> it's like it's like talking with uh, earplugs. Okay. Um, so uh, what we want to do is we want to implement the soft reboots. And to do that, we need to add a couple things. Uh, we need to add a couple things on our bootloader in our stage zero. So we're gonna go into bootloader uh, source stage zero. And since there's a bunch of people who are new here, stage zero, this is actually the entry point of this entire operating system, specifically the entry point of the bootloader. But this is like where everything gets started and starts happening. It's really cool. Um, so that's where we come through here. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to actually make a difference between the AP entry. The AP entry is going to be where the um, AP entry is where the um, other cores come online. So the main core is going to come through entry. And we have to do a couple things. So for soft reboot to work, what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to... Um, we want to be able to jump back into the entry point of our bootloader. And we can do that. We can, we can literally jump there. That's no problem. The issue is if we jump back to the entry point here, the data sections, any read writable sections in the bootloader will actually still have the old data in them. So what we need to do is we need to initialize um, all of those sections back to their original states. Um, and to do that, we're potentially going to need to, ah, uh, yeah, how are we going to do this? So first of all, let's, let's get this AP entry. Uh, it'll be basically a copy of this BSP entry. Um, uh, that'll jump into protected mode. You know, we're actually going to use the same entry point, but I think we're going to have a bit that'll tell us if it's like a, a clear boot. So this will be a um, fresh boot, and this will be a uh, fresh boot DB0. Uh, it'll start off at one fresh boot. Or this is a like um, 
uh, reboot. Uh, yeah, we'll call it fresh boot. So fresh boot here. When we get an ESP, when we set up a stack, at this stage, we have a lock. So this locks to make sure that only one core comes up at a time because we can't dynamically create stacks in this early of a phase for the other cores. So we'll say set up a basic stack. And then here, we're going to move into fresh boot uh, a one. So we're going to move a byte into here. Oh, byte zero. Um, set that this is no longer a fresh boot. OK. So this is still going to work because it doesn't change anything. Um, and we can't, we can't even see it boot, man. <laughs> we can't even see it boot. It's just that fucking fast. So I'm going to add a print here. I'm just going to add a, a dummy print of a... Uh, we'll grab a CPU RDTSC, which will have some entropy in it, some non-zero entropy. And we'll be able to use that to see if we rebooted because they'll change. But yeah, it, it just boots so fast we can't even tell. <laughs> so we have to intentionally print some extra stuff. <laughs> Fucking gorgeous, man. Oh, it's just... Oh, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Okay, so we set the fresh boot to zero. Um, but if we don't have a fresh boot, we actually need to reinitialize these uh, data sections. And let's take a look at what the data section contents are in the, um, this is what loads the bootloader. So we need to check out what they contain for each of the sections. So we flatten the, flatten the PE. This is where we create the entry point base address in the image. And let's see what the raw data is. Um, Oh, and we now have uh, read, write, exec. So we just care about write in this case. So let's wait. If, 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 um, write, print. This will print the raw data that needs to be initialized for the writable section. So we'll basically create metadata here uh, under raw in this case. So this will print. Okay, so this is all that needs to be initialized to specific values. Um, so we need to ship this as well as the sections. In this case, we have the X. Uh, this will have the um, base and size. So basically, we'll want to ship the metadata such that the bootloader knows that on a fresh reboot, it will need to reset the memory at C3F0 to this. Congrats on Twitch partnering. We're not quite there yet. Um, but I think uh, I think we're like one stream away. Let's see. Um, Twitch achievements. Yeah, so one more stream and we need, oh, we, yeah, we did cross over an average of 75 years for this month. Unfucking real and we've been averaging like 100 to 150. Uh, this is kind of the, the lull of the night. So I'm hoping that we'll get up to 150 kind of in a couple hours. And then yeah, the next stream, literally the next stream we'll be able to apply for Twitch partner. And apparently they're pretty lenient with, um, they're apparently pretty lenient with educational streams, which is what I would consider we are here. Uh, in which case we will likely get partner this week, it's fucking crazy. We'll have to we'll have to hire someone to make some emotes and make some uh, make some emotes, make some sub badges, and do all that fancy fun stuff. So, I'm super excited. Pixie preboot execution environment, yeah. So Pixie is what's used to like remote boot machines. It's a relatively common technology. Okay, so. Alongside of our flattened PE, we're going to want to ship some metadata of the sections that need to get initialized. Um, and only the writable sections need to get initialized because we don't need to reinitialize the non writable sections. Um, okay, how are we going to do this?
Um, the bootloader has to know where this is. I think I'm gonna create another a data structure, and this is gonna be the vec u8 uh, reinit data. Okay, and we might do a couple implementations of this, so we'll see how this works. But we'll do um, uh, we'll do uh, let me reinit data is equal to vec new. And this will hold um, holds a stream of um, virtual address u32 size u32 uh, data to init. This is expected to be used to reinitialize the uh, writable data sections in the um, writable data sections in the bootloader, such that a soft Reboot can reset the bootloader uh, bootloader state to its initial states. Oh, PE. Uh, sorry. Uh, portable executable in this case. I I refreshed my uh, stream, so I lost all the chat. So I kind of caught a glimpse of it. I'm sorry if I. Uh, explain something that you weren't asking. I just caught a glimpse and I mentioned that when I refreshed. Um, okay, here we're going to write in a reinit data. Uh, extend from slice. We'll do base um, to le bytes. And then this is the raw size. Okay, and then this is reinit here. Uh, reinit, great. Uh, 45. Yep, we'll just do this. Uh, 180. This is the reinit. Uh, 92. Not finding the scope. Uh, reinit data. Mm hmm. Uh, we'll just call it the reinit, to be honest. Holds a stream of virtual address that. Okay, cool. And then here we'll do uh, let base is a u32 and it's equal to base um, try into. Okay. And then size. This will be raw.size. Uh, rod up len. Why did I say size? <laughs> so here we're going to do base 2 le, le bytes, and then this will do the size 2 le bytes, and then re init extend from slice. And here we'll pass in the raw data. So this is uh, four sections which are writable and have and raw.len is greater than zero, and have initialized data from the PE file, we want to record this information so the bootloader, um, so the bootloader can reinitialize itself. Okay, so we get the base and the size is U32s, failably. And then, base and the size here, serialize the base, the size, and then the raw contents that it needs to be initialized to. Okay. Is this like statically linking? In this case, yeah, we are statically linking this. Beautiful comments, love it. I'm so glad. I, I, I love my code. I really do. And I, I'm glad that other people appreciate the care and love that I try to put into my own code. I think that's really nice. Uh, so I think good comments are always useful. Okay, here, this is going to write out the flattened bootloader image, and then this is going to write out the um, bootloader reinit uh, information. And this we're going to call the reinit. And this will be a reinit. Oh, yeah, fits in one line. 
Perfect. So this doesn't do anything yet. This is just on the compile side of things. But now we create, in the build artifacts, we have a chocolate milk re -init. And if we XXD that, um, here is the reinitialize. And it looks like it's 380 hex bytes. That's not too bad. It has a lot of zeros, which sucks. Uh, but I don't think it's really worthwhile compressing it or run length encoding it until we run into size limitations in our bootloader. And we're still pretty far away. So now what we're going to do is in the stage 0, we're going to include ink bin build chocolate milk dot reinit. And we'll make a marker saying this is where the reinit is. And this is the uh, reinit data. And we're going to say holds... Um, virtual address, size, payload, in a, oh, you know, we don't actually know when it ends. I might put in a zero virtual address or a zero size at the end to let it know it's empty. Or I can just mark, because I know the end is here. Um, okay, holds this. Um to allow the bootloader to know which uh, virtual addresses need to be pre-populated with, uh, <laughs> need to be initialized during a uh, fresh boot. And there we can use the same syntax as this, so that if this is set, we know that we'll use the reinit section, in which case we'll write over uh, everything there. So here, okay, now we just need to write a parser for this data structure. And this is fine. As long as we fit in 400, or 512 bytes, we don't actually increase the size of our bootloader due to padding, which is really cool. Can't wait to see this boot nix or something. This will probably never boot nix. Well, oh, you mean like in the hypervisor. So this bootloader isn't meant to be a Linux bootloader, but the hypervisor that is in the kernel will be meant to boot Linux or OpenBSD or Windows or who cares what operating system. So that's going to be the goal there. Okay. Here we're going to say compare byte fresh boot with zero. If it's not equal to zero, then we know that um, uh, not fresh boot, and then here we'll make a label, not fresh boot. Uh, actually, we'll say this. If it's not equal to one, then it's not a fresh boot. At this point, there is a fresh boot. We need to re-initialize our, um, as a fresh boot, we need to re-initialize our uh, uh, writable, write -able data sections. And let's see, is there anything else that matters here? Uh, stack available, that's fine. That one actually will be, that one will be set up correctly. Fresh boot will be set up correctly. So any globals, any data here that we write to, um, we don't write to that. Those ones will be fine. I'm just making sure that we don't have any globals and it doesn't look like we do. So. What's important is that we initialize every single piece of memory that could have been written to back to its original state in the bootloader. Um, and, uh, well, the kernel we don't have to worry about because there's a PE loader in the bootloader that will reinitialize that automatically. So we only need to worry about the bootloader. Nothing in this bootloader can use writable memory that doesn't get reset in this fresh boot. So here, we're going to, um, we're going to move into, oh, we have... We're in 32-bit mode. This is really easy then. We're going to load the address of fresh boot in the EBX. We're going to compare in a loop. Um, we're going to compare EBX with fresh boot end. Uh, not fresh boot. Reinit. Uh, so here we'll uh, load a pointer to the reinit memory uh, into EBX. And then here we will check and if ebx is equal to 
uh, reinit end, then we go to not fresh uh, boot. Um, if we have reached the end of the reinit sections, if we reach the end of the reinit sections, whoops, um, stop the loop. Okay, so at this point, we know that we can get move ECX is going to be equal to um, ECX is the length, which is reinit end plus four. And we're going to make a structure on this. We'll say uh, struct uh, reinit. Oh, I forget the syntax. Um, I forget the structure syntax here. We'll look at uh, bootloader source assembly routines. Okay, struck. We'll say struck reinit struck, and we'll say this has, this contains a virtual address, uh, which is a resd1. We also have a size, which is a resd1. And then we have a payload, uh, which we can just use that marker there. And struck, I think. Okay. So here we have the reinit structure, and this is the um, structure in the reinit uh, that in the reinit uh, vector. Uh, this structure is repeated until reinit end. Beautiful. Okay, 113. This will take. Uh, oh, no colon there. Nice. So that means now up here, we can say uh, we can load from EBX plus reinit struck. Did we say struck or struct? We'll say struck dot virtual address. Uh, this is size. Move into the destination ECX plus reinit struck dot. Um, Uh, virtual address, and then in the source, and we'll go this way. ECX, this is an LEA, reinit struck dot payload. So this is the source, dest, size, rep, moves B. So this is, uh, effectively, this is a mem copy into reinit struck vatter from reinit struck uh, reinit struck payload of reinit struck size. It's effectively what we're doing. And then here we will add EBX, the size of that structure. Um, and I forget how we do that. Um, I can actually do this. Um, so that should just mean offset. And then go to the next entry, uh, payload, add EBX. Uh, actually, we need to do this. Add EBX the size, which is this. Whoa. <coughs> add EBX the size, add EBX. Um, uh, increments reinit pointer by the size of the payload, and then increments reinit pointer by the offset of the payload in the structure. And then here we'll say reinit struck dot payload. And then jump uh, loop to the next entry, and we'll say jump short reinit uh, parse, and we'll say reinit parse. And then this can be a short, this can be a short, that'll reduce some code size a little bit. And this jump can also be a short. Okay, and that, wow. Uh, let's see if this boots. Um, okay, uh, let's see, what's going on here? Reset. Is this triple faulting? 
We're not getting to the print, which means we we did something wrong, just a, a smidge. What kind of chair do you use? What brand and model? Uh, I have a um, Herman Miller Arian chair. chair. And why no webcam? I, I really like having a webcam, to be honest. I think it really helps with content and my expressions and excitement. But there's really no good place to put it during dev because all the screen is used. When I've used webcams before, uh, people have constantly complained, hey, webcam covering, webcam covering, because I forget, because I can't see the webcam. Um, so I kind of forget where the webcam is, and then I have it covering something. So. If I do it really transparent, if I do it like 20% alpha, I think it would work. And I think we'll probably try that out in a stream coming up here soon. But I just don't want to make that change right now. Okay. So, uh, how are we parsing this incorrectly? We have the reunit data here, which is good. And let's XXD that reunit data. And... Whoa, that size is not right. That would explain that. Let's see what we did wrong here. We probably typo a variable here. Um, size, raw length. Oh, uh, that is o as o three seven c. Never mind. And then this is C3, F0. Okay, it is correct. Okay. So that looks good. And then this whole structure should be 3, 7, C, D, 4. So this should be 3, 8, um, 3, 7, C comes 380, 384. Yeah, it is 384. Okay. Okay. Um... So I think that file format is correct. Let's take a look. If it's if fresh boot is not equal to one, then we go here and we set it's no longer a fresh boot. That's fine. We can keep clobbering that. Um, in fact, we can just do that here. Eh, it breaks out to that location. <coughs> EBX. You know, am I relying on any of these values being present? And I don't think so. So we should be fine here. Make the webcam super tiny. Just put one pixel. You can kind of binary see if I am here or not. <laughs> um, I got a, one second, I got a, I ran out of runes on my tibia characters. So while I'm streaming, I'm always training my tibia characters. So I'm just grabbing runes on them. It'll take me about 30 seconds here. But tell me about your day and what you're doing. And who here is a programmer? Who's a professional programmer? Who's a hobbyist? Who's here just to make fun of the nerd who's a programmer? I'm sure there's a bunch of different backgrounds here. And who's, uh, who's a security person versus not? So historically, my streams were mainly for security people. But right now, the content is pretty, uh, pretty just programmer heavy. So I'm sure I have more programmers here than I normally do which is awesome. I love that. Okay. Um, single pixel webcam, light on an ethernet port blinking away. You even fired me to fix my Rust web crawler. I see, that's what I love to hear. That's so cool. I'm working at the moment and I program as a job as a hobby. That sounds awesome. Pro, pro programmer, Russ Noob. Yeah, that sounds, uh, sounds pretty accurate to me. <laughs> I still think I'm a Russ Noob because I don't really use the entirety of the language because I'm always doing bootloader and low-level stuff that I don't get to use the whole language. Your stream caught my eye. I'm a cloud Node.js dev. Interesting. Uh, I don't know anything about cloud or Node.js dev. Uh... But I, I, hope, uh, I hope there's something here for you. I'm a new CS grad. I took an OS course and thought this was interesting. Love to hear that. Uh, how was your OS course? Did you get a lot out of it? I've heard that OS dev courses can be very hit or miss at a lot of schools. Ever consider a dual screen, one channel desktop, one uh, channel cam? 
I've kind of joked about that. If that's something people legitimately would be interested in, I can always set something like that up. I'm a cognitive scientist and amateur programmer working on a second bachelor's. Oh, wow. That is awesome. Are you enjoying it? What's your second bachelor's in? I'm guessing your first is in cognitive scientists and your second one, maybe you're working on uh, computer science? Navision developer full time. Uh, just watching low on development uh, since I never got much into it. Awesome. You don't have higher level side projects? <laughs> no. I, I, <laughs> I genuinely really don't. I really don't. Oh, man, I remember my OS class. It sucked. <laughs> Did it suck because the teacher or the content was bad? Or was it difficult? Or were the assignments bad? What aspects were bad? Um, I'm presenting my master's thesis in like 30 hours. Holy shit, man. Good luck. Good luck. Uh, computer science. Awesome. Uh, my OS class was dope. I'm glad to hear. Uh, my OS uh, course is quite basic. We programmed OS basics in TypeScript. Uh, so it ran in a browser. What the fuck? What? what? <laughs> so that's, you don't get all the excitement of not having any way of debugging. OS dev is not OS dev unless you can uh, not be able to debug it. <laughs> <laughs> my OS class sucked because I had to teach myself and there were no good resources that ex resources that explained everything in one place. That sounds pretty accurate. OS dev is very difficult to get into. People are very strongly opinionated and it's pretty hard to get resources that are the truth in a lot of OS dev things. Um, I found myself to going mainly to manuals, but learning to read the Intel manuals is a, a project in itself. Uh, the teacher was quite literally trying to make the syllabus on day one, and it just went downhill from there. I still have the project on my GitHub, uh, Adamant Cheese slash Frit OS. Oh, that sounds pretty cool. Um, that's wild. We got to make an OS in C that use some virtual layer. Weird to set up. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited for my OS class. Uh, they've started to teach Rust in the curriculum. Ho, 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 ho! It's happening! <laughs> uh, we wrote Linux kernel modules at Purdue for your uh, OS stuff. Did you do like virtual memory stuff? How did that work? Mine was awesome. A bootloader and a non-preemptive kernel. Then a preemptive kernel, virtual memory, file system, and a shell. That sounds like a wonderful cu curriculum. Um, why are motherboards so limited still? What do you mean by that? Oh, like the emulator sort of stuff? That is it. My teacher was virtual box. Mass production limitations. <laughs> my laugh. I, yeah, I, 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 have, I have different laughs, depending on context. Oh, it's a piece of shit. Not a real OS at all. Written in C sharp, of all things. I remember that if you try to compile something with a generic generic, uh, like a set of sets of integers, the compiler would completely shit itself. Interesting. So that compiled C sharp to like raw binary code that would execute on the processor. Was that like a custom uh, C sharp compiler or is that a mode that's handled by certain ones? I guess you can probably like force compilers to output the um, native stuff. They have started to replace all the C++ stuff with Python and Rust. Wow. Uh, example, OS running in a browser. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, is this... This is... Uh, is this 6502? No, this is, uh, this is a custom... Yeah, this is a, uh, a custom uh, model. So it looks very similar to 6502 with an accumulator and X and Y. Uh, but they don't have the other flags. Unless this is 6502 and it just doesn't um, doesn't show the other flags. It is 6502. Okay. Pretty neat. Yeah, so it says 6502 emulator and you do the dev in there. A reduced set? Okay. Yeah, I think I've heard about uh, things doing that. Risk v is actually a great way to do OS dev now. Risk v was actually developed for teaching students about pro uh, 
about computers. That's why RISC-V exists. Because it was mainly meant to be like a really reduced set uh, to teach students about um, architectures. Okay, compare with reunit end. If it's equal to reunit end, then jump to here. Otherwise, get the address of the payload as the source, get the address of the, the virtual address as the destination, get the size, and do the copy. So if I get rid of this, right, this is how I debug. If I get rid of this, does this work now? Wait a minute. Is this? Okay, well, that means that there's a bug somewhere else. So I'm just gonna say jump unconditionally here and we're gonna see if this runs. And that does. So this loop is not ending, um, which means these sizes don't add up with this structure, this payload, potentially. Let's, uh, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna change this to add eight because I know that's the size just in case that's breaking something. Okay, that's not working. Huh. Oh, ECX, holy shit, this whole time. No one pointed that out. <laughs> it's EBX. Wow. Okay. Um. Reunit struct dot payload undefined. What? Oh, R. Oof. Okay, this should now work, right? Yeah. And that's causing that code to get executed. So this is correctly reinitializing. If I ch oh, it's not actually. Now it is. So this will see if it if it doesn't boot, then we're copying the wrong stuff and it works and then in this case we will do a um i'm gonna move the source to zero and that's gonna be incorrect um oops semi that's gonna be incorrect and we'll see if this uh catastrophically fails in the bootloader and it looks like it does okay so that gives me confidence that that's actually working because the other case caused it to get corrupted okay here we go I'm currently researching FPGA implementations of RISC-V right now. Oh, yeah. Which, uh, which RISC-V are you implementing? 32, 64? Um, are you doing extensions where you have like divs and moles? I love that RISC-V you can implement without divs and moles. And we did that when we wrote an emulator on stream. RISC-V is sick. Yeah, it is. I want to do a tiny FPGA implementation sometime. Yeah, that would be really fun meta. Um, last thing I remember about the OS was implementing inodes so we could swap memory to disk. Oh, that's really cool. So you had like full, um, you would have had, uh, I guess having swap is relatively sophisticated because you need the ability to run out of memory and then swap things out to disk to reclaim things if needed. Um, really, really cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> jump out, talking about weird, crazy things again. Do you work out of Seattle? Yes, I do. So I work from home most days. Well, everything's been on lockdown recently, of course. Um, but I work from home most days, mainly because I'm just too lazy to drive into work. I'm in the area. Awesome. Hell yeah. How do you like it in this area? Have you always been here or did he move here recently? Okay. So what I'm gonna do is now I have to implement, uh, how much space do we have in this? Uh, we're gonna implement. Okay, so we are basically ready to do a soft reboot. As long as we set fresh boot to one and jump back to the um, entry point of the bootloader, we should be able to do a soft reboot. Um, and so to test that, here's what I'm gonna do. 
Um, we need to pass in a routine. So I need to implement a routine here, and this is going to be, um, we're going to call this soft reboot. And this is going to be a 64-bit routine, and we'll jump to this location when the kernel is done, and then time six, um, okay, sweet. So soft reboot, this is going to um, entry point for a soft reboot. When a soft reboot is requested, it is expected. Uh, it is expected that the kernel has uh, in it all other processors on the system, and the kernel has set the uh, fresh boot byte back to one. The kernel must also uh, disable any devices which may be performing DMA. At this stage, we transition back from long mode into real mode and jump uh, right into the uh, bootloader entry. Okay, so this is 64-bit code right now. And what we're going to do is we have to initialize everything back such that we can transition into 16-bit uh, mode, which is a relatively complex uh, transition here. Um, I'm in an assembly course right now, and I, I've learned to love assembly. Yeah, assembly's pretty awesome. Oh, I'm not actively doing it. Uh, merely to see that's capable. I'd love to actually do it at some point in the future. Um, I'm super interested in the draft vector extensions. Oh, yeah. I do a lot of vector work. I'm kind of constantly working with that. Full-time work from home is unbeatable. Yeah. I mean, it means that I work way too much, but it doesn't matter. Um, working too much just means I don't care about vacations or holidays. I just never, I never consider myself to ever go on a vacation or a holiday. Even if I literally leave for seven days, I don't really worry about it because I know I work those hours anyways. So it means I literally never use vacation time. <laughs> Um, cause I, I probably, I probably easily work 70 hours plus a week, um, just out of habit. So I, I really don't care. Uh, it also means like right now I'm, I'm streaming during the work day. I haven't done any real work today, but I don't really care. And second of all, I actually consider this work. So you can disappear for a few days and it doesn't matter. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and I intentionally do not allow myself to get any power. I don't work on other teams. I don't have anyone relying on me. Um, and I do that very intentionally um, because I don't, I don't want to run a team. I don't want to uh, be part of a larger team because I want to be able to dip out and not, not matter if I'm gone. Uh, I don't like all the IPC that's required. Okay, so in a soft reboot, we want to reset all of the registers, I think. Um, uh, let's do, uh, XOR racks, racks, move, ra uh, RBX racks. Uh, so here, what we're going to do is, um, uh, s we're going to clear all GPRs. This will cause the high parts of registers to become zero, uh, which might help with some weird transitional issues when going uh, back to 30, uh, back to 16-bit mode. So I don't think this is required, but I'm gonna just do it anyways. Uh, we're gonna move. Oh, uh, EBX EAX. Honestly, I can just XOR all of these together. Um, and this is just all the registers, EBX, ECX, EDX, ESP, EBP, EDI, ESI, I like these being before, EX, EX, EBX, ECX, EDX, EDI, ESI, ESP, EBP, XOR, E, um, R, 8, D, uh, nine and nine, and then we'll do 10, 
And then this one. Uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. And that should be... That'll clear out all GPRs. Okay. So, EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, EDI, ESI, ESP, EVP, R8, R9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So, I don't think this is necessary because I don't think you can get those top bits. But it's something that's kind of always confused me. Thanks for the stream. Hopefully, when I'm back, you'll be a partner. Hell yeah. I think we will be. I don't know how long it takes for that to occur. Managing people is hard. Yeah, I ran a team for about six months last year, uh, and I just can't do it, man. I can't. I'm just terrible at, at, at running a team. It's difficult. I think I'm too controlling. I don't let go of, uh, of power, and I want to do everything myself. <laughs> so I don't give people good tasking. They get upset. They get frustrated. Um, and I recognize that I'm not good at it, so I took myself out of that role. Um, so we had a bunch of people on the team and they did, they did, they did love working for me. So people, people had their complaints, but people did ultimately enjoy it. So I didn't hurt. I didn't really set anyone back. Um, it's really scary to me though. Um, could have no one talk to you about your task for 11 months. Is that from a personal experience? That sounds oddly specific. So now we're gonna uh, drop back into real mode, and this is relatively difficult. Um, going back into real mode is not trivial, so I need to actually figure out how this is done. Better have a good manager who is a weak programmer than a weak manager who is a good programmer, absolutely. Management is its own career and its own track and its own skill. Uh, and just because you're good at what you're managing, the technical task of what you're managing, does not mean you're good at actually managing people. Uh, you have to be able to let people know when they're fucking up. You have to let people know when they're doing things well. Um, you have to give good criticism and feedback to people, and it's extremely difficult. So what are we going to do here? Um... Getting back into real mode, uh, I don't know if we can just go directly into it, but maybe we can. Uh, we're gonna disable uh, disable paging, and long mode. So we basically wanna do the opposite. Wow, what is this? Eloidi, holy shit, I haven't heard this in a long time. Um. We're just closing some things up while we're working on this. We're going to take a look at uh, bootloader source assembly routines. This is jumping into 64-bit uh, mode, and we just want to basically go the opposite direction. So what we want to do is we want to disable at the same time. Um, I'm pretty sure I can disable paging. Uh, and I don't like this bit being transposed here. In fact, there we go. Now they're in order. Um, disable paging in long mode. Uh, disable paging and uh, we just want to disable paging. But is that going to crash? I think I need to transition into um, protected mode. I don't think you can go directly from 16-bit to 64-bit, but I don't think you can go directly from 16-bit uh, from 64-bit to 16-bit. We have to be able to disable paging. We have to disable protected mode. Oh, we can do it. Uh, we can load our real mode GDT, I'm pretty sure. Let's do this. Uh, I'm still thinking of how to manage my 32 core systems without race conditions. Or 256 cores. How does one sweep the cores? I mean, you can just use Rust and you don't have to worry about it. That's the real, that's the real play. Um... Using all the cores should be fine. Are you if you're if you're writing a kernel, that becomes our problem. But if you're just using like userland, Linux or whatever, it's relatively easy. Uh, you can just use the existing mutexes provided by the OS and stuff. So this is uh, 
RO code uh, limit that. And I'm actually gonna grab, yeah, that's a 9A. 16-bit uh, read-only code, limit that, base zero. Okay. So I should be able to, yeah, I should be able to load a GDT. So we'll uh, uh, load a 16-bit GDT. So we'll LGDT, RMGDT. And then um, we're still in 64-bit mode. It's really fucking weird. So now we're going to... Uh, um, load the selectors. This is where it might crash. Uh, we have to move, Zor X, uh, move AX8. Load the data selectors. Um... I might have to go into 32-bit mode. So let's see. Um, I'm going to add a CLI halt, and we'll get this information passed up. So we need to let the kernel know where the soft reboot code is. So to do that, we'll push a D word uh, soft reboot. That'll give us the address of the soft reboot routine. That'll allow the bootloader to get access to that. So we'll go into bootloader source main. Um, so we'll have soft reboot. Reboot entry is a U size. And then we can place that into a, um, in the boot args. We'll say a uh, soft reboot adder. This will be a lock cell new zero. Uh, we'll say none, might as well. And then the soft reboot address um, here we'll say boot args dot soft reboot adder dot lock. Um, uh, here we'll st store information about about the soft uh, reboot address, and then here we'll get the uh, SRA, and we'll say if sum uh, if SRA is none SRA DREF is equal to some soft reboot done now we'll go into shared boot args source lib.rs and then we'll do a soft reboot adder pub this will be a lock cell U64 uh, address of the soft reboot. Um, address of the soft reboot entry point. Okay, and then we also want to store the trampoline. Oh, we have the trampoline page table. Fantastic. So we store information about the soft reboot address. Uh, this is as U64. Soft reboot entry. Okay, 39. Um, oh, that's an option. Okay, and then 71. That needs to be mute. Um, no, I mean in one kernel. If I could afford a 32-core system, do some crazy stuff for network development, you always have the craziest ideas. <laughs> you always do math stuff. Uh, are you familiar with uh, Microsoft Project uh, Research Project Drawbridge? Um, I think I've heard about it, but I don't know what it is. Just curious uh, if you think it's feasible, because it would be so nice to have uh, for VDI environments. Yeah, I don't know. What is it? Uh, what's, what's the public knowledge about it? Um, okay, so this should work. It's not going to do anything, but we have that information, which means on the kernel side of things, we can now uh, transition back into that. So we bring up all the cores, and then here, all the cores come online, and then we'll say unsafe 
Uh, here we're going to reset all the cores. And this might actually cause the cores not come up. Yeah, so the cores don't come up because we actually init them uh, prior to them coming up. So if core uh, if core ID is zero, if the core ID is zero, then we'll do this shit. Okay. So then, once we have init everything, so that's going to reset all of the other processors. Um, and that causes them to not actually boot up, which is fine. Because um, we brace. We, we, we reset the processors prior to them actually booting. And now what we're going to do is let's uh, soft reboot is equal to uh, core boot arg soft reboot adder unwrap. Uh, print soft reboot at this, and it should be something. It's going to be really close to 7C00. And let's see if it is. Um, 55. Oops. Um, oh, under adder. Um, and we got to lock that. Unwrap. Okay, so this should be close to 7C range. Why? Core ID is zero online. Why are we not hitting that print? What? Um, Prince Wu. Whoa. Oh, it's because another core, uh, we got to wait for all the cores to come up. If we don't wait for the other cores, they might have a lock and we might deadlock on this soft reboot address. Wow, yeah, that's a really interesting race, but it is it is possible that we have a race there. So I'm going to have this print here temporarily. Um, we would never actually reset uh, until that state, but this does look good. So we have the woo. The woo is basically acting as a delay, so the other cores come up, which is it's really hacky, but it works. Um, we'll, this is just testing out the API that we're going to use. Um, so what I need to do is I need to now transition to having a new CR3. How are you, Gamosa? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Um, I think the soft reboot is going to take one argument, which is going to be the um, let trampoline, right? I have to get out of this current mode. So trampoline CR3 is equal to uh, boot args trampoline page table lock unwrap. Uh, oops, core. Get access to that. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Oh, I think I already read that, didn't I? How much would you guess this project has left? I mean, it's it's uh it, this project has no end, so uh, this this project will never finish. It'll only just get more features and get better, but it will never have a definitive end. The end will be when I rewrite it with a new version. <laughs> um. Uh, as ref, that's gonna get the physical address of the trampoline. And then what I want to do is I want to jump into that. I want to call that. Uh, let soft reboot is going to be equal to um, soft reboot, which is a, an address. Oh, and I'm going to say that's a fizz adder because I can. OK, fizz adder, great. Uh, fizz adder. Uh, here, this is now a fizz adder, physical address. 
Okay. Great. Oh, we don't have we don't have fizz adder in here. Oh, okay. Uh, fizz adder. And let's make sure that's repper seed. Um, shared page table source. Uh, fizz adder. It is repper seed. Okay. And then here, we gotta pull that in. Pull in fizz adder. Great. Soft reboot at that. Um, oh yeah, and then here we're going to convert that physical address into a function pointer. Uh, this is going to be an as a, uh, we're going to take a reference to this and we're going to cast that into a mutable uh, function pointer and then we're going to deref that and that'll give us a real function pointer. And then we should be able to call soft reboot. Uh, that's going to crash. Which is fine, but uh, cannot cast a U sixty a ref U sixty four. Yeah, this is a, a const uh, U sixty four. This can be const. So we're making a function pointer, and this will this will reboot in a loop. Perfect. Uh, so this address actually needs to be in the. Um, this needs to be in physical memory, so we need to add the base to it. So we're gonna do um, let uh, the virtual address of this is going to be kernel fizz window size plus soft uh, reboot dot zero, not fizz size. Uh, kernel fizz window base computes the virtual address of the um, the virtual address of the uh, soft reboot entry points based on the physical address. So this will take the virtual address, a reference to the virtual address. Now this one, I'll put a semi. Um, and this is boot args. Once again, this is just proving uh, proof of concept. We're going to polish and rewrite this code once we have this working. Okay, that is triple faulting, which is interesting. Let's, uh, let's just do a CLI halt here and see if we're getting execution at soft reboot, because we should be able to. Okay, so that is not triple faulting. So we are now executing this code. If I do a uh, CLI halt here, this will not fail. Perfect. And then this RMGDT will fail because that's a, that's a page fault because we're still using the kernel's page table. So what we need to do is we need to supply it the trampoline page table, which is going to be uh, trampoline CR3. And this will take a U64 argument. Um, we can say a fizz adder. Um, const extern function. Okay, so this is going to call into this external function and pass it a physical address of the trampoline CR3. And this will cause us to get execution on the other side. And then what we can do is we can load that CR3. So uh, load the CR3 argument, which should be the trampoline CR3, which has both an identity map and a uh, linear map for the kernel, which is the content. Uh, uh, we're currently we're currently running in the kernel virtual memory space. This does not have physical memory directly mapped. Thus, we must switch to the uh, trampoline CR3. Uh, provided 
and that's gonna be move our uh, into CR3. We're gonna load RCX, which is the first argument, and that's gonna load a new page table, and then this should. Okay, that's still resetting. Interesting. This should not be resetting. Okay, uh, that means loading the real mode GDT is failing. I might actually need to have the long, uh, uh, all of the different uh, things present in the loaded. Hmm, I gotta manage my Tibby character. Wait. Soft reboot at that. And then that's rebooting in a loop. And then eventually it loses that race condition on the print. Uh, and then it deadlocks. So, but yeah, it's definitely triple faulting. And why would that be the case? That would happen if, well, I made a lot of runes here. Okay, this. Six. Okay. Would be cool to see the bootloader stuff and basic kernel features. Yeah, we're, we're basically already there. Um, oh yeah, to follow it from the start, okay. Yeah, so I have VODs up on my YouTube uh, here, which will kind of go into, uh, so YouTube right now is being very slow at processing videos. Actually, let me see if the other ones I can upload at this point. YouTube is like still processing some of these videos and I, I it's out of my control, right? I That's not something I can change other than not using 1080p60, but I'm going to do that because it's best. Um, yeah, so I effectively have, um, so this one's still private because this, the other part, the first part of the early kernel is still pending. I, I, it's just slow, man. I, I have no control in this. So I'm waiting for these to come out and then these will go out. So this is the first one, second VOD and the third VOD. Uh, and this one's just missing because for some reason, this is the one that just YouTube hasn't processed yet. And if I'm not mistaken, this one, one of these doesn't have HD still. This one? This one still hasn't been processed HD. So, and it's been, I uploaded this about two days ago now. Usually it takes like four hours for YouTube to process it and it's been like 40 plus hours. It's out of my control, <laughs> sorry. But you can watch all of the VODs on Twitch. Uh, the VODs on Twitch are immediately up. So you can always watch the VODs on Twitch. Um, and then eventually Twitch deletes them after like 60 days in which case the YouTube VODs will definitely be processed by that point. Okay, so this is faulting because uh, loading the ARM GDT is failing and the only reason that really would fail is if, um, let me see if I can access memory at uh, zero. I'm gonna DRF zero and that should succeed. And it does. That means loading that GDT is failing. So it's not letting me load that GDT. Uh, I need to transition. I think I need to load the um, protected mode GDT. Load a 32-bit GDT. Um, what did I break? What did I break? Arm GDT, PM GDT. Oh, that makes sense. That can potentially move. We're gonna put these tables here, which is at a fixed location. Oh, PM under GDT. Well, that's why. Anyways, helps that we do this anyways. 
So we can load a protected mode GDT, but we can't load a real mode GDT. Correct. Okay. So we're going to go load a 32-bit GDT. Um, and then this will, will transition into 32-bit mode. Um, this will be uh, down to protected mode. And we'll do a jump uh, 8, which is the protected mode. This is the um, null descriptor. 32-bit uh, code, 32-bit data. Okay. So we'll load at hex 10 uh, down to protected mode. And that should switch us. Oh, we can't do the long jump in this case. Um, there's no long jumps in 64-bit. So we'll have to do an IRET queue. We'll have to push all these and do an IRET queue. Do you use the arrow keys to move in instant mode? Yes, I do. I use arrow keys and page up, page down. It's a less travel for my hand. Uh, it's easier to home on those keys than the other keys as well. Okay. We're going to... So we have to do an IRET to do a long jump. And the IRET frame, uh, let me see if I have one just in case. I don't want to get this wrong. In that case, we've already set up. Um, so an IRET frame is a uh, push. Flags, RSP, SS, RIP, CS, I think. Let's, uh, let's just reference that so we don't fuck that one up. That would be bad. Um, we're going to see here's the stack frame in 64-bit mode. Uh, oh, we did have it wrong. And which way do I have to go? Push, 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 push is what I need to do. Oh, actually, is it this order? I push SS first. And can I do this? Um, this is going to be what's loaded. So this is SS push quad word um so that's the stack selector then rsp this is uh rsp it doesn't matter we zeroed it out then we push the r flags um and r flags we don't have so we'll do uh um oh yeah we can do a push fq here so this is r flags and then we can push quad word OX010, and this is the CS. And then we push a quad word RIP, which is down to protected mode. And an IRET Q. That should hopefully work. Fuck. Um, 32-bit mode. We have to disable paging. But I don't think I can disable paging. Fuck. Do I have to set up a fake temporary table? I think I do. Um, so here, let me just try uh, disabling uh, CLI halt. So we load up a 32-bit GDT. That's fine. OK, let me see if I can. I'm going to load up ES with AX, move AX, OX, O, 8. Let's see if I can load up that. 
I can. Uh, ES, DS, FS, GS, SS. So that'll load up all the data sections. Uh, oh, now that's failing. Interesting. Soft reboot at that. Why can I load ES? I can't load a data segment, a 32-bit data segment. No, I can. ES, DS, FS, GS. Maybe it's the stack segment, but I'm not using the stack, so that shouldn't matter. But let's see. Yep, it's the move SS. Huh, okay, so you won't do that. And now, can I do a write to zero? We're gonna write a D word to zero. So we're gonna see if we can actually use the DS. And we can. Huh. Cool. So we've set all of these selectors to be, um, wow. Really? So this is not working. We push all of those. I have to go, can I do, is it failing because of that stack? Cause we're setting up the stack selector. Nope. Yeah, because we have to disable paging now. And I can't disable paging. I think I can. I think I can. Um... Move rex uh, EAX00. And then to disable paging, where is paging at? Uh, bootloader source assembly routines. Uh, paging enable. That is at bit 31. So we will and EAX with the inverse of one shift 31. Move CR0 EAX. This is going to disable paging, and we're going to see if that works. Now we have paging disabled. Uh, 131. I guess these have to be racks. Uh, and here we'll say EAX. Okay. <gasps> we disabled paging. Disable paging. Okay, so now we're not using paging. Now can we do this? Did that reboot? Oh, it's stuck. Oh, we hit pause. Oh, we hit pause, fuck. All right, let's see if this is working. I like it. We broke it. All right, we'll see if this is triple faulting. Wow, that's... KVM is not happy about that. What's your preferred coding beverage? Uh, I'm not too picky. Okay, so this now works, right? Yep. 
So yeah, disabling paging doesn't work here yet. Uh, but I'm drinking wine right now. Other than wine, I drink basically vodka tonics. Those are like the only two drinks I really drink. Um, load a 32-bit GDT. Fuck. The CR3 is fine. We now have access to physical memory. I then, to go from long mode to 32-bit mode, I have to disable paging. But I can't disable paging while in 64-bit mode. So I, ha I have to transition to 32-bit mode. And to do that, I need to load up a CS from a... All right, let's 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 check this. We're going to do this. 64 bit uh 64 bit present. We can use one one table to rule them all. present data rw. So, this is 0 8 10 18. So we got 18 hex. So we'll load up a 64-bit stack and then go to 16-bit code. <laughs> Rip. Um, CLI halt. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, that works. Move SS AX. This one's going to triple fault. It'll reboot. Okay. Now let's load up. Move AX OX 018. We're going to see if this works. Wow, we cannot set the stack segment. Why not? Can we load a zero? I can load a zero into it. Uh-huh. Okay, so does that mean I can load a zero here? RSP will be zero. Push FQ, R flags. Oh, maybe we have these in the wrong order. Yeah, let's, ch I probably have them in the wrong order, don't I? Um, orange slice. Bootloader, source, assembly routines, IRET, Q, SSRSP, SSRSP, R flags, R flags, CSRIP. What? Maybe I have to use a long jump, but I can't? I can't do this, but that would be ideal, right, if I could do that. So um, what I can do is I can have a, um, structure not supported in 64-bit. Yeah, I can do a, um, the jump that I can do, I can do an M1632. But I don't know how I tell it that it's that. Uh, but that'll jump to a 1632. So let's say this is going to be like the um, J point. This is the jump point. We're going to have a DW0, which is the... And then a DD. Actually, we can do a DQ down to protected mode and then here we can do a jump far dref j point and that's a dot okay let's see what we got okay that's failing let's jump to 64 bit code which is at 18 hex we're going to see if we can jump what 
Maybe it's the other way around. I saw a video yesterday about Valorant's anti-cheat. Forces you to give access to level zero kernel. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All the anti-cheats require that now. Anti-cheat... Anti-cheats are basically malware. Um, they will... Uh, scrape all of your window titles, they'll scrape where your mouse is, they'll scrape your keyboard inputs, and they'll send that all up to their server. Um, oh, and it eventually succeeded. What the fuck? Unless it's supposed to be this, DD. It is that way. No. How the fuck do I do a far, how do I tell it which far jump to do? Given an M1664, that's... Reset. Oh, it's only AMD that supports the long jump, but you can... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do a pointer 1632, but you can do the long jump based in memory. Okay, so this is the, um, yep, this is the CS. Oops, that's the RIP, and this is the CS. And now we're going to jump. Let's see if we can now jump to 8. Please, 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 please. Oh, we did it. Riot Games is uh, owned by Tencent Conspiracy. I mean, I I don't know. I think it's unlikely that these like cheat developers are using it maliciously, but they could. They could. It doesn't mean it it doesn't mean that they are, but it means they could. Um starts running when your computer starts. It's always running. Yes, it is. It, it, it's yeah. Look up the Sony Ridkit DRM lawsuits. Yeah. Um it's really, it's really fucked up, man. But it's the only way that you can do anti-cheat, really. Okay. So in this case, we're going to load a 32-bit GDT, jump to 32-bit mode. And that'll jump to... Now we don't need these at all. Now we're going to jump to 32-bit mode. Now that we're in 32-bit mode, um, we're going to... Uh, yeah, disable paging. Um, we're going to move uh, EAXCR0. Wait, didn't I have that code? Nah, we'll rewrite it. Uh, and EAX with not one shift 31, move CR0 EAX. Let's see if this works. That'll disable paging. Beautiful, we did. Okay. And this is a 64-bit... Um, uh, long jump, uh, far jump, uh, 64-bit far jump. We're going to load a 32-bit GDT. We zeroed everything. We switched to that CR3. We're going to jump far to DREF J point, which will load up down to protected mode, which will then disable paging, which has succeeded. And now that paging is disabled, uh, all we have to do is, um... Honestly, we can do this. Uh, and we're going to CF, CF, 9A, FFFF, FFFF. This is 16 bit present code. And this is 16 bit present data RW. And this is GDT base. And this is, this is just our GDT. This will just be GDT, GDT base, and we can have all the GDTs in one nice GDT. Saves us just a smidgen of space. Um, GDT base. Okay. PM GDT. This will be GDT. RM GDT, uh, PM GDT, that's GDT. And then those entries are the same as the, okay. So here we load up the selectors and we want to actually load up 20, right? 
Let's take a look. Uh, 0, 8, 10, 18, 20. Yep, so load up the data selectors there. And then we're going to, here we long jump into PM entry. This will jump into 18-bit code by loading that. Uh, 0, 018. 0, 020. Uh, 0, 008. So that's going to be 18. And here we can just say, we'll just do this. Just for clarity. OXO uh, 0010. OXO 018. OXO 20. So CS. Yep, that's the 32 bit code. This should work. Okay, it does. Now we're gonna make six 64 bit entries as well. Oh yeah. Now we're thinking with portals. Um YYPP. This is 29A. 0092. Oh oh. This is a 64 bit present. 64-bit present. This is code. This is at 28. This is at 30. Okay, so now we have a way to switch to all the different modes from any context. And that means these no longer have this. GDT. We no longer have to switch these GDTs around. Section data. Enter 64. Okay. Uh, don't have to do that. Arm GDT. L GDT. Um. I don't think I need to do that. EAX. Load that. Move DS. Okay, for the for uh load the G. Okay, there. Um. And this will say load data segment, uh from. From GDT. Yeah. Honestly, do I need to do that? No, I don't. For GDT. Because we reset them all here. Okay, LGDT. Okay, fixed. That now builds. This will not work at all. This is really broken. Holy shit, how did that work? How the fuck did that work? How the fuck did that work? Invoke real mode. Set all the selectors to the data segments. Yep, we're gonna switch to 16-bit RW. Uh, disable protected mode, clear all the segments. Here we set CS. Okay. I write W, that calls it. And then saving all the shit. Enable protected mode. Set all the segments back to data segments. I feel like that's keeping us in 16-bit mode. Oh, we gotta we gotta clean all. Okay, I was about to say there's no way this works. Cargo run clean. Cargo run. Oh, cargo run clean. Cargo run. There we go. Yeah, so that's failing. Good, 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 good. Because it shouldn't work. Yeah, nice. Okay, so set all the segments back. Uh, set set all the segments to data segments. This will be at 18. Uh, nope, that's 20. And then this will be 18. So 18 will be 32-bit code. 
And then this will be a pixie call. This will set it to 16 bit. We'll switch to 16 bit here. And then here we're going to set this to 20 and this to 18. Pop 80 ret. Okay, then here we're going to jump into long mode, which is at 28 for the code section, uh, code selector, and then 30 for the 64 bit selector for data. And this probably will work now. Let's see what we got here. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, let's see where that's getting. Uh, reset. Uh-oh. Um, chocolate milk bootloader starting. Yeah. Something's still broken. We were loading up DS. We nuked that. Um, okay, I'm gonna put a save off all. I'm gonna CLI halt here. We're gonna see if this, uh, see what we get here. Graphical reset. Wow. Really? Wait, which one was that? This is invoke real mode. Uh, CLI halt. Let's see if we're even getting to this stage. Okay, that works. Um, so we'll protect mode. Okay, so this is a CLI halt. See if this works. Okay, we do get there. Here we do an IRET W. Push all that shit. CLI halt here. Oh yeah, I didn't I, I didn't rebuild it um, from the previous this. We basically have to see where it stops working. Okay, so that's having a problem. We know that that is fine. Let's see if we get here. Ah. Uh. Reset. Wow. So the problem is here. But why? GDT base. Why would that... Hmm. 10. Data RW. Let's see if we get here. Let's see if we can set the data selectors. We can. So the problem is when we jump foot minus program base. Oh yeah, because we were using yeah 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 um uh I think what I might do is I might compute this base. The the issue is this program base is not it's not jumping to the right code. Um I think what I need to do is effectively this. Uh well I need to jump to 16 bit with that base already set. Uh, to do that,
program base. Um, I need to make a code selector with the base set, the program base set. Uh, you know what? I could probably do that. I could, uh, does this have assume CS? NASM assume CS. I think there's a way to, assume CS, I can tell it what it is. Um, NASM uh, data, uh, NASM docs. Okay. Okay. Um, assume. Doesn't assume. Okay. Um, not keep track of what values you choose to put in your segment registers. Never automatically generate a segment override prefix. Yep. I know that. How do I tell it what the CS base is? Oh, I can say org. Um, program base. I'll be right back. I'm going to hit that. Okay, so this stuff gets pretty wacky. Um, this assumes that it's based at program base, and uh, we're gonna change that. Uh, program base, the whole concept of this is gonna go away. We'll still say it's at program base, uh, but it no longer will take an argument. This will now be a fixed thing. That's gonna be the base. Uh, foot minus program base. Foot minus program base. The address of that minus the base. Yeah. So currently, we development we develop this in a model where CS is set to um, where CS is set to zero. But what we want to do is have CS be at uh, C00. Zero zero. So we're going to do origin 0. So we're going to say this file originates at 0. This is this is going to like catastrophically fail. Uh, perfect. Okay, so what I want to do is we'll put the CLI halt here. Um, cargo run clean, cargo run. And then when we load CS, so this is not going to work. Perfect. Uh, so we're going to load CS with 
Um, in this case, hmm, hmm. I have a pop tart here, so if you hear me eating, eating a pop tart, um. So it's weird here because PM entry has to be the actual address. Fucking weird, man. We'll do this. Okay. So that gets there. What we need to do is when we go into real mode, Because we never we never load this, um, uh, base OX seventy zero zero in this case base zero base zero base zero base zero base zero, and I need to figure out what bits I put the base at, and I know I had that code in here, so I'm just gonna undo to find it. Um. And it's at uh, shift by 16. Okay. So we're going to do a... Um, um, okay. There it is. Now the base is 7C00 for the code uh, selector. That succeeds. Great. Now this will pass, which we never have gotten passed yet. Beautiful. Beautiful. No problems. Okay, so this should... This should halt, and that should have been a full successful boot. And it was. Okay. So we have transformed all of this code to now. Um, GDT. Nothing uses the GDT here. We use this same GDT for everything. And this will allow us to kind of hop between modes at any stage of boot, which will be fantastic. So then here, uh, this is where we're currently halting. We're going to disable paging. Um, disable paging. And can I go, can I go directly into 16-bit mode? And I don't think so. If I did a, uh, if I went to 8, I think this is going to die very catastrophically. But we'll see. Um, let's just do this. It's the last time we have to do clean. Okay, so that's failing. Uh, so we're going to go into... Um, oh, we don't need the LGDT at all. We do a 64-bit far jump. You know, I might be able to do this without having it... Um, pass in that page table and let's see currently it needs that page table but I'm gonna not set up this page table this is going to fail in a loop beautiful now what I can do here is I can actually have this be rip relative while I'm in 64-bit mode I can use rip rel and this now should work uh, jump far rip rel that um uh oh let's see move cr3 rcx jump far j point okay so this one works and then i should be able to do this rip rel Perfect. Now, what I have to do is I'm going to move 
into rel j point and this will be j point dot i think you can do nested stuff like this um rip and then this is cs 123 uh j point dot rip and i'm gonna move lea rbx um I'm gonna load the relative address of down to protected mode. And then we're gonna store that. So let's see, this should be zero. This is RIP, CS. So we're gonna do rip rel. Okay, we can't do that. So we'll just do at J point. Damn, I wish I could do infinitely nested like that. Okay, oops, and this should be, rip should be zero. So this will load up relative that rip and then this should succeed. Um, oh. Um. That jumps there, and then we disable paging, and then paging is disabled. But then isn't EIP in some fucked location? No, it's not. Wait, it is. We're getting lucky here that this is working. We do have to load that CR3. When we jump here, RIP has to be valid. Okay. Um, jump, J point. Now we've disabled paging. And now we can load up the 32-bit selectors. Um, load the 16-bit uh, selectors. And then in this case, we'll do a move AX, OX, 16-bit uh, data. Oh, you know what? We don't even care about that shit, do we? Up here? We reinitialize all of that. Oh, we have to load the 16-bit ones. Never mind. But the base won't matter. Okay. Now we're going to load AX, 0008, uh, 0010. Uh, move ES, AX, DS, FS, GS, SS. So this will be DS, FS, GS, SS. Load the 16-bit selectors. And then we will disable, um, disable protected mode. Um, oh, that's not going to work yet. Oh, I mean, that's technically going to succeed, but we're still in 32-bit code. Um, Dalright, thank you so much for the raid. Hell yeah. How was your stream? What were you up to? <laughs> what on earth is all of this? We're at a, um, we're working on a, uh, bootloader soft reboot. This is going to allow us to um, reset our kernel in place. So we'll be able to reboot by jumping to the entry point of our kernel, which will allow us to um, reset everything very, very quickly. Working on a next generation firewall in Python. Oh, that sounds awesome. Just over here trying to stay cute. Hell yeah. That's what's up. Uh, oops. Um, cargo run. Disable protected mode. And before I do that, we're going to uh, switch to a 16-bit code selector. And to do this, we'll do it down to real mode. And this is bit thir uh, 16. And this will do a jump OX. 
Okay. We're going to jump to 008 down to real mode. So that's going to jump us back to real mode, and then we can disable protected mode. <laughs> um, and then at that point, everything's set up. We should, be, we should have 16-bit for all of our data segments. Oop, that's failing. Why is that failing? Um... Let's see what we got here. It doesn't like loading this selector. Let's try uh, CLI Halt here. Let's see if this one works. Okay, I think this one's working. So the problem is loading this code selector, and why is that the case? Um... To jump down, I do that here, right? I jump down to, uh, I load up all of those, and then I load up the 16-bit, and then I disable protected mode. So why would that fail? Oh, oh, because this is a, a minus a 7C00. Uh-huh. Disable protected mode. Done. Nice. We're not getting new numbers. Oh! Uh, and this is uh, set up that we're in a fresh boot. Move byte fresh boot is one. Jump entry. Um, and then I need to add like a larger delay or I need to not bring up cores here And this shit We're gonna we're gonna turn off bringing up other cores temporarily Just because there's a race condition there and uh, it's Just a little fucked right now Yeah, buddy Yeah, buddy, I think that's working So basically what we'll see is that this won't actually be rebooting. We won't see this screen flicker. It's not, but it's still rebooting. Hell yeah! Soft reboots. Fuck yeah. Okay, that was easy as fuck, man. Um, stage zero. We're gonna go into here. Bootloader. We're gonna get rid of this uh, screen clearing just so we have like a little bit more spew. Yeah. So that's how quickly we can we can reboot our kernel now. <laughs> Woo! Every single one of those is a reboot. We did it. Celebrate with another pop chart. How long does that take? We can measure by these two. Uh, Python, this. God damn it. Copy, paste, minus. Uh, the prior one. Copy, paste. Uh, delta is equal to this. And then we can print delta divided by the clock rate of the processor, which is 3200, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this, this many seconds. Um, wait, was that that many? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Hmm, it's quite slow. Looks like it's taken about 30 milliseconds to reboot. Keep in mind, we're downloading that file over the network, I think, every time we boot. Um, let's, uh, we're going to shift this over to here, and we're going to see. Unpause. Yeah, so, like, we're downloading a file through a Python server, right? But, yeah, so it takes, I mean, here we have the prints, right? We can see the difference between these uh, loads. It's, it's like 27 milliseconds to download over the network and boot. <laughs>
Is there any motivation to keep that in memory? No, because the point of the soft reboot is that we can replace the kernel. Uh, so check this out. Uh, so in this case, the bootloader, the bootloader does not get replaced, right? The bootloader stays, but the kernel, we're going to move this here. And so that kernel is just booting in a loop. And then here we're going to say, uh, that's the bootloader. Here's the kernel and we can print, uh, woo, how are you? And then we'll, uh, build it. And this might run into like a sync issue. There we go. And we have a new kernel running. So <laughs> we're able to switch kernels dynamically. <laughs> Isn't that fucking cool? And there's a race condition there where the Python script might fail, but anyways, yeah, so that's a whole new kernel, boot it up, and replacing it. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> um, good thing network is heavily IO bound, yeah. This is so awesome, hell yeah it is. So I do this in almost all my stuff. Oh, so now we can run this on physical hardware. Um, so let's, uh, let's get this stand page. Oops. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna reset this, uh, physical server. And then we'll be able to see, um, we'll be able to see the same thing on real hardware. So I just hit the reset button. I just hit reset. <laughs> so the server is now resetting. So let me get a... You know, I might do this again. I don't know if it resets again. We might wait for it to come up, but I might stopwatch this and see how long it takes uh, for this to boot. But <laughs> it's a while <laughs> to boot this server, right? Now, the IPMI, or the... um. The Pixie implementation in the VM is going to be much faster. This is probably going to take like a second per boot, would be my guess. Um, because the Pixie on this system is going to be much slower. And the latencies are going to be worse on the, on the uh, UDP accesses. So yeah, it's a little bit slower. This is on physical real hardware that had 30 seconds to boot. Now, what I can do is I can change this, right? I can change the message, add some ASDFs, build it. And now on real hardware, we're running a new kernel. Instantly. <laughs> Isn't that fucking cool? <laughs> Rapid prototyping on real hardware? Instantaneous? Hell yeah. <laughs> Magic. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> so that's why we do this stuff. And there we go. We got rid of the message. And that's on hardware. So that means we can now rapidly prototype and do rapid dev on physical hardware, which means we're probably about to be done with the VMs. Um, let's see. Where did that go? And that is um, panic and bootloader. Oh, uh, okay. So let's see. It seems like it's eventually failing. So let's see what we got here. Um, what? Part one. Oh, huh. We killed Pi Pixie. That's why. Yeah, panic and bootloader. It failed to download. It timed out. Okay. I was about to say, holy shit. So it's bottlenecking on PyPixie. I don't know what PyPixie is not freeing as a handle, but it's not. So. Hell yeah. Be right back.
I thought you caught a race condition where the kernel file was not completely written yet. That's definitely a real thing that we can see as well. Um, in this case, we died again. Oh, this one. Uh, there's actually no reason for that one to have failed. Huh. So it's kind of hard to say why that failed. And I think what I'll do is I'll add some more prints to, uh, I'll add a couple more prints to the bootloader. Be useful to have anyways. So, um, so I'll print, uh, <laughs> and we're actually going to lose some boot time due to literally printing. Like at this point, the boot time is like below the cost of doing these serial prints. It's pretty fucking cool. Uh, here we'll do boot args dot serial dot lock dot as ref dot unwrap dot write b about to download kernel. I know that looks awful. Uh, as mute. Okay, so at least it reproduces. And then what I'm guessing is that PyPixie maybe starts being fussy and this will be um, a downloaded kernel, exclamation point, put some new lines on this shit so it doesn't look awful, done. Okay, here we go. So we'll see where this fails. Could you get away with format in the panic handler? We had that before. Um, it just, it's so sensitive to what you have for panics and eventually you'll run out of uh, space just due to the format code being so large and exploding so much. So. At this point, we've disabled anything that uses format. So all of the panic handling stuff that returns a format, we just ignore it, which will cause that code to get DCE'd, which will cause all the format code from the whole bootloader to get deleted. Um, we just have to be careful to fit within our limits. We're at 61% utilization. If we added a single print format macro, even if it's just like a string and an int, we'll go to like 95% utilization. And then if we add some assert in some random library that the bootloader relies on with a complex format string, we'll easily exceed the limitation. It's just because the format code is so templated, it just produces so much. Okay, so it looks like we're failing. Um, about to download kernel. And then this fails. And I'm guessing it's on this expect. Sweet. Panic and bootloader. Okay. So what we're going to do is we might re-download it. So we'll say if... Um, we'll do this. Uh, let kernel is equal to loop. Uh, if let sum x... Uh, P, we'll say pe is equal to this or we'll say kern, kernel is equal to this, if sum, then uh, break kern. Otherwise, uh, that's at the end. Here we'll say, um, here we'll say, uh, boop. Uh, f uh, kernel download failed, retrying. Okay. And a semicolon. So uh, we'll download that, and then if it fails, then we will print that we failed to download the kernel, and we'll retry, and then we'll print download kernel when we get to that. So we can get rid of this. Okay. And I'm pretty sure we wrote that whole pixie stack in a way that if the download fails, it will it'll be fine. It won't uh, panic. I don't think. Aren't those expects kind of useless since you can't get a message? Yes, they are. <laughs> I'm just, 
If anything, I will probably still keep them just for the code uh, clarification of like what what happened that I'm not happy about. Never heard of Pixie, but it seems uh, yeah, I'm working on a bootloader. Um, and Pixie is a protocol that is used, uh, technically it's like a specification, to use TFTP to download a kernel over the network, or a, a bootloader over the network, or a small 32K file over the network can execute it. Uh, this is what allows you to boot things without any disks or whatever. Um, so we use this to boot our OS, everything's booted over the network. It, the Pixie, the like, the option ROM or whatever is on hardware, or the BIOS itself, uh, will download. Oh, here we go. Come on, come on. Don't panic. Don't panic. It's got a long timeout. Retrying. Nice. Now I don't know why. I don't know why it's failing though. Unless I'm running out of memory. If I'm, how would I be running out of memory? Um, Pixie provides a full network stack. It just provides like a TFTP stack and that's all I need to download ne the next stage. Okay. So anyways, that did fail, and it's trying again, and it's not hitting the network. I think it's running out of memory. And the reason that could potentially be happening is if this stuff's not getting initialized. But it should. Fresh boot. Move fresh boot one. Let me jump to the entry. And this, I feel like, I feel like that memory is not getting initialized correctly then. Um, because our, our memory utilization is, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to print our size. But yeah, it seems like, it seems as if that is not getting, uh, oops. It seems as if that's not getting reset. So, um, God, how am I gonna print a decimal number? Uh, I'm going to do, um, uh, I can't actually do an allocation. I should have the format macro, technically. Um, it's kind of gross, but I, I do have format. Yeah, uh, I do. As <laughs> bytes. So we'll use format, and this will be um, detected memory, and then we'll store, oh, fuck. Uh, let memory is equal to boot args dot free memory dot lock as ref on wrap dot len, I think, size. SP shared, uh, this is in range set, source, and then FN entries, delete, insert, remove, subtract, sum. Ah, the sum. Sum of that, detected memory this, and we'll do memory. Okay. That fits in one line. Just barely. And then this we can do a uh, unwrap on this. So that'll print, and let's see if we get less memory. No, it's still the same amount of memory. Hmm. 
Okay. I bet it's a bug in the pixie stack. I, uh, yeah. I bet it's a bug in the pixie stack. I bet eventually it'll run out of space. Like, for some reason the pixie stack will, has some number that'll overflow and then the network will die. There's a write macro? Yeah, but I don't have an object that I'm writing to. I don't implement uh, write on serial, I don't think. This is just for temporary hacking. But yeah, I could impl write on serial. And then that's dead. I don't think this is my fault. I really don't. I think this is a pixie bug. I bet that's a specific amount of iterations. Can you print the number of boots? Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, I just have a value I don't reset, so this will be the um, number of boots. Uh, uh, such that we can track the number of boots, uh, including soft uh, reboots. This value is not reset uh, upon a soft reboot and thus persists. Okay, boots. This will be a. Uh, I don't know. Might as well make that a, a quad or a quad word. We'll mark this a line eight. And then here. Uh. We might have to make this a. Uh, no, we can we can do a quad. We just have to do the math ourselves. So at this point, if if it's not fresh boot, okay, it's a fresh boot. So here we're going to uh, add. What was the name of that? Num boots boots boots. Add boots. D word boots. One ADC D word boots plus four zero. So this is a uh, accumulate a sixty four bit number of boots. So that'll be a sixty four bit add, right? We're adding one to the bottom part, and then we'll add the carry flag to the next part. Add quad word, but in 32-bit mode. Yep. Exactly. Okay, so then we can pass this as an argument. Uh, I think I can push quad word boots. No, I can't. Okay. Um, push d word uh, boots plus zero for... Yeah, the low part, then the high part. Okay. And then here, I'll have a uh, bootloader. And this is uh, num boots u64. And then I can print that here. Boots. Uh, I think I said num boots. Okay, so, and then let's do a uh, CPU halt, just to make sure it's one for the first iteration. And there we go, it's one, great. Uh, and we'll say boots that. Okay, I think that works. <laughs> All right, do you think this is gonna be on a specific number of boots? Like something that's very base two, like like eight one ninety two or sixty four or six five five three six. I don't think it'd be six five five three six. It 
if it's an overflow, there's a good chance. That's what I expect. I expect it to be a very specific value because I think it's going to be an overflow, which would likely happen around a mod 2 boundary. 32k. I don't think it runs for that long. I think it's like 2k. Feels like it normally fails about this time. Maybe 4k. Okay, we're booking it. We're booking it. Oh, who fucking knows what that is? All right. Um. So I think we're going to reset. I think there is an API method that's like reset the uh, Pixie state. And we're just going to do that in the Pixie API. Uh, and let's see if this reproduces, 2386. So I'm going to write this number down so I don't lose it. 2386. And we'll see if it reproduces on the same number. Hopefully it does, because uh, that would allow us to know if we got past that point that we fixed this issue, if that makes sense. There's unload stack, get cached info, restart TFTP. So we should be able to just call restart TFTP. Um, far pointer to a restart TFTP structure. <laughs> well, it doesn't define one. Look at this fucking manual. This, this, is, this is the final revision from 1999, restart TFTP. And the structure that they give is the read file structure. God damn it. <laughs> what does Pixie send over the network, the kernel file? Yes. It's the PE file, the actual raw PE bytes. Uh oh. Hey, 2387. Okay, it's off by one. It's off by one, but like, hey, I think that's outside of my control. I think the Pixie stack is like using up some resources, but now we can say if we get to like 3,000, it's probably safe to say that we fix this issue. So we have to do a reset. Now the problem with doing a reset is I have no idea what you do. Oh, it's identical. It's, I oh, it's identical to the TFTP open. Uh, download a new NVP. Wait. This will literally reset the processor. Okay. Like, this will literally download and jump. Control is placed to there. Okay. Well, that's not going to, that's not going to cut it. Uh, TFTP open, close. We do call close, and we check the result on it. Um, reset adapter. Resets and reinitializes the network adapter with the same set of parameters supplied to the initialized routine. Unlike initialize, calls this call opens the... Uh, Opens the adapter that is. Nice logically to the network. Now we're not using undy. So I don't know if that'll do it for us. Oh, we're actually we're actually using iPixie. So we actually have the source to this. In hardware, you don't have the source to this stuff. Um, stop base, start base. The BC will make the calls to undy as needed to implement an IP stack and whatever. Undy must be started first. 
Yeah, we gotta clean. We gotta clean up our undies here. <sighs> Get cached info. It's not that. Unload base code stack. It's not that. Okay. So I think I think we're gonna try. It's not restart. Uh, there is start and stop on D. On D startup. On D cleanup. On D initialize. I feel like I've had to do this before. Um, resets the adapter and programs it with the default parameters. And this takes the protocol I and I. Uh, it can be null. OK. So there's initialize. And then there's this. Set this before calling it. MAC addresses in the buffer. The fuck? So this is to. Multicast address count, multicast address. List up to that of the multi. Uh, I guess this is to reprogram for using multicast. Um, clear stats, force interrupt, get nick type. Interface info, get state, ISR. OK. So I think the spec says that you use undy underneath whatever. And I, I think that's probably what's failing. Unload the base code. That's to unload it. This is early on the initialize. That's the post. And then this is shutting everything down. ROM scan, ROM ID, allocate base memory, verify the structure, provide an ISR if we want one, but we don't. Do transmit and receives. Call these. ROM scan, verify that, allocate base memory. Verify the structure. Start on the initial startup, initialize, get information. So we're not using that. Since we're just using the TFTP stuff, I don't know. Um. Ugh. I don't really know what we can do here other than maybe doing an undy reset adapter. Calls re this call resets and init real initializes in the network adapter with the same set of parameters supplied to the initialized routine. Unlike initialize it call this call opens the adapter that is. This call opens the adapter that is. That is what? <laughs> that is what? <laughs> that is. It connects logically to the network. Is it the oh Oh, the adapter that is connected logically to the network. I would assume that's probably what this is supposed to say. I'm guessing for multicast, we can just set everything to zeros. So, <laughs> nice wording for a spec. Great. <laughs> yeah, welcome to OS Dev. The specs are always fucking trash. All right, so we're going to try and reset the undies clean them out nice and good. So look at bootloader uh, pixie, source pixie. Um, dude, what is this fucking DDR music going on in my ears right now? I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it. 
get the act pack. Ooh. I wonder if this will get fucked. If this cached info will get fucked when I reset the thing. Well, we'll see. YOLO. This is going to be, uh, uh, reset the, uh, adapter. Uh, and this is reset adapt, adapter. It's number four. We have a status, a buffer of U16s and MAC adders. Where's the length field again? The MCAST address count? Where, where exactly? Oh, it's here. Oh, that's that structure. Okay, okay. That makes sense. And then a MAC adder. Okay. <laughs> Why does Camosa listen to RAM music? I say DDR like the, the dance stuff. I'm sure you got that and you're just making a joke. But if anyone didn't get it, uh, DDR like the game, like the fast-paced um, dancing arcade game. Uh, and this we're going to call undy reset. This will give it a, a count. Mcast count. Um. Wait. Mcast buff. Oh, it's a structure of those. Well, thanks. Set before calling up. Okay. So I don't think that's a pointer to it. That. It doesn't look like a pointer, so I think we are fine with just this, and then mcast adder, and this will be a list of u86s, I would suppose, uh, which is a MAC address. I would, I would guess a MAC address is six bytes, but it might not be. Let's double check. Oh, never mind. A MAC address is 16 bytes. <laughs> okay, so we got the 16 byte MAC addresses and then max MC adder, which is a an 8. Whew. Uh, create the reset request. Status MCAST adder uh, MCAST count MCAST adder O O U uh, O sixteen eight. All right, y'all. What are your thoughts? Do you think this is gonna? Do you think this API will work? Do you think this API will fail? Or so do you think this API will fail to work even at all? Do you think this API will succeed but not fix the problem? Or do you think this will succeed and fix the problem? Pixie call. EP seg. EP off. Taking bets. Fail in all regards. All right, we see. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so it um Do I need a multicast address? I don't think so. Unless I needed to get unless I needed to give it like a default multicast address, but I think we just killed it. Mm-hmm. What did I win? I called it. Uh, you get a um, you get a, a pog champ. There you go. <laughs> uh, 
Um, God damn it. So do we just... Do we... Okay, let's let's try this on hardware. Uh, okay, so we're going to get rid of this code because it doesn't work. I mean, the code works, but then it breaks the nick. All right, let's let's uh, stay on page. Ah! And we'll reboot the physical hardware. And then we'll see where the physical hardware fails. All right, where do you think the physical hardware will fail? Or do you think it will fail? So this is on a real network card with a different, completely different Pixie implementation. So I think we might just say, I guess, I guess we can only soft reboot 2,386 times. And when you reboot more than that, you'll eventually have to physically reboot your machine. I think it's unlikely that I'm going to be doing 2,386 reboots before actually physically resetting the machine. Uh, keep in mind, this, this soft reboot is not going to happen like this, right? The soft reboot won't be done in a loop. It'll be done based on uh, input over the serial port. So we'll basically tell it, hey, I would like a reboot, please. Okay. Oh, that's so nice, though. Carbald gifted a tier one of oh for the you won you won <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much <laughs> Thanks to both of y'all We have no emotes yet <laughs> So en enjoy your useless sub <laughs> Um are you running iPixie on bare metal as well? No, this is just what is ever on this uh, Intel NIC that I'm running. Uh, actually, I don't even know if it's an Intel NIC. No emotes, no emotes yet. I don't. I think we have emote slots. I just need. I need to hire someone to design them. Oop! 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 Uh, let's see. We're gonna see that failure print. I just want to keep my eyes on this, but the Pixie server might have died. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put money on the pixie server died .com. Um but I don't want to click away in case it goes again. Well, yeah. Okay, so that failed. So it looks like I pixie timeout. Oh, yep, here we go. Spin that back up. Now it might take a second because it'll have to time out. Yes, it resumes. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Easy. Okay, so the Pixie server died, but it then came back up and started going again. Fucking great. Okay, so that means that the loop stuff actually works. Um, and the amount of physical memory is not changing, which is great. That means that uh, we're resetting everything, redetecting everything from the BIOS. Beautiful. Okay. And then this one fails. I, you know, whatever. Do you think this one will fail? We'll just keep this running forever, I guess, in the background. Um, okay. Memory. Don't need that print. Downloaded kernel. I'll probably just do this. Kernel download failed. Uh, print. And then num boots here. We'll just ignore that for now. Okay. Um. Oh. <laughs> okay. So bootloader starting. Print the core online. That's in the kernel. Soft reboot at that. Okay. Fan fucking tastic. Uh, and then I gotta fix up a comment here. 
So I think I said in soft reboot that you provide fresh boot. Okay. Uh, when a soft, it is expected that the kernel has init all other processors on the system. Um, the kernel must also disable any devices which may be performing DMA uh, or interrupts that it set up since the bootloader uh, gave it execution. At this stage, we can transition back from long mode into real mode and jump right into the bootloader entry. Okay. Beautiful. Because we actually, we set that bit ourselves. Uh, we set fresh boot here. Set up that we're in a fresh boot and then uh, jump to entry. So fresh boot will only be used once. And then this has died again. Okay, great. And then this should pick up again on the server side. And this one picked up as well. Fucking awesome. Awesome. And then it probably died again. Yep, it did. <laughs> Top quality code. <laughs> Can we use a better Pixie server? This one seems broke. What do you... What? Where, what exactly would you say is broken about this Pixie server? I think it works great. <laughs> Sub that we're in a fresh boot, jump to the entry point. And then we jump back, and then we execute everything from the entry point. How <laughs> hard is it to serve a file over? I mean, how hard is it to leak a file descriptor in Python is the real question. You kind of got to go out of your way to do that. <laughs> Wild Pixie. Five Pixie. Oh, God damn it. Then do the following. Setting up uh, Pixie servers actually kind of sucks, to be honest. Oh, it's dead, isn't it? Nope. Oh, we have it paused. Oh, and now it's dead. Uh, we're going to turn that server off. Okay. <laughs> we'll restart the server, <laughs> and we're fine. Okay, uh, get diff. Cleaned up all that shit. Um, nice. Looks good. Let's, uh, here... We're gonna do a uh, pub unsafe fn soft reboot, um, and this will uh, replace the kernel and re-download. Uh, uh, this is going to init all processors, uh, shut down the kernel, download a new kernel, and uh, boot into and boot into into it without resetting the actual CPU. Okay, so we'll init all the processors, which we'll do here. We'll init, boop, boop, init. Um, this will init the other processors, and that we should do in like a loop or something. We'll polish that up in a minute. And then soft reboot, in this case, we'll just do this shit. Paste. Um, oops. Don't stop. Okay, this fits in one line. Um, get access to the... Get access to the soft reboot uh, address as well as the uh, trampoline page table. Okay. Compute the virtual address of the soft reboot entry point based on the physical address. Great. Then here, convert the soft reboot uh, virtual address into a function pointer that takes one fizz adder argument, which is the uh, trampoline CR3. And this will do uh, perform the soft reboot. Okay. Cargo run clean, cargo run, git commit am added, uh, or made, uh, made page, made virtual 
freeze significantly faster. Uh, added soft reboot API. Git push. Oh, um, and this code's dead. And we'll bring on the other cores. Okay, cargo run. And this will be fine. Great, okay. Um, get rid of this, core online. Uh, get commit am removed dead code, git push. Okay. How did we speed up virtual freeze? Uh, that was what we did at the start of the stream. Stream. Scream. Ah! Uh, we dramatically changed the way that those worked in uh, pay, uh, shared page table source lib. Um, so freeze now. Before, every time we would free a page, we would see if the page table that the page is present in has all zero entries. So every time we freed a single page, we would then read the entire page, so 512 64-bit reads to see if all of them are present. And what we did is the page tables actually have like 12 to 14 bits of metadata that you can use, or bits that are not reserved for use by the, the processor itself. Um, so we abuse that, and we store some bits in there that's the reference count of the number of active mappings in each level of the page table, and that allows us to just decrement the ref count or if we're about to decrement it to zero, then we can free the table. So we basically added ref counting on, the, on each level of the page tables such that we could see if we perform a free, if we release this one table, was that the last table? And if it was the last table, uh, we can actually free the table itself and unmap that and go to the next level. So that's what we implemented earlier, and that code works. It was a pretty significant speed up. If I'm not mistaken, it was like a four or five times speed up. Um, uh, something in that ballpark. And now we're basically at parity uh, with any virtual memory allocator that you'll find. So we are actually a little bit faster than Linux because we don't have to initialize the memory. If I'm not mistaken, we're like 60% faster or something than Linux, uh, which is fair because they're initializing the memory to zero. Um, actually, I think we're faster than that. We're like 4x faster than Linux. Uh, I think we are basically linearly faster with cores than Linux. <laughs> so the more cores you have, or the more parallel page table operations you're performing, we're that much faster. So on a 256 core system, we are likely 256 times faster than Linux's virtual memory allocator. Because they bottleneck on uh, initializing the memory on the memory buses. Okay, so we need to implement interrupts, I think. Um, we need to implement interrupts such that I can have an interrupt on serial port uh, when I write to the serial port. So I want to be able to receive data because I need an interrupt. I want to be able to hit a key on my keyboard and it will reset this machine. It will do the soft reboot. And to do that... Um, we need to have interrupts. So to create interrupts, we need to load an interrupt descriptor table, and then we need to make a bunch of thunks where the interrupts can land uh, and execute. Um, so I think that's what we're gonna do. This is kind of the second part of soft reboot. We implemented the logic of soft reboot, which is not difficult at all, but now we need to add support for performing the soft reboot. So we need to have like a key or something that we can press that will then cause the interrupt to come through, which would then cause the soft reboot, reboot to get called. Um, so to do that, we're going to need to make, um, yeah, we're gonna need to make uh, IDTs, interrupt descriptor tables, and for each processor on the system, um, yeah, so we gotta set those up. Um, we also need to set up a task uh, structure because I wanna be able to handle double faults. Actually, we'll skip that for now, uh, but we might need to set up a task uh, the task register because that's, the or the TSS. Um, 
that allows us to that will allow us to set up a new stack on a double fault. So in the case of a stack exhaustion bug, we would not panic uh, brutally. So like right now, if I did stack exhaustion, if I did fm foo, and then foo. Now Rust might not let me do this. Okay. This will panic, and we'll do it on the BSP only. Uh, this will triple fault, I think. Um, should. You know what? Rust is maybe being smart about that. A, uh, A plus 5. A is a U64. In this case, we'll pass an A. Uh, 50. And we'll see. Okay, that's still getting optimized out. Uh, we're going to return a U64, which is A. Actually, we'll just re return foo. This will return A. Okay, we'll do this. Nah, the compiler's getting smart. Damn it. Um, I think the whole call's getting optimized out, so this might prevent that. Let's see if this does it. Oops. And reset. Fuck. Okay, um, loop, uh, here, we'll just do this, as I'm outsmarted, yep, okay, um, to call, uh, we'll just push racks, jump to B. On safe. Okay, here we go. Hey! Okay. So what we want is we actually want this to not fail like this. Um, we want to be able to handle exceptions. We want to have an exception handler, and we also want an interrupt handler for real interrupts, which we're only going to have for, like, the serial port. They're going to be very limited. Um, but... Let's see here. We might have to do a timer interrupt as well. I might literally do everything on a timer interrupt and not do a serial interrupt. Um, and the reason for that is uh, all of the locks, well, I need to avoid deadlocks. So what I'll probably do is in the um, lock cell, I'll probably implement like a try lock and if it's, if, if we failed to, like, get the lock, can I do that? I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can do a try lock with my ticket lock. We could switch to a different type of lock instead of a ticket lock. Uh, but I need the ability to attempt to grab the lock. And if I fail to get it on the first attempt, return a failure. Um, and that'll allow me to, so we're going to potentially have recursion. Uh, and the way that we designed our core locals is there, it, everything does have to be locked, which is great. Uh, so basically I want the ability to print in the exception handler, but what if the exception happens while the print lock is held? Well, if the, ex with, if the exception happens while the print lock is held, I'm either going to deadlock when I try and get the print lock, or I need a fallible way that I could say, like, okay, I wanted to print something and I can't. Um, I guess at that point, you're kind of fucked. Um, I can actually implement a shatter lock. I think I might do that. So I think what I might do is I might un unlocks uh, kernel uh, source or SP shared lock cell source, what I'll probably do is 
if I'm trying to print to the screen during an exception, or if I'm trying to get a lock during an exception or an interrupt, uh, actually just during an exception. So exceptions are gonna be fatal. So what I think I'm gonna do, uh, exceptions will uh, effectively turn into a panic, but what I might do is have it such that uh, I might implement an unsafe, uh, or I'll have a try lock, and then I'll probably have a shatter lock. And the shatter will basically permanently disable the lock. It'll basically bypass the lock, and that'll be an unsafe function. Um, so basically I'll have a shatter, which will give a lock cell guard to the internal cell, but I'll make that unsafe. And if I make sure that in the exception, so I have this fatal exception on my core, I cannot print to the screen, I want to, but something has that lock. What I can do is I can init all other cores, so basically reset all other CPUs on the system except my own. At that point, I know that my own CPU is going to be fatal, and I can shatter the lock and basically uh, ignore it. <laughs> and actually get access to the serial port again. And in this case, it would actually be okay. Um, in this case, it would actually be okay because it's, it's safe to break that lock on the serial driver. Actually, I could just recreate a serial driver. I think that would probably be the play. Um, yeah, I think if I can't get the lock on the serial driver, I'd probably kill all other processors that guarantees I have exclusive access to the serial port, and then I'll just create a new serial port driver, and that'll reinitialize everything. That way I don't have to worry about things being in a broken state. What if other stuff is happening on other cores? They're just gone. They lose. Sorry. And, that, and that's why I would recreate a serial driver, just in case it has the serial port in some like un, uninitialized, partially initialized state. F in chat for the course. Um, but does that make sense, right? If I disable all the, if I disable all other cores, I could ignore the fact that someone has a lock on the serial port because I can reinitialize it. <laughs> and now I can use the serial port again. <laughs> okay. Kernel, source, interrupts. RS. Okay. Um... So now we're going to initialize the core locals. Now we're going to initialize interrupts for this core. Uh, and then we'll do interrupts init. OK, pub fn init. Um, print interrupts enabled. OK. And then we just have to do a mod interrupts. Here we go. Why is that resetting? Oh, because this, uh, this shit. Uh, we'll comment that out for now. Okay. Hey, interrupts enabled. There we go. So that's all it takes to enable interrupts on x86. All you do is you print, uh, you print your interrupts, and uh, you print that interrupts are enabled, and that's it. It's actually really interesting. On x86, they snoop the serial port buffer for this specific print message, and if it sees the serial message go across, uh, it actually just enables interrupts for you. It's really nice. That's, ex that's exactly how it works. <laughs> it's really weird. It's just like a weird special case on, on x86. <laughs> okay, so we have to make uh, an IDT. And the IDT, uh, similar to the GDT that we use LGDT to load, we're going to do LIDT to load interrupt descriptor table. Uh, and this is similar. We're going to have a base and a limit. It, it's going to look pretty much identical to a GDT. And then when an interrupt occurs, it will then index 
the IDT based on this offset, and then it will look up this handler for that interrupt, and that's it. So you, it's basically a, a table of function pointers, right? So here we have to set up these different gates. This is an interrupt gate. Uh, that's what we're going to be setting up. In this case, this is for a 32-bit, so we're going to look at 64-bit. So here's an interrupt, an IDT gate. So we're going to have, we're going to make a data structure that contains uh, this many. Uh, it's going to have 256 entries because there are only 256 interrupts on x86. So um, we're going to do let mute idt is equal to a vector. A vector. I got excited about that one. Uh, we're going to have a vector of an interrupt descriptor default. Uh, say like, say IDT entry default 256. Uh huh. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Parlay. I don't. What what is parlay vu? What what the fuck is that? I always say that and I have no idea where it's from. Is that like let's go or like? Do I even do I? Am I even in the remote ballpark? IDT entry. <laughs> it means to speak. Oh. <laughs> uh, to speak or talk. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, because it's like parlez-vous français, right? Like, I speak, I speak French, or do you speak French? Something? I don't fucking know. I, I, I took Spanish. I took the language that actually matters. <laughs> Okay, so we have an IDT entry. Um, in this case, we're gonna have a an offset. Yep, offset, which is a U64. We're gonna have a. Uh, you know what? We're gonna actually make this. So the IST, the IST is an index into the interrupt us uh, uh, stackers, but. I forget what they call the interrupt stack table. So the IST is actually how you can have the processor load RSP with a new stack on an interrupt, and you can use that to save yourself from these catastrophic events where your stack is fucked, and that's why you got your interrupt, and then the interrupt handler tries to push the interrupt frame onto the stack, which is fucked, and then you get a double fault and you, you reboot. <laughs> or... Well, in that case, you get a double fault, in which case, the way you typically implement this is that you have an IST only on your double fault handler. So if you have an interrupt that comes through, like a page fault, and it's a page fault due to your stack not being valid, then you'll get a double fault, but you'll have an IST set up for your double fault handler such that you'll get a safe, known good stack, if that makes sense. But yeah, that's how that works. So we'll be implementing that too. We're gonna we're gonna go full hog and we're gonna do this shit right. Sounds like a disaster. <laughs> no, 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 no. No disasters here. Zero four eight twelve. Okay. Um, this is just a U thirty two U thirty this. Okay. Rep C. That is that is just the four things, in that order. But Segment selector, what's that for? Oh, for the code uh, segment. Okay, cool. Um, what's that? I probably should fucking know that one. Okay, so here we're gonna have impl. Um, oh, and that one have a default. So here's a, uh, this will uh, derive clone copy. So this is a raw, IDT entry, which is valid when placed in an IDT in this representation. Ah, uh, representation. Wow, we're struggling to type today. Okay, uh, we're gonna impl on IDT entry, and we're gonna do fn. God damn it, fn new, and then this will have. 
basically everything we care about in here. We're going to take an offset, which is the offset into the code segment, I think. Offset to the procedure entry point. We're going to have the, so we'll have a CS, which will be a U16. We're going to have an offset. I forget where my window is. Sorry for the flickering. Offset. We're going to have the segment selector. And now it's just these bits. So IST. The IST is an 8. We have a type, uh, which is a U8. And then we have a DPL, which is a, um, a U8 in this case. And then we're going to construct this. I got you. <laughs> we added that, but no, it's not a typo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not trying to be passive aggressive. I, it's just funny. A lot of people ask that, so I made a, a command for it. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to move this over here so we can read it in parallel. Great, great, there we go. Okay, so we're gonna create, um, this is gonna return a self. And, uh, IDT entry. And at the first part, we're gonna have the offset and OXFFFF as a U32 ORD. So the bottom 16 bits of the offset. And we're going to OR that with the CS shifted by 16. Next, we're going to have the IST ORD with the um, as U32. And we'll just, we'll just make all these U32s. Like they're gonna they're gonna transfer uh, as an argument as a U64 anyways. So here we'll assert IST is less than um, it's you get three bits. So IST is less than eight. Uh, invalid IST asserts that the type uh, yep type is less than eight nine ten eleven twelve five bits. Five two to the five is uh, of sixty four. No, 32, right? 2 to the 5? 32, yeah. Uh, 32. This is going to be invalid uh, type. Um, this is going to be IDT entry IST. IDT entry. So we'll, we'll constrain that these are in the bounds that we expect. Uh, DPL. We're going to assert that that is less than or equal to 2 bits which is four. Um, and this is the DPL. And then the offset is an unconstrained 64 bit and the segment selector is an unconstrained 16 bit. So we have the CS as a U32 and then zero, zero, zero. Okay. That's not set up yet, but that should be close. Yet we just need this. And then the offset will cast down, turn into a U32. Great. So that's the bottom. So we're implementing this. So that's that's at offset zero. Now we're going to do this one. So we're going to have the IST. We're going to or the IST. Actually, we'll have the uh, offset shift by 16. And OXFFF. as a U32, we're going to OR that with one shift 15, which is the present bit. Then we're going to OR that with the DPL shift by 13. And then we're going to OR that with the type shift by 8. And the way that I'm getting all those numbers is from the locations up here. So offset is at 16. In this case, it's we actually need to shift that back by 16. Son of a bitch. 
honestly, that offset is just in place. So we can do this. Offset and. Take the top 16 bits of the offset. Then we got a present bit at 15. We got a DPL at 13, which is constrained to 4. We have a type at 8, which is constrained to 32. And we have an IST, which is constrained to 7, or 8 in this case. OK, so that's done. Um, and this is unhappy here. I think we just have to put some parens in there. Yep. And then here is just the offset shift by 32 as U32. And then the top one is reserved. So that has made an IDT entry. Not using R pound type. It's just gross. <laughs> um, OK, so what we're going to do is Um, let's see, what are we going to do here? We're going to uh, construct a new in-memory representation of an IDT, uh, an IDT entry. This will take the CS, uh, CS offset to the, now we'll, we'll do lowercase here. This will take the CS offset to the, um, handler address the IST for the, um, what do we call it? Interrupt, yeah, interrupt uh, stack table index, the type of the uh, IDT entry and IDT gate entry and the DPL, the descriptor privilege level of the IDT entry. OK. So I'll just construct that. That's relatively simple. We're going to make an IDT entry. Here we're going to do a, um, I think we might have to use global assembly here. Welcome back, jump out. Hell yeah. So great. So we don't have default. That makes sense. Um, in this case, the CS is going to be, we know what the CS is. I keep using mana on my makers as habit, and I need to summon a monk <laughs> on, on Tibia, that is. OK, and then here, uh, we're going to do a, a function. OK. So I need a location where this starts executing. And I can use naked functions in Rust. But I don't really trust naked functions, to be honest. So I think we're going to use global assembly here. Um, and I think that takes one of these bad boys. And I think that takes a semicolon. And the kernel's not going to be happy about that, I think. Yep. Uh, global asm. Okay. And then here we'll say IDT entry uh, fn default int handler. Well, we won't do anything yet. Um, I'm actually going to have an extern c. Uh, extern in this case. c is implied. And we're going to have. We're going to have a function address. And I'm going to say int entry fn. Actually, I can just say int entry fn int entry. That's a thing. And then here, we can do new, where cs is equal to uh, 28 for 64-bit. Uh, That's the. That's in our GDT that we specify in our stage 0. So that 28 is this 64-bit present code segment. So we're going to say this is our code selector. Um, then we're going to give it an offset, which is going to be the int entry as a U64. Oops. The address of that as a U64. 
we're gonna pass in an IST of zero, not using an IST, type of zero, and a DPL of zero, and we have to figure out um, the type. Okay, undefined um, entry, so we have to do an int. This is in assembly now. Um, int entry here, okay. All right, so now you have, yeah, we have an interrupt entry point that we can use, and we can give the address of that interrupt entry point. And then I forget what I have to use for the type here. I feel like it's always a pain to figure out what the type is. Um, task gate interrupt gate. Here's an interrupt gate. D is the size of the gate. Let me see if I can find the um, so the type. What am I supposed to use? Only 64-bit interrupts and trap gates can be referenced to that. Legacy or the old trap gates, okay. So those are the old types, but what is the type for a 64-bit gate? I think it might literally be this one, uh, 01110, which is a... Um, uh, 01110, that's a seven. No, that's not seven. That's uh, um, E. The question is, is that what I'm supposed to use here? Um, must be, yep, must be a 64-bit segment. If it's not a GP, blah, blah, blah. Legacy interrupt or trap gate types, E or that, are redefined as 64-bit interrupt and trap gates. Okay, so E is our interrupt gate. Mm -hmm. There we go. So that is an interrupt gate. And we'll say um, const i32 interrupt gate. Uh, this will be a u32 is equal to oxe. And this is the um, type for an interrupt gate uh, i32e for 64-bit mode. And we'll just say x64 interrupt gate. Fuck it. Splat that for 256. Beautiful. OK, now we need to make, uh, we need to load the IDT. To load that, we need to use the IDT, um, the base and limit. And it should be the same as a, a GDT base and limit, this, this structure here. Um, so what we'll do is let IDT pointer is equal to a IDT as pointer. That's the pointer. Oh, and then the uh, size of it is going to be um, uh, core pointer size of, or core mem size of val. Uh, this is the IDT dot dot. Just make sure that gets sliced up. I think that's not valid. That needs to be ref. So the size of that in bytes as a U16, then the pointer. And this is a um, the IDT uh, pointer, to uh, which has the limit and the address of IDT. So this allows me to do an unsafe. Um, this whole thing's going to be unsafe. Pull unsafe FN. Asm lidt, we're going to give this uh, an address of a thing. And the address of the thing that we're going to give it is in a register, and it's from the IDT pointer as, uh, this will just be IDT pointer, a memory clobber, and it's volatile, and this is Intel syntax. 
Okay. Gotta unsafe this function call. And we're getting there, so. I think this should now work. Ish. Uh, that doesn't need to be mute. Oh, it does, because we're gonna fill in entries for that. Okay. Oops. No one, I don't think anyone calls Itanium X64. People say IA64, but no one says, um, no one says X64 for Itanium. Maybe they used to, but I don't think that's a common terminology. I don't think it's confusing. Okay, the size of that, and then here I'm gonna print this, which is a IDT pointer. Okay, let's see what we got. Ooh, got a lot of IST. What? Oh yeah, uh, off uh, IST then type. It see, it caught me. That's how you write asserts. Okay. And it's a thousand bytes, is that correct? Oh, it's a thousand hex, which I think is correct because it's 32 times 256, which is 8192. Wait, no, it's uh, four times four. Yeah, 16 times 256, which is 4K. That is correct, okay, perfect. Um, okay, so this is... Oh, we're loading the IDT. It's not crashing. Nice. Oh, is it crashing? Interrupts enabled. And then what's going on over here? Core online. It is crashing. Why is that crashing? Uh, let me do a CPU halt here. Unless I need to keep the um, IDT pointer valid, but I don't think so. Okay. Core online, CPU halt. Let's put a halt here. That should be identical. Actually, we'll do this, such that more code gets generated. Um. Okay, bring the other cores online. Okay, that's strange. It gets loaded into a register. Yeah, internally it does. So I don't think, oh, um, I know what it is. Um, core mem forget. IDT, I'm freeing it, it's getting freed. The outer IDT, the vector we allocate. Um, okay. Why is that never working now? ASDF. Just making the prints different. Interrupts enabled. Okay. Um. Oh, uh. I think I need to load the new IDT for the soft. Well, we're not doing a soft reboot. Um, when we do a soft reboot, we will need to reload that IDT though. 
to kind of the default one. Um, yeah, what is that going to be? But why is this not working right now? Um... The 256 is correct. IDT pointer. Um, is alignment required? But I, I just don't understand. Um, okay, we're going to do this. Okay, that's our interrupt entry point. Still triple faulting. And if I don't do LIDT, does this work? Let's just make sure I didn't break something else. Okay, it has something to do with LIDT. CPU halt. I, I feel like I don't have to reset that. I think it gets loaded into a register from the base and offset. Um, let me say repr align eight. Actually, we'll just say 16, just to be like aggro. Uh, that's not it. I didn't think that was it either. Um, Okay. Uh, doop. This. This is. Okay. I'm doing something stupid. What would it be? 28, creating those entries, LIDT, it's killing us. It's a ref of IDT pointer, as const that. Oh, that's not necessarily valid because we, uh, we didn't force the repper on that. So we're gonna do uh, struct idt u16 u64 repr c. This is the um, idt uh, descriptor used to load the idt with lidt. Okay. So then this will be an idt of this. Um, this as a U64. And we can drive debug on this. Oops. Um, oops. Print the IDT pointer. Here we're gonna pass that as reference. Okay, this might fix it, but maybe not. Okay. That's what I expect. Um, interrupts enabled. 
Does size seven need to be the entire? Oh no, it's minus one. It's minus one. It's minus one. This. It's the limit. It's the limit of the table. totally it, isn't it? Are you fucking serious? Because, yeah, it's the size of the table in bytes minus one. That, and then a U64. Oh! No, uh, hmm. Are it, are interrupts enabled right now? They shouldn't be. Calculating the size of wrong? No, I don't think so. It, it's giving me FFF, which is what I want. What the fuck? Okay. CPU halt. Okay, let's see if we can unknit the other processors. It happens when the other cores come up. It's a it's a problem with the other cores. And I I don't quite know why. Well, in this case, uh core uh mem forget IDT. I forgot that I had that and then I deleted it. This might actually work now. Pretty sure this is good. What the fuck? If I don't bring up the other cores. What? So it's the print? What? I don't know how I'm not seeing that print. I don't need the CLI here, but print woo. Oops, print. Memory volatile intel passing the pointer of this IDT structure. Okay. Does this work now? Dude, it's so weird. Unless I've been hitting interrupts this whole time. Uh, if core ID is not equal to zero, CPU halt, halt all, halt all other cores there. Nope, still dying. Uh, align 16 both of these. I have, I have no idea. What the fuck? This problem with my interrupt handler, it, it doesn't matter because my interrupt handler is not getting used. 
I mean, it might be, but it shouldn't, right? I would expect if my interrupt handler were being used, then I probably wouldn't be able to not load an interrupt descriptor table, and I have no idea what's going on here. Um... Unless I format one of the things wrong. But that shouldn't matter. Yeah, that shouldn't matter. Maybe the these structures aren't the shape that I expect them to be. Unless this needs to persist, and we can do that, we can just say this is a box new on this core mem forget IDT pointer. I don't think that's the case though. Um, and this is in alloc box boxed. As pointer not found for that. Okay. Uh, as const idt. Uh, oops. Idt. Just make sure that that's the correct type. Yeah, into raw would work here as well. Um, dude, that makes no sense. That makes no sense let's try this Is it not actually initializing that structure? I'm gonna make all these mute. Nope. What the fuck? There shouldn't be any interrupts occurring. There should be no interrupts occurring. I mean, theoretically, it's possible that I could be getting an NMI right now. But it's probably something I'm doing stupid. Oh. There we go. Why? Interpolate zero two fifty six. These should be fine. Something's really fucked here. Something's really fucked here. What the hell? Is this not the right shape? Oh my god, this is packed. We'll say packed on this too. We gotta get rid of debug if we're doing that. Fuck. I knew it was fucking stupid. And it was. IDT pointer is this as pointer IDT This is just a reference to IDT pointer 
as an as a const IDT. Oh. Okay, that was a doozy. There we go. Wow. Wow, I got fucked. <laughs> um, okay, that makes sense. Uh, here we're going to assert uh, core nem size of IDT is equal to 4096. A core size of val. Load the IDT. <clears throat> then we forget the IDT and that we can actually do. Um, is there an into raw on vectors? Into raw parts. Oh, that's not done yet. Um, I think you do have to cast it, don't you? You have to make it and you have to forget it. Uh, let's see, the from raw parts shows it. Yeah, manually drop. Yeah, and we'll do that actually. Let's just do one of those bad boys. I like this. It's a zero cost. I like this. Um, manually drop new. Okay. Um, use core mem manually drop. Beautiful. So manually drop on this. And then drop. Cool. Yep. Inhibit compiler from automatically calling T's destructor. Yeah. We wrap that shit up. Beautiful. And then we can slice it up and it behaves the same. Uh, and then here, assert that that's equal to 4096. Um, limit in the address. Uh, make sure the entire IDT is present as we never have a partial IDT in this implementation. And this is load the IDT. Okay, so I should be able to cause an exception. Um, a core pointer writes volatile at this address as mute u64 of zero. Technically not canonical, we'll just do that. That one's fine. Okay, that's faulting. Um, hmm, hmm, but why though? Reset, okay, this, LIDT, IDT entry, as you 64. Hmm. Um, okay, so what's the problem here now? See packed on both of those. We did do this in the right order, did we not? Unless the documentation is misleading. Um, yep, zero. 
we've got the offset, the low part of the offset, and then CS shifted to the left by 16 as a U64. Great. And we're giving that a 28 hex offset is IDT entry as U64. Then we have offset and that. We've got the present bit set. I have the DPL at zero, which is good at 13. The type at eight, the IST. And then the offset shift 32 as U32 up for this part. And then the last one we just uh, fill in with a zero. Should be the correct order in memory. But seemingly it is not. Okay, let's see what the fuck is going on here. Right, that. Um, huh. Right, volatile. That is memory clobber. Won't get reordered. Take a look. Obsh dump D M Intel uh, target kernel. Oops. Uh, build kernel X release kernel dot exe vim dash init uh, interrupts init interrupts allocate that. We never call dropper free. Good. LIDT here. We move that and we store into there. Okay. And with FFF or with that. Unless the offset is broken. Let's take a look there. For the offset, we are loading in rip rel to int entry yeah and that's good that's what we want that loads rip rel int entry and then we just fill that in good morning napalm how are you doing what what did you miss in your multiple hours you uh uh, we added a soft reboot so we can reboot without actually having to reboot the hardware. Uh, we made our page table freeing four times faster. Uh, and now we're working on interrupts right now and we've got some weird crap going on I'm trying to figure that out. Um... FN entry. That's going to give the address of this. Of, where is it? Loan the address of this. This is int entry. Yep, that's exactly what I want. LEA that. Okay. Unless my type is wrong. DPL is fine. IC is fine. Int entry is U64. Yep, it's correct. Twenty-eight is good. That shifted into the right spot. Or that. And all of those we check to make sure that we don't have spilled bits. Offset shift rate is U32. What the fuck? Well, that's confusing. LIDT on that. Yep. And we have a word pointer there and then the pointer to the structure here. Great. That's exactly what I want. Mm. 
Nope, it's LIDT to load it. To set it up. SIDT stores the current IDT to memory. Um, and I just write to zero to that location. Strange. Strange. Interrupt gate. It's not a trap gate. It's an interrupt gate. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's an E. 8E00. Yep. That's the 8E. 8E0000. Oring with the bits from uh, RSI. Yeah, here we go. RSI is the address. We shift it to the right into RDX. We make a copy, shift it to the right. We zero extend the value in SI to there. That's the bottom part. And then we OR that with this. That'll construct this bottom part. This is the CS right here. And then that's ORing the bottom 16 bits. That's correct. C packed. Um, Unless that has an align 16 requirement, which I don't think it does, but uh, for, yeah, that's 16 bytes. Let's see if that does the trick. Uh, doesn't really matter, the packed and align here. Same issue. What the fuck? New IDT entry. And that in memory should be. Yeah, they're all right next to each other. Yep, that's what I want. Mm, Till 100, 256. Copy those all out. The segments are set up. Yeah, segments segments are all fine. Unless I load a GDT, but I don't think so. I think I got, yeah, I only load one GDT. Oh, shit. That GDT is no longer accessible. All right, I'll be right back. I got to hit that. Yeah, I know what the bug is. Yeah, our GDT is no longer mapped. Um, and to get that to work, we need to go into, really it's where we set up CR3, which is in bootloader source assembly routines. We load the CR3 for the kernel at this stage. Uh, any point after this, we actually can't load a GDT again. If we ever load a selector ever again, we're gonna have an issue. So, I might actually do some weird shit where, 
Well, I could create a new GDT. If I go into bootloader um, stage zero, LGDT, LGDT. Yeah, so this is set up so I only load a GDT once, but what I could do is I could load, jump far to J point. Oh yeah, we set up a new CR3. Uh, here we're going to load, um, load the original GDT since the kernel has relocated the GDT into its address space. So we'll load from GDT. Yes, it's implied, but we'll just do this. Um, so we'll load that GDT, and that way when we exit the kernel, blah, 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 will be ignored. Yeah, of course. Um, same thing here. Right, LGDT uses DS. It's pretty important. Yeah, it's just a data access. Yep. Uh, limit is equal to that. Space, blah, blah, blah. Loads those. Yep. Okay. So load a GDT. That's going to load the original GDT, which is fine, because at this stage, we're back into having access to physical memory at zero. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to make our own GDT with blackjack and hookers. In fact, we don't need a full uh, GDT, to be honest. Um, so that's an IDT entry, IDT entry. And then here. I'm gonna move this after, or actually above here. Then we're gonna have a GDT. Ah, descriptor table. It's the same for uh, descriptor pointer used uh, used to load with LIDT and LGDT. Because it's the same structure, I don't need to make a new one. And then GDT, we're gonna do the same shit. Uh, so this is a uh, table. Oops, what do we call it? Descriptor table. Actually, we'll just call this a table pointer, I think. Maybe a long pointer or something. I think table pointer is good here. Uh, so we got a table pointer. Line 8. Yeah, of course. All this shit's fucked. Um, so... We really only need the null and the 64-bit segment, so we'll just do a, um, here's what we can do. This is uh, initialize to use a, a kernel-based uh, GDT. Uh, the original GDT is using physical addresses, which are not address is, which, which are not valid in this address space. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna create one, which is pretty easy. Let GDT is equal to a manually drop uh, new, and this will be, <laughs> boop, this is a vec uh, containing a that bad boy, a this bad boy, and a this bad boy. Um, honestly, we'll, we'll copy the whole table such that the offsets are the same because otherwise the interrupt uh, frame is going to be kind of fucked. So we'll do this. Paste. Um, SDQ. Okay. S semi replace with a this. Oops. S uh, semi and replace it with a this. That way, the uh, it's the same table that we use in the bootloader, so that when we take an interrupt, uh, we don't actually change any of the selector values, which are good. So if we change the selector values, then we have to reload the segments, and I'd rather just keep these around, to be honest. 
This way we don't have to reload. So here we'll do uh, load the GDT. Load the GDT. We'll create a table pointer. Uh, address of the GDT. In this case, we have GDT as pointer. GDT pointer. In this case, it is um, uh, core mem size of val ref GDT. And I'll slice that in. Slice that up. Okay, create a GDT pointer, load GDT, load a GDT pointer as a uh, table pointer. Same thing here. Table pointer. Okay, and that expected U16. Just truncate that. Uh, U16 minus one, because it's the limit. Out of the range of an I32, yep. Um, it's a U64. Technically, having it just on the first one would be sufficient. Honestly, I'm going to do this. It's a manually drop vec U64. Okay. Uh, use alloc vec vec. Okay, so this should now work. Okay, it doesn't. Um, LGDT. Um, okay, why is this one failing? Uh, Prince got here. Oh, that's a real debugging tool right there. Okay, we got there. Great. Oh. Did did I not rebuild it? Cuz it seems to be working now. Yeah. Okay. I think I didn't rebuild it or for some reason the reset didn't take effect. Okay. Good. That makes sense. Um and then here we'll do an int 3. Um, and this should now triple fault. Beautiful. That means we have execution here. And then we reboot, force reset. Yep. Okay, cool. That means we have execution in the interrupt handler, which is exactly what the goal was. Um, okay, load the GDT. Technically, I could just adjust the GDT. I could actually do a store GDT and then change it to a physical address. Um, that would save me allocating this. I could do a store GDT into a table pointer, and then I could adjust the physical address of that GDT. So I think we might do that. All right, so if we don't, if we don't, if we don't load a GDT, this fails, right? I just want to make sure this is failing quite well. Beautiful. Failing great. Okay. Um, so this, we're going to... Um, yeah. Uh, we can do this. Uh, we're gonna store GDT at zero at this point GDT pointer. Uh, this can be mutable and this is just a table pointer um, We're just allocating space on the stack for this so um, Hold uh, create some space on the stack for the GDT entry Then we're gonna do a store GDT to that location We'll do a mutable pointer here make this mute then we can store to that location. Great. This saves an allocation, which is nice. Um, this should fail, because we're just storing GDT. Great. 
Um, okay, so then I can do a add. Uh, um, zero plus two, uh, quadroid pointer. We're gonna add um, one, and this is uh, convert the physical address of the old GDT into a virtual address in the kernel address space, and then we can do LGDT of that. Okay, so we, we apply a transform there, and then here, um, then I have to pass in this, the second register is gonna be a constant, which is the core rex, there are boot args, uh, kernel fizz window base. Okay, so this is at boot args this. Great. Um, we'll put a colon here. We'll call it there. Okay, so we're gonna take in that, and then we're gonna add that as a quadroid pointer to there, and then we're gonna reload the GDT. So this will be um, update to use a GDT in the current uh, virtual space. Uh, save the old GDT, convert the physical address to the old GDT, and load the um, newly adjusted GDT. Beautiful. Damn. AFK and Tibia. Fuck. Oh well. Um. Okay, so this is now, hey, it succeeds. Great, and then if we int three here, I don't think I've ever used store GDT before. Okay, now this fails, perfect. So yep, we have control, we're jumping into there and we're using the original GDT that we used in the bootloader. So we're not actually creating a new allocation, which is fantastic. It's exactly what I want. Okay, update the GDT in the current virtual space. Um, this is uh, create a new IDT, and this code is about to get sick. <laughs> uh, it's about to get really nasty, and we're kind of forced to, and I'm probably just gonna steal some macros because I don't wanna write this code with you guys because it sucks. Um, I don't have interrupts on that. Let's go into um, sushi roll uh, kernel source interrupts. So what we have to do is we have to implement, um, we have to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, there's actually no way to get the interrupt number from your interrupt. So we basically need to have a bunch of different uh, interrupt handlers implemented. Uh, also, some of the interrupts include an additional error uh, status. So like this is a double fault, uh, page fault has an error. So like a bunch of these different exceptions uh, push an error value to the stack. So we kind of need a different, we need like a different handler implementation for every single one. It's fucking stupid. Because um, it doesn't pass us the interrupt ID. And the interrupts are not consistent. It's, it's just so stupid, man. So stupid. Picking it. Profile enable. Uh, init GDT. We don't care about that. So we just care about all this code here. Yoink. Boop. Okay, so this has all the extern, the externs, and then here we mark Intel syntax. Uh, here we have, um, this handles uh, saving the uh, current context of the CPU such that we don't clobber anything. So you have an XMM push. Our kernel doesn't use YMM registers at all right now, so it's safe for us to use, uh, just state, save and restore all the XMMs. And this is XMM pop. Uh, it's an unaligned store uh, and, uh, 
it's it's just push and pop for XMM registers. Uh, here we implement in. Here we make a macro for defined inter interrupt handler where we have an interrupt ID, and then we have a boolean that tells us if the tells us if there's an error code, and then we create a new function with this interrupt ID as the uh, as like the number, so we just whack that in there. Uh, we save a couple things we need, and let's see. <clears throat> what was the LIDT problem? Yeah, it was that my GDT was still using the physical pointer. So I just had to, uh, what I actually did, I created a GDT, but then I switched to this model. I saved the old GDT, I then add the base of our physical address window, and then I load that GDT. So it allows me to reuse the old GDT I just have to update it such that it uses the new virtual address in this uh, state. Okay, so. Okay, so in this case we have a, um, oh, I gotta, whoops. Uh, Comment and document that. Which one? Uh, yes. This. 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 There we go. Okay. There and this. Tack. That. Okay. All right. Anyways. This has nothing to TLB tagging, jump out. I'm sorry, man, but, like, this has nothing to do with TLBs. <laughs> the IDT shenanigans? Well the IDT, well, the IDT was simple. The IDT was that our GDT was bad, so our, our IDT was fine, and then we update our GDT, and we document everything we're doing there. Nothing there is too weird. Okay, in this case, we've got a, um, so here's our interrupt handler. We push R15, RCX, RDX, and R8 right, right away. We then record the current RSP and R15. If we have an error code, then RCX, RDX, and R8. I see. So we're going to load up the parameters. This is going to have the interrupt ID. This is going to have the, uh, and this can be an ECX. Um, same with this one. <clears throat> so here we load the interrupt vector. We load a the address of the interrupt frame. And then the address of Oh, that is, that's the address of the interrupt frame. This is the address of the, um, uh, that's getting the error code. So that gets the error code off the stack. We 16 byte align the stack such that uh, we know the size of an IRET frame. So we 16 byte align the stack there. Uh, that's a requirement. Um, here, if, if there is an error code, then we change that alignment, pop everything back. If there's an error code, then we pop off the error code and I write Q. Okay. So this is making a bunch of different entry points for the interrupt handlers, and that's calling enter rust. And enter rust, um, oh yeah, this did some wild shit. Um, RBX, oh, that's RCX, that's RDX, RSI, RDR, RBQ, that's RSP. R9, 10, 11, 12, and then this is R15. 
and then we jump and we call the interrupt handler in Rust, and then here we pop off everything. Okay, so this is our interrupt handler. So now what we can do is we can say fn interrupt handler, and this is the interrupt number. Uh, we'll say this is a u size, not that it really matters. Then we also have the interrupt frame, which is a interrupt frame, and that's mutable. We have exclusive access to that. And then we have the interrupt, uh, here we'll just say the number frame. All of these are fucking interrupt related. <coughs> number frame and error. If there was an error code, and now what I can say is panic, uh, got ex uh, interrupt this, and I can print the number. Boop. Uh, interrupt frame we haven't defined yet, that's fine. And then down here, let's see what we actually push. Sub RSP, oh, move R9. So we also have R9 points to RSP. And that has all of the registers. Okay, cool. So we'll borrow those from here in sushi roll. Here's an interrupt frame. Uh, so this is the uh, shape of a raw 64-bit 60, uh, interrupt frame. Okay, has all those fields. And then I should have all regs. Here we go. This is also passed in. Um, and this is the uh, structure containing, containing all registers at the state of the interrupt. So when the interrupt occurred, this has the register state of all of the registers. Um, and I don't put RSP in there. OK, cool. RSP you find in here, CS and SS, and then R flags, RIP. Perfect. And then XMMs, uh, those are in reverse order. So I might document that. Yeah, those are in reverse order. So we're going to say XMM 15, U128, and we'll go all the way down, make these pub 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, oops, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay. Now, a uh, push. XMM push. Can I safely do aligned here? Because apparently the stack is going to be aligned. We can't guarantee that. Yeah, we can't guarantee the stack's going to be aligned. Thus, we also can't. This is fine because this is packed. Uh, this should technically be packed. OK. Beautiful. Um, and this is a pub. Extern FN, no mangle. And this is the like uh, entry point for all interrupts and exceptions. And then this also has uh, regs, mute, all regs. Okay, got interrupt there. That's a panic. Into entry. Uh, yeah, so in this case, we actually have to use this table. Extern C. Extern C is implied. Um, extern is C by default, if I'm not mistaken. Why not push them in a different order? Because um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, that's, that's effectively why, because it doesn't matter. Um, 
clone copy packed. Uh, the reason I push them in that order is because it looks nice in this side of things. And I don't want to push them in reverse order here. So, and the structure doesn't matter, right? The structure, you can access it in any way in Rust. So it makes the assembly cleaner, and then the Rust isn't affected at all by it because it's a structure. Okay, so int entry is here. Um, so we have to grab the table of handlers. Okay, handlers. Did I put those in a vector? Okay, thank God. So this is, we can actually make a constant table, I think. Unless I can't make these const. No, I think we can make these const. Okay, so these are const uh, int handlers. And this will be a function pointer for every single uh, interrupt. Okay. Uh, font unsafe, yep. Uh, An extern. Okay, 57. This is going to be the. Uh, uh, vec with capacity. 128, uh, 256. Okay. So this should panic because this uh, assertion will fail on the size of value here, uh, which will be good. Uh, vec, we don't have uh, use, use alloc vec, vec, uh, and 68, IDTS pointer. Uh, manually drop vec. Yeah, we'll just do this. Uh, we'll fucking fill it in. For this in for int id in zero dot two fifty six vec dot push handlers int id as u sixty four. Okay, so if I did two fifty five here. This should panic. Uh, the push. Oops. There we go. And this. Uh, hope there's another one. Wait. Um. What? I'm missing something basic syntactically. Oh, this is IDT. But still mismatched. Why is that? And then handlers? Isn't that what I called it? Int handlers, okay. I'm fine with that. What did I f break? What did I break? Oh, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go, okay. Not bums mutable, that's fine. Mute, okay. So we push all those entries. This should panic, because we're at 255, and this will be like, whoa, the size doesn't match, perfect. And then 256, the size will match. And then this will set up all the different interrupt handlers. Bam, panic. Okay, we have a panic, great. Um, panic, got interrupt that number. Okay. Um, you have a lock held on something? No. Shouldn't. Number. Uh, 
132.5. So we are hitting this, which is good. And then what's going on here? Um, something not set up. Am I panicking too early? Interrupts and knit. Yep. Okay, what's going on here? Uh, starting interrupts 132. Got interrupt. Blah. Huh. Where do I implement panic? Here. Message. Getting that message is failing. Technically, I don't need a new line here. But that's not the issue. It's not the other project. We're, de we're deadlocking on something. And this is unsafe. Uh, pub. Uh, unsafe extern FN. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm really surprised by that. That message is causing a... Why is... message deadlocking? Um... Panic that. That'll get the lock, that'll get the lock, that'll get the lock, that'll get the lock for the serial device. We're able to get it up here. And then at this stage, for some reason, the lock is still held. Um... Let's see if I can do this. But I, I don't know why that print lock isn't getting released. Huh. I'm gonna interrupt that. And then we'll do a CPU halt here. Interrupt E. Yeah, that's a page fault. Uh, fatal exception. Huh. What if I just do a raw panic? Does that fix it? Is panic taking the lock? No. So this one works, right? Yeah. That's easy. Um, but then the problem is...
Why can we not panic here? I don't think I have any locks held in a knit. Um, what? Print panic, do that. Panic handler being packed has nothing to do with it. Um, yeah, what is... Let me disable the print lock, uh, print, which is just this marker lock. Let's see if we are... Okay, and then, yeah, we know that one works. And let's go into here. Make that panic. Okay, that's triple faulting in a loop. What? 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 Core ID. Let's see if the core structure is working. Maybe something about core is broken in this context. It shouldn't be, because GS base doesn't get changed. Okay, uh, core dot. Yeah, if core didn't work, we wouldn't be able to print. Um, and then if we do a panic, this then fails. We apparently deadlock. Um, weird. Interrupt handler. Yeah, we're gonna do some formatting shit. Okay, we're gonna lock. So this is inlined. Then that's gonna panic. Whoa. What the fuck? This is gonna grab the. This is gonna grab a lock. That's locking this. In the. This is grabbing the print lock. And then we're gonna do formatting. And then we're gonna write format. And then somehow. Somehow this doesn't go out of scope. What the fuck? Core mem drop lock. Some for some some reason that's not getting its own scope. We're acquiring a lock, but we're never releasing that lock. Oh, here we lock at it. Um, never mind. Okay, good. That makes sense. Lock at it. Why don't we see those prints? Uh, we'll call it write format. Write format. 
we'll get access to the serial port. Write the bytes. Okay. And then we release, this is releasing the print lock. So why are we not seeing that print, right? Because we're, like that print is happening. What if you get an interrupt during print? Yeah, but that just shouldn't. Yes, this is this is what should happen. Uh, but am I getting an exception during this actual code? Um. The only way that would happen is if we're out of stack space. But yeah, I think we're getting an exception. We're getting an exception. Let me actually see if it's uh, Corex this cxx frame handler let's see uh let's see what we get here um we're gonna go into panicking there we do a serial right uh let's go back to where we were here's our interrupt handler we go to the end this is calling panic now the thing is that print should have happened Unless we're panicking during our prints, during the right format. And which one is it? We'll just go to this specific address. Oh, I know what it is. Our stack's unaligned. Our stack's unaligned. That's what it is. Our stack's unaligned, and then we're hitting something that uses SSE instructions using a, a move ABS, and then that's causing an issue. Uh, here we want to um, we want to actually save our VP. Well, here we can save our SP, and then here, um, uh. Uh, let's see, what's a uh, calling convention on this for x64? Stack must always be aligned. Um, and I think RBP non volatile must be saved and restored by a function that uses them. Okay, so we can do a um, move. RBPRSP. At the end, we can restore it by doing a move RSP RBP, restore the stack. So we'll say restore the stack. This will be um, color us interrupt handler. This will be uh, save the current stack pointer for the fourth argument. And here we're going to um, save the stack. Uh, allocate register homing space and align the stack. So we save the stack and then we sub RSP and then we and RSP not RxF. So that will 16 byte align it. The address will ever only ever go down and then here we restore it. So we make room, we and it, which would cause it to go down or stay the same. And then there we restore the stack. Uh, Cargo run. Okay, here we go. Thank fucking God. So by the time we call back into Rust, we have aligned our stacks, which means we're uh, conforming with the calling convention of Rust. Uh, of Rust in MSVC in this case. Okay, so we have the uh, this, and we can panic. Uh, fatal exception okay perfect 
Here we go. <clears throat> All right. Fatal exception. Cool. Interrupt E. And then what we can do is, um, yeah, now we have to actually program the pick. We want to program the pick and uh, are we going to use just, if we use the A pick for delivery, I don't know if we need to program the pick. We might have to. Um, okay. So now we can print uh, reg, uh, registers at exception. This is gonna be this is gonna be glorious. Um, now is when we get to do the fun stuff. Interrupt this registers at exception. This I might do a multi-line print here. X new line uh, X registers at exception. And then we can do uh, racks 016x rbx 016x rcx 016x rdx 016x. Um, and then we'll have RSP. Actually, we'll do RSI, RDI, RBP, RSP. Actually, I'm going to do it in the correct order, which is uh, REX, RCX, RDX, RBX, uh, then RSI, RDI, I think. Uh, does it make sense to do a specialized inter interrupt handler for each? Um, not, not really. Um, Technically, kind of, but it just it just doesn't matter. It's a it's a compare. It's like, is it worth is it worth having uh, massive amounts of extra code and a different interrupt handler for every single interrupt versus having a four cycle jump table on every interrupt? It's just not worth it because the interrupt itself is like sixty cycles. So it's it's just not worth it at all, in terms of just the like cost payoffs there. Um, like we have we have to save this whole frame, right? When we have an interrupt, we're saving the entire register state. This is actually going to take the uh, the exception itself is going to be like forty to sixty cycles. Saving this entire frame is going to be another like eighty cycles. Um, Jumping to rust, that's going to be another like five cycles. So it's it's like 120 to 150 cycles for this interrupt to occur. If we had an interrupt handler for every one, it would save us about four cycles on a jump table. But we would have the same code copy pasted for every single interrupt. Um, it's just it's just really not worth it in in my opinion. And we'd have to have a different um, we'd have to have like dynamic dispatch here. We'd have to implement like this, where we call interrupt handler. We would have to have a copy of this code 256 times for every single interrupt. Um, <clears throat> it's just really not worth it. Could you save cycles by not saving XMM? I have to save XMM because I do use them. So unfortunately, no. Uh, Linux doesn't allow the use of uh, XMMs in the kernel, and thus it doesn't have to save and restore XMMs, but it doesn't matter. Interrupts are never going to happen in this kernel, right? <laughs> I don't care about the performance of my interrupt handlers at all in the first place. I'm going to have interrupts occurring uh, maybe once every like 30 seconds <laughs> when a user manually says, I would like to reboot the OS, and that's it. Th those are the only interrupts that are ever going to really occur. Maybe I'll have a timer interrupt that goes like a thousand times a second. Um, so the speed up by having a different dispatch and by like tweaking all of these things and not saving XMMs, uh, it's just, it's just not worth, it's just not worth XMM zero, uh, 032 X. 
and that's I think the XMMs will put all on their own lines. The thing is, if you're getting so many interrupts that you're actually really saving anything by not saving and restoring fields like that, um, if you're getting that many interrupts, it's probably an architectural flaw of your OS. Like, yeah, of course, save cycles if you can. Um, but then I'd lose access to floats in my kernel, and I wouldn't be able to use floats for anything. Just because I want to save a couple cycles, let's say I want to save 50 cycles every 30 minutes, <laughs> which would be like a uh, 10, uh, 1 times 10 to the negative 10 percent speed up. <clears throat> this happens when there's syscall heavy code. Syscalls don't go through interrupt handlers, so this is unrelated to syscalls. And this kernel will never have syscalls anyways. But yeah, syscalls don't go through interrupt panelists because uh, interrupts are very slow. Syscalls actually use a completely separate um, uh, convention. You set up these uh, IA32 like C stars. Uh, the calling convention is actually really interesting. Uh, a syscall basically like it doesn't even load a kernel stack, whereas this will always an interrupt will always load a kernel stack. Um, but that isn't the case for a, um, it's not the case for a syscall. A syscall literally just sets like RCX to the pre, it sets like RCX to the previous R flags, disables interrupts, transfers execution to a specific location in the kernel, and then it's on you uh, to swap GS and load up a stack and everything. It's very thin. Uh, syscalls are about as cheap as you can get. Uh, it's, it's literally the bare minimum is stored by the CPU to allow you to get back what you did before. Yeah, um, so yeah, this is not for syscalls. This is just for interrupts. Interrupts would be f frequent for timers. Maybe we'd have a timer interrupt that triggers a thousand times a second. In the case of a timer interrupt, right, if it's a thousand times a second, um, that is at this... Uh, CPU speed, uh, 3.2 gigahertz, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm doing the math on my calculator here. Um, so by, by not saving the XMMs and basically disabling use of floating point in my entire kernel uh, would be a, a point, uh, oop, times 100, it'd be a point oh oh one percent speed up. <laughs> If I have interrupts happening a thousand times a second, it's just like who fucking cares? <laughs> just, just who cares? It's, it's so it's so far below below the noise floor. Um, so I guess uh, in the contrary, that would mean if I had an interrupt firing a million times a second by not saving and restoring XMMs, it would save me about a one percent, one and a half percent. And that's a million interrupts a second, which is unreal. Uh, in the case of like network activity, your network card, you actually program your network card to hold back an interrupt until X amount of packets have come through or X time has elapsed. And that allows the um, interrupts to be bundled. And that's basically the common configuration. So you might have, you might be handling a million packets per second or 10 million packets per second, but you're only getting 10,000 interrupts per second because it's uh, the, it's just batching the interrupts. Um, so basically, if you have more than 1,000 interrupts a second, you probably intentionally designed your drivers or software to have that effect. In our case, we're actually not going to have an interrupt on network activity um, we're probably only going to have a timer interrupt. We're probably not even going to have a serial port interrupt. We're just going to have a timer interrupt about a thousand times a second. And that's just going to check in on some system resources. That's going to see if a key has been pressed on the serial port. That will be used for just kind of checking in anything that we need to happen a couple thousand times a second. And then that handle will be failable where if, um, yeah. 
Uh, if a lock is held, it will just need nothing. So that's the only interrupt we're going to have. Everything else is going to be fatal. We're not even going to have, uh, when we implement a network card, even a 10 gigabit network card, we won't actually enable interrupts uh, because we don't actually have a need to use interrupts uh, with a network card. So we're not going to do that. Um, okay, so now we're going to print all of these things. Okay, perfect. All these fields are missing. And let me make sure I have the order of these. Um, let's go to the mod RM. And ALCL, DLBL. Okay, so EAX, ECX, EDX, EBX. RAX, RCX, RDX, RBX. And then SP, BP, SIDI. So SP, BP, SI, DI. So that is the order that Intel specifies those. And then we have the R other, uh, these ones. 016x, R9, 016x, R10, 016x, uh, R11, 016x, and then 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, so we don't have the flags, but that's, uh, we can actually grab those. We'll grab the R flags, 016x, there. Okay, interrupt this, uh, error code X. Okay, so now we fill in all this shit. Um, we'll put it here, number, error. Then we have all the registers. So we have uh, regs.rex, regs.rcx, regs.rdx regs.rbx, yoink, paste. SP is actually not here. BP, SI, and DI. And this should complain. It's going to be like, whoa, there's no BP in there. That's because this is in frame. Then we're going to have regs. Dot, um, and we'll do this. Uh, now we're going to have the regs.r8, regs.r9, regs.r10, regs.r11. It's just boilerplate stuff. There's really nothing too tough going on here. 12, 13, 14, 15. Frame r flags, I think is what I call it. Perfect, I do. Now we have regs.xmem0, regs.xmem1, xmem2, xmem3, uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, and we'll put that. We'll kind of stylize it in the same way of our format string. Uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay. Done. All right. Here we go. Nice. Registers that exception. So interrupt E, error code 2. So this is a page fault fail to access some memory, and then this is the register state and all of the XMM states at the time of the exception. Um, where's RIP? <laughs> you know, you have a point. <laughs> that is an important one. There it is. <laughs> Luckily, we did have it, so it's not like we had to re-architect everything. Uh, stream term. Okay. Oops. Now what we can do is we can go into chocolate milk. Obj dump M Intel D build kernel target up oh, X this kernel dot exe. And what I should be able to do is I should be able to go to one, two, three, seven, one, two, three, five, oh, eight D. And this 
is the address that calls an exception, and it is. Uh, and racks is this value, and we tried to make a store to that location. So yeah, works, works fucking great. Hell yeah. <laughs> Woo! And we got all the XMMs. Nice. And then this is interrupt uh, E, which is all I care about. And then error code 2. Registers at exception. We get the whole register state, which looks great. And this is not necessarily an exception. And then we panic, uh, fatal exception. OK, so that is the end, the end of everything. Um, if we had an exception, perfect. OK, so let's, let's do this. Um, now we need to set up the IST. Uh, right volatile. So we'll get rid of this and then this should allow all the cores to run. There's no exception. All the cores should come online. Perfect. Now I'm going to fake this and this is going to simulate a stack exhaustion. And this will triple fault. We'll actually get a reboot here. Yep. So we're rebooting in a loop. And the reason for this is that when the exception occurs, um, an exception occurs, but there's no stack to save the interrupt frame to, so the processor cause, causes a double fault, and the double fault is using the same stack that we're currently using. So what we want to do is we want to set up the IST, uh, which is really annoying because the IST requires that we set up a stack, or uh, a set, set up a task gate, which makes no fucking sense because <laughs> task gates aren't used on 64-bit, but... Who fucking cares? So we're going to look at the IST, and then this will make everything pretty bulletproof. Um, okay. So, yep, this is the... Oh, that's the shadow stack. Oh, yeah, that's for if you're using a shadow stack thing. Uh, IST is available as an alternative to the modified legacy stack switching as described above, um, which is this. Um, it's unchanged uh, when the stacks are switched as part of a 64-bit privilege level change. The new SS is not loaded. Uh, it grabs it from the TSS, uh, and that makes sense. So we're going to have to set up a TSS here. And to set up the TSS, we'll have to then also give it, um, let's see if that's described, task management, 64-bit TSS. So this is what the TSS looks like. Uh, here's the IST. So we'll basically point a TSS here. And the way that it works is the, it's really fucking stupid, man. Um, but effectively, the the GDT points to a TSS. You then use an LTR, a load task register, which will give it an index of a GDT entry. That GDT entry will be pulled out, and that will have an address that will be to the TSS. And then the TSS will be this structure. It makes me not want to implement this, but I have to. Um, ugh, it's so stupid, man. I write with NT, yep. Um, so this is control f transferred to a TSS. Yeah, the task sw switching mechanism available in protected mode is not supported in 64-bit mode, but we still throw some structures in these structures just because we are too lazy to make a new thing. So we just kind of repurpose something that's no longer used and just stuff some bits in there, and that's, uh, that's where it's used. It's fucking stupid. Must be implemented in software. It's a GP if any of these things occur, in which case 
Although hardware test switching is not supported, the TSS must exist <laughs> because it has the RSPs, which are used to, uh, so these RSPs are for the different privilege levels. So when you transition to a privilege level during an interrupt, it will pick up these stacks. So these are the stacks that an interrupt will use on a privilege transition. However, if, uh, if you have an interrupt or an exception in, uh, in the existing uh, um, privilege level zero, then it actually just uses the existing stack. Um, okay. Must create at least one 64-bit TSS after activating this. It must execute the LTR to load the TR register with a pointer to the TSS responsible for both 64-bit mode programs and compatibility mode programs. <sighs> <sighs> Technically, you don't have to do this, right? Um, I don't like that they say you have to. You have to do that if you have a user mode or you use rings. But if you don't use ring levels, you don't actually have to use this because the TSS is never used unless you specify an IST. And the uh, IO bitmap is not used unless you're using ring levels. So unless you're using ring levels, you don't have to do this. It's stupid. But, I mean, Intel clearly wrote this documentation with explicitly that in mind, that that's exactly how things will be developed. Ah, <sighs> really annoying. So that's the... Um... So we have to have, we have to make this structure. This is a TSS. So we have to make this structure. Um, and I might already have one of those. Uh, kernel source or sushi roll. I might not have actually done a TSS in sushi roll. Let me see if I did. Core requirements. Um, interrupts. IDT entry, all registers. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like I, oh, I do LTR. And this is the TSS entry. and I set up a TSS that zeroed out. And then here I make the special interrupt stacks for DF enemies and um, machine clears. Or not machine clears. Does RISC-V implement interrupts in the same way? I have no idea. I've never looked at the system side of RISC-V. Uh, so this is a TSS. Oh, I do have a TSS. Okay, perfect. So this is uh, a TSS, a 64-bit TSS data structure. Uh, in this case, we want to put this in a slightly different spot. There's nothing we really have to change here. We have all the different stacks for the permission levels, and then the reserved fields, and then the IST here. Fantastic. And then GDT, uh, LTR. So LTR, that's going to load the uh, TR structure. Um, in this case, we have the TSS entry here, and I think what we're going to do is I'm probably going to set up the... Now, I, I either have to overwrite this in the existing GDT, or I have to create a GDT. So I think we're going to make a GDT here. <laughs> chocolate milk in the past, sushi roll. Yep, well, chocolate milk is the new one, sushi roll is the old one. But yes, I do have a, I do have a trend there. <laughs> Definitely a trend there. Okay. So in this case, we're actually going to load a, a new GDT. Uh, so we're just going to say this, load GDT. This is a string. This is going to take the GDT pointer. We don't have to give it this base. 
doesn't quite fit in one line, but it's close. LGDT on GDT pointer. In this case, the GDT pointer, uh, we're going to make a GDT, which will be a manually drop uh, GDT on a... Um, yeah, we'll do a vector. Um, create a GDT in this context, uh, in the kernel context, and then we'll grab... Sucks because we actually did this before, but it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a change here. Uh, interrupts here. We'll grab these. Whack these in here. Uh, replace DQ space with a nothing. Actually, one, two, three, four spaces. And then we'll replace probably actually in our history here. There we go. It is. Okay, so then here we'll do uh, core mem size of value of the GDT sliced up as u16 minus one. So we're gonna create the table and then here this will have the pointer, GDT as pointer as a u64. Um, so this will, um, Create the pointer to the GDT for uh, LGDT to load. And here we'll create a new GDT. And then we just need commas. Oops. Uh, perfect. And this is unhappy here because that. Okay. Pass that in. Technically, it doesn't need to be mutable in this case. So I'll say a constant table pointer. Okay. So LGDT will load this, and then here we can say a, uh, this is a manually drop vec u64. All right. So this should work. Um, actually, we have something Oh yeah, we have the we have the test stuff here. So if I did an exception, core pointer write volatile to ox leet as mute u64 write a zero to it, we should get our exception. There we go, beautiful. So that does still work. Fatal exception, and then what we need to do is we need to create a um, create the uh, task pointer. And uh, in the GDT, and that'll be at uh, 38 hex. So that's what we'll have to LTR. So LGDT, and then we'll LTR OX uh, 20, or in this case 38. I think that's the correct syntax. Uh, LTR. Actually, how was LTR implemented here? It might be, you might deref it. Uh, sushi roll shared CPU source LTR. Oh, it has to be in CX. Okay. It's required that that is in CX. Um, and we'll just do this. Uh, Multi-line. LGDT, tab that in, LTR, that, that'll fit, and then we can move CX, X28, and we just have to say that, uh, we'll say RCX is clobbered, uh, and it's 38. So this will probably triple fault, because we're loading an invalid task. Okay, perfect. So we want to grab the TSS here and I don't think the TSS needs to be in physical it definitely doesn't so we'll say um, let box TSS and this will be a manually drop box TSS and we'll do a um, 
manually drop new box new TSS default. I'm guessing I implemented default for TSS. I did. So that will create a new zeroed out TSS. So um, uh, create a new empty TSS. Um, box, we got to pull in use alloc boxed box. OK, TSS. So create a new empty TSS. We then fill this in, and then we have to create a pointer to that. This is still going to triple fault. Beautiful it is. OK, uh, and now I need to compute that. So this is apparently what a TSS looks like. A TSS entry looks like. And we might want to make a helper to clean this stuff up a little bit. Uh, so we'll say let TSS low. But we'll just get this working. Let TSS high. And then we'll do a gdt.push tss high as u64 shifted by, uh, we got to do another, uh, by 32, or tss low as u64. So that will push that on the gdt. tss base, in this case, is uh, let tss base is equal to tss as uh, pointer as u64, uh, as u Size of a TSS minus one. Uh, use size, I think in this case. Uh, this is using core. It looks like shit. I know, I know, I know. We're just going to get this shit working. Um, TSS as const TSS as use size. Okay, uh, that will get us the pointer. 70. Okay, it is a U64. Um, got a double gear of that. Okay, there we go. That's const TSS. So that'll push a TSS, and this should. That's failing due to the LTR. Do I have some hard-coded shit in here? I don't think so. TSS base. This is the this is saying that it's a TSS regions. We load that GDT that we just created. There we're pushing to the GDT. High bits. Should this still be crashing? Yeah, that LTR is killing us, right? Let's check. Yep. So LTR is causing problems. Um, oh. The... Okay, the high and low are actually both 64 bits. We'll push the low and then the high. There we go. There we go. Beautiful. And if we swap these, it should fail. Yeah, because the TSS actually is two, uh, uses two slots. Perfect. So that's failing. Okay, so that's definitely correct. Um, okay, so that means we now have a TSS set up. So what we can do is let um, crit stack is equal to a manually drop vec u8 equals vec new uh, vec with capacity. Uh, and we'll create 32k. So create a 32 kilobyte critical stack 
for use during double faults, machine checks, and non-maskable interrupts. Okay. Ah, and colon this. Perfect. Okay, so we make a critical stack here. Then what we can do is TSS dot um, IST zero is equal to crit stack as pointer, pretty sure, uh, as U64, because that's what I told it to be. And then this needs to be a manually drop new, create that. Okay, so then we store that in IST0, and let IST is equal to if uh, match inst ID, uh, interrupt ID. You can also use into raw to leak it. Yeah, I know, but I, I, I actually like this a little bit more, this manually drop. I think it's a little bit more clear um, inst ID is equal to, uh, zero, or actually, what do we care about in this case? DF NMI NMC, and these will set the IC to one on this. So if the interrupt is a two or an eight or an 18, um, so this is NMI double fault MC, use the IST, in which case they'll have an IST of one. All other cases, the IST will be zero. Then here we'll push the IST. Um, okay. Perfect, and then that's, that's causing this exception. And then let's see, oh, this is gonna fail because we don't add to that stack. Oh, wow. Fuck, did that work? Oh, because we contiguously allocate virtual memory. That actually, um, yeah, so we're gonna go into, we want that to fail, so we're gonna go into kernel source uh, VM. We're gonna add guard pages, uh, sp kernel source mm. We're gonna add guard pages, const uh, guard page size. This will be a U64, and this is the gap between virtual allocations. Next free vatter. And then in this case, we'll take the align size and let align size is equal to align size dot checked add, um, whatever we call that variable, uh, guard page size. Um, add the guard page after the allocation. And then that's it. So this should now triple fault. This will reboot in a loop. Okay, apparently not. Really? Next free virtual address. What? I didn't make that stack work, did I, accidentally? No. So if I had no IST here, right? If I didn't do an IST, this should be failing. Yep, okay. So I give it an IST, and then somehow this is fucking working. How on earth is this working? RSP is this. Um, what? What? Okay. 
guard page size. Okay, let's see where this stack got created. Uh, print made crit stack at x uh, crit. Uh, we can just do p crit stack as pointer. Okay, let's see what we get here. Crit stack is here. 9,000. Whoa. Oh, shit. Um, that was actually creating the allocation for that, too. Checked add guard page size. Get a unique address for this, and then we add the guard page size on that, but we don't actually update the size, because that would change the size of the mapping, and this will fail in a loop. Beautiful. Okay, and the reason for that is this uh, has to actually be added with the um, crit stack capacity because uh, stack pointer will point to the end of the stack. Okay, so this will now work. Perfect. All right, so this will then point to the end of that and then this crit stack. So we allocate a new stack for uh, double faults, machine clears, or machine checks. We allocate a 32K emergency stack. We set that at an IST zero. Uh, we then add to get to the end. So the IST entry is at the very end of the stack. So that's what should be loaded into RSP. And then here we set up the TSS and we load the, uh, so this will uh, load the TR and load the GDT, load the TSS, okay. So now, yep, we're able to cause stack exhaustion, and that's what we're doing. We're causing stack exhaustion, and it's able to still find a valid stack. In this case, we can see that the exception occurred when the RSP was this, and we got a double fault, uh, and it's pretty obvious that this is due to a stack exhaustion. Fantastic. Um, determine the determ the IST entry to use uh, for this vector. If it's 2, 8, or 18, NMID for MC, use the IST. Otherwise, um, just use the existing stack. Fantastic. All right, that is awesome. Uh, this is gonna create the TSS. It looks like shit, and I might just leave it, to be honest. Uh, create a task pointer in the GDT because it's like all the bits from the random parts of the TSS are like chucking around. It's really stupid. Um, and then add the TSS uh, entry into the GDT. Okay, perfect. Okay, so where are we at now? Now we have interrupt handlers. I'm going to hit the head because I've been chugging this wine. I'll be right back. And then um, we will enable a timer interrupt. We'll get a timer interrupt going. Be right back.
How do you compile Rust so it works on an empty BIOS so it doesn't have... Uh, BIOS isn't really a term in this case, but um, to have no dependencies is, is really simple. You just use no standard in Rust. The language is designed with that in mind. Okay. Now what I want to do is we want to get a timer going. And to get a timer going, we have to uh, have APIC support. Mm. Oh my god, I got some fresh pineapple. Pineapple is so fucking good. I don't know why I always buy pre-sliced pineapple. I got this pineapple and I cut it up myself. It took like a minute to cut up this pineapple and it's so good. <laughs> 